Section number 32 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. One, section thirty-two, chapter nine, the Teutonic migrations, three hundred and seventy-eight, four hundred and twelve, by M. Manitius, part one. The enormous force of the onrush made by the Huns upon the Ostrogoths have been decisive for the fate of the Visigoths also. A considerable part of the Athanaric army, under their leaders Alavio and Fritigern, had escaped for and obtained from the Emperor Valens in the year 376 land for settlements on the right bank of the Danube. From that time these Goths were federati of the empire and as such were obliged to render armed assistance and supply recruits. A demand for land made by bands of Ostrogoths under Alateus and Saphrax was refused. Nevertheless, these bold Teutons effected the crossing of the river and followed their kinsmen. Quarrels between Romans and Goths led to Fritigern's victory of Marcianopol, which opened the way to the Goths as far as Hadrianopol. They were pushed back indeed into the Dobrushka by Valens' army, and the troops under Ricomer, sent from the west by Gratian to assist the Eastern Empire, were able to join the Eastern forces. After this, however, the success of arms remained changeable, especially when a section of Hans and Alani had joined the Goths. Thrace was left exposed to the enemy's raids, which extended as far as Macedonia. Now it was time for the Emperor to intervene in person, the more so as Gratian had promised to come quickly to his assistance. At first, the campaign was successful. The Goths were defeated on the Maritza near Hadrianople, and Valens advanced towards Philippopolis to effect a junction with Gratian. But Fritigern hastened southward to cut Valens off from Constantinople. The emperor was forced to turn back, and whilst at Hadrianople, was asked by Gratian in a letter delivered by Ricomer to postpone the final attack until his arrival. At the Council of War, however, Valens complied with his general Sebastian's opinion to strike without delay, as he had been informed that the enemy numbered but 10,000. In any case, they would have had to wait a long time for Gratian, who was hurrying eastward from a remote field of war. After rejecting a very ambiguous message from Fritigern, Valens led the Romans against the Goths, and, 9 August of 378, a battle took place to the northeast of Hadrianople, probably near the Merangia. The Goths were fortunate in receiving timely assistance from the Ostrogoths and Alani under Atheus and Saprax, after they had already defeated a body of Roman cavalry, which had attacked them prematurely. The Roman infantry also met with defeat at the hands of the Goths, and two-thirds of their army perished. The emperor himself was killed by an arrow, and his generals Sebastian and Trajan also lost their lives. When he heard the news from Bricomer, Gratian withdrew to Sirmium, and now the Eastern Empire 
lay open to the attacks of the barbarians. On 10th August, the Goths advanced to storm Hadrianople, as they had been informed that there, in a strongly fortified place, the emperor's treasure and the war chest were kept. But the efforts to size the town were in vain. The municipal authorities of Adrianople had not even admitted within its walls those Roman soldiers who during the night after their defeat had fled there and found shelter in the suburbs under the ramparts. At ten o'clock in the morning, the long protracted struggle for the town began. In the midst of the turmoil, three hundred Roman infantry formed a wedge and went over to the enemy, by whom, strange to say, all were killed. At last, a terrible storm put an end to the fight by bringing the besieged the much-needed supply of water, for want of which they had suffered the utmost distress. After this, the Goths made several fruitless attempts to take the town by stratagem. When in the course of the struggle it became evident that many lives were being sacrificed to no purpose, the Goths abandoned the siege from which the prudent Fritigern had from the beginning tried to dissuade them. Early on 12 August a council of war was held, in which it was decided to march against Perintus on the Propontis, where, according to the report of many deserters, great treasures were to be found. When the Goths had left Hadrianople, the Roman soldiers gathered together and during the night one part of them, avoiding the high roads, marched by lonely forest paths to Philippopolis, and thence to Sardica, probably to effect a junction with Gratian whilst another part conveyed the well-preserved imperial treasures to Macedonia, where the emperor, whose death was as yet unknown, was supposed to be. It will be observed that at this time the position of the Eastern Empire seemed hopeless. It could no longer defend itself against those robbing and plundering barbarians who, now that the battle was won, actually thought themselves strong enough to advance southward as far as the Propontis, and on their march could also rely on the assistance of the Huns and the Lani. But here again the Goths had trusted too much to their good fortune, for, though on their arrival in the environs of Perinthus they encamped before the town, they did not feel strong enough for an attack, and carried on the war by terrible and systematic devastations only. In these circumstances, it is surprising that they next marched upon Constantinople itself, the treasures of which greatly excited their covetousness. Apparently, they hoped to surprise and take the capital at one blow. This time, However, through fear of stire attacks, they decided to approach the town in close array. They had almost reached Constantinople when they encountered the body of Saracens, who had come out in its defence. It is reported that by a monstrous deed, one of these, a hairy, naked fellow, caused them to turn back. He threw himself with wild screams on one of the gods, pierced his throat with a dagger and greedily drank the blood which welled forth. For a time the struggles seemed to have continued, but soon the gods saw that they were powerless against the large and strongly fortified town and that they suffered greater loss than they inflicted. They, therefore, destroyed their siege engines on the Bosphorus, and bursting forth in single detachments, moved in a northwesterly direction through Thrace, Moesia, and Illyricum, as far as the foot of the Julian Alps, plundering and devastating the country as they went. 
every hand in the Eastern Empire was paralyzed with horror at the unrestrained ferocity of the barbarians. Only Julius, the Magister Militum, who held the command in the province of Asia, had courage enough for a terrible deed, which shows the boundless hatred felt by the Romans for the Goths, as well as the cruelty practiced in warfare at that time. He announced that on a certain day all Gothic soldiers in the towns and camps of Asia should receive their pay, instead of which all of them were, at his command, cut down by the Romans. In this manner he freed the provinces of the East from future danger. At the same time this incident shows clearly the straits to which the Eastern Empire was reduced. There was need of a clear-headed and determined ruler, if peace was ever to be restored to the Empire. With regard to this, however, everything depended upon the decision of Gratian, of whose doings we shall now have to give a short account. We know that Gratian had made efforts long before the catastrophes to come to his uncle's aid against the Goths. From this he was prevented by a war with the Alemanni, an Aleman from the country of the Lesientes, afterward the Lingzau on the lake of Constance, who served in the Roman guard, had returned to his country with the news that Grazia was shortly going to render assistance to his uncle in the East. This news had induced his tribesmen to make a raid across the Rhine in February 378. They were at first repulsed by frontier troops, but when it became known that the greater part of the Roman army had marched for Illyricum, they prevailed upon their tribesmen to join in a big campaign. It was rumored in Gaul that 40,000 or even as many as 70,000 Alemanni were on the war path. Gratian at once called back those of his cohorts which were already on the way to Pannonia and put the Comes Britanniae Nanienus in command of his troops, together with the brave Mallobaudes, king of the Franks. A battle was fought at Argentaria, near Colmar, in which the Romans, thanks to the skill of their generals, won a complete victory, and Priarius, the chieftain of the Lentienses, was killed. Gratian now attacked the Alemanni, crossed the Rhine, and sent the Lysientes flying to their mountains. There they were completely hemmed in and had to surrender, promising to supply recruits to the Romans. After this, Gratian marched from Arbor Felix, near St. Gallen, eastwards along the high road, passing Lauriacum on the way. As we have already seen, he did not reach Thrace in time, and on hearing of the defeat at Adrianople, he withdrew to Sirmium. Here, at the beginning of 379, a great political event took place. It must be mentioned that Theodosius, who had formerly been the commander-in-chief in Upper Moesia and had since been living in a kind of exile in Spain, had been recalled by Gratian and entrusted with a new command. Before the end of 378, Theodosius had already given a proof of his ability by the defeat of the Sarmatians, who appear to have invaded Pannonia. The success was welcome in a time so disastrous for the Romans. This is most probably one of the reasons why Gratian, 19 January 379, at Sirmium, raised him to be Emperor of the East and enlarged his dominions by adding to them Dacia, Upper Moesia, Macedonia, Epirus, and Achaia, Idest, Eastern Illyricum. The Visigoths under Fritigern had, without doubt, been the moving spirit in the war, although the Ostrogoths 
had played a valiant part in it. After Hermann Rick had committed suicide, Widimir had become king of the Ostrogoth. He lost his life fighting against the Alani and seems to have been succeeded by his infant son, in whose name the princes Alatheus and Saphrax reigned supreme. These, as we saw, joined forces later on with the Visigoths and contributed largely to the victory at Adrianople. It appears that for some time after this, both tribes of the Goths made common cause against the Romans. At first, the two emperors were successful in some minor campaigns against the Goths, and while Gratian went westward against the Franks and perhaps against the Vandals who had made an invasion across the Rhine, Theodosius succeeded in creating at Thessalonica, a place which he chose as a strong and sure base for his further operations, a new and efficient army into which he admitted a considerable number of Goths. Before the end of 379, he and his forces gained important successes over the enemy, who found themselves almost entirely confined to Lower Moesia and, owing to a lack of supplies, were compelled to renew the war in 380. The Visigoths under Fritigern advanced in a southwesterly direction towards Macedonia, whilst the Ostrogoths, Alani and Huns went to the northwest against Pannonia. Theodosius, who hurried to meet the Visigoths, suffered a severe defeat in an unexpected night attack. The Goths, however, did not follow up their victory, but contented themselves with pillaging Macedonian Thessaly, whilst the Emperor Theodosius lay a prey to a protracted illness at Thessalonica. During this period, Macedonia suffered terribly from the barbarians. At last, when Gratian, whose assistance Theodosius had implored, sent an army under Bauto and Arbogast, two Frankish generals, the Goths were compelled to retreat into Lower Moesia. Gratian himself was at the same time forced to take command of an army again for his general Vitalianus had been unable to prevent the Ostrogoths, Alani and Hans from invading Pannonia. As this barbarian invasion was a great danger to the Western Empire, it was highly important for Gratian to make peace with the enemy before suffering great losses. This he accomplished by assigning Pannonia and Upper Moesia to the Ostrogoths and their allies as federati. This settlement of the barbarians at its eastern frontier guaranteed the peace of the Western Empire in the immediate future. For the Eastern Empire also peace seemed now ensured. When Theodosius, who as an orthodox ruler commanded greater sympathy from his subjects than his predecessor, the Arian Valens, had recovered from his illness, he made a triumphal entry into Constantinople, 24 November 380, and here, 11 January 391, the Visigoths Athanaric arrived with his followers. He has been banished by the Goths whom he had led into Transylvania, and not desiring to ally himself with Fritigern on account of an old feud, asked to be admitted into the empire. He was received with the greatest honors by Theodosius, but only survived his entrance by a fortnight. The high honor shewed to Athanaric was evidently intended to create the impression among the inhabitants of the capital that war with the Goths was at an end. Perhaps it was also hoped to promote more peaceful feelings among Frigitan's followers. We are also led to believe that Theodosius soon commenced negotiations with this dreaded prince, which were brought to a conclusion in 382 by the Magister Militum Saturninus. A treaty of peace was concluded at Constantinople, 
3 October 382, by which permission was given to Fritigern and all his Goths to settle as allies in Lower Moesia. They were also to retain their domestic legislation and the right to elect their own princes. It was their duty, in return, to defend the frontier and to furnish troops, which, however, were to be led by their own chiefs. They obtained the districts assigned to them free of tribute, and moreover, the Romans agreed to pay them annually a sum of money. This treaty was, without doubt, at the time a triumph for Theodosius, and as such it was loudly praised by the emperor's flatterers. But, on closer examination, we shall see that the Romans had only gained a momentary peace. From the outset it was impossible to accustom the Goths, proud conquerors of the Roman armies as they were, to the peaceful occupation of tilling the ground and, as they had doubtless been allowed to settle in Moesia in a compact mass. Retaining their domestic government, all efforts to Romanize them could but prove vain. Beside this, the Danube, with the exception of the Dobrushka, was stripped of Roman troops, and the ever-increasing number of Goths who entered the Roman army was naturally a considerable danger to it. Moreover, the majority of the Goths were Arians, and the rest still heathens. A year previously, however, Theodosius had not only attacked Hitanism, but had issued a law against heretics, especially Arians. He had even sent his general, Sapor, into the east to expel the Arian bishops from their churches. Only bishops professing the Nicene faith were to possess the churches. Thus, the peace could not possibly be of long duration. How greatly political questions excited the Goths, and how passionately their national feeling would sometimes break forth, is shown by an event which occurred in Constantinople soon after 382. One day, at the royal table, Two Gothic princes, who were specially honoured by Theodosius, gave free utterance to their opposite political convictions. Erwinwolf was the leader of the national party among the Goths, which considered the destruction of the Roman Empire their ultimate object. He was an Arian by confession. Fravitta, on the other hand, was the head of that party which saw their future salvation in a close union with the Empire. He had married a Roman lady and had remained a heathen. The quarrel between the two party leaders ended by Fravitta, drawing his sword and killing his opponent just outside the palace. The attempts of everyone's followers to take immediate revenge were met with armed resistance on the part of the imperial palace guards. This incident, doubtless, helped to strengthen Fravitta's position at the emperor's court, whilst he had made himself impossible to the Goths. At this time a new danger to the empire arose from those Goths who had remained at home and had been conquered by the Huns. As early as the winter of 384 or 385 they had taken possession of Almiris, a town to the south of the estuary of the Danube, which however they left again only to return in the autumn of 386 to ask for admission into the empire together with other tribes. But the Magister Militum, Promotus, commander of the troops in Thrace, forbade them to cross the river. He had the frontier carefully guarded and met their attack with their rules, cleverly conceived and successfully executed by sending some of his men to the Ostrogoths under the pretense of betraying the Roman army to them. In reality, however, the soldiers of his reported to Promotus the place and time of the proposed night attack, and when the barbarians, led by Odotheus, crossed the river, the Romans, who were posted on a large number of anchored boats, 
made short work of them. This time, the better strategy of the Romans gained a complete victory of the Goths. To commemorate this victory, the emperor, who subsequently appeared in person on the battlefield, erected a huge column ornamented with reliefs in the quarter of the town which is called Taurus. Meanwhile, 25 August 383, Gratian had been killed at Lyons at the instigation of the usurper Maximus, who had been proclaimed emperor by the army in Britain and had found followers in Gaul. At first, Theodosius pretended to accept Maximus for a colleague, but in 388 he led his army against him and defeated him at Lycia and Pettau. In the end, the usurper was taken prisoner and killed at Aquileia. Theodosius now appointed Valentinian II, Gratian's youthful brother, Emperor of the West, only reserving for himself the co-regency of Italy. He then sent his experienced general Arbogast into Gaul, where the Teutons, from the right bank of the Rhine, had seized the occasion offered by the quarrel for the throne to extend their power beyond the frontier. Three chiefs of the Ripuarian Franks, Genobots, Marcomir and Sunno, had indeed crossed the Rhine in the neighborhood of Cologne and made a raid upon the Roman territory. When the Roman generals Nanienus and Quintinus went to meet the raiders at Cologne, one part of them left the borderland of the province, whilst the others continued the march into the country till they were at last beaten back in the Carbonarian forest to the east of Tournai. Quintinus now proceeded to attack the enemy and crossed the Rhine at Novesium. News. But after pushing forward for three days into the wild and pathless regions on the right bank of the Rhine, he was decoyed into an ambush in which almost the whole of his army perished. Thus, it appeared likely that the Roman rule in the Rhenish provinces would before long be completely overthrown, for the generals Carietto and Cyrus, whom Maximus had left behind, found it impossible to put a stop to the barbarian raids. At this juncture, Arbogast was sent by Theodosius to save the West. His first act was to capture Flavius Victor, the infant son of Maximus, and to have him put to death. Then he reinforced his army with those troops which Maximus had left stationed in Gaul and which, together with their generals Carietto and Cyrus, were easily won over to his side. Last of all, he turned against his former tribesmen, the Franks, and demanded from them the restitution of the booty and surrender of the originators of the war. When these demands were refused, he hesitated to begin war by himself. He found it difficult to come to a decision, for the fate of Quintinus' troops was still fresh in his memory. In these straits he wrote to the Emperor Valentinian II, who seems to have urged a friendly settlement of the fields. For in the autumn of 389, Arbogast had an interview with Marcomir and Sunno. The Franks, possibly fearing the mighty Theodosius, gave hostages and a treaty of peace was concluded which cannot have been unfavorable to the barbarians. In this way, the Western Empire showed considerable indulgence in its treatment of the Teutons. The Eastern Empire, on the contrary, and especially the Emperor, was soon directly and indirectly exposed to the serious troubles from the Visigoths. We know that the Goths, had extended their raids as far as Thessalonica. In this large town, the second in importance in the Balkan Peninsula, there existed a certain amount of ill feeling against the barbarians, which was greatly increased by the fact that the highest offices, both civil and military, were chiefly held by Teutons. Moreover, the town was garrisoned by Teuton soldiers.
End of section 32. Recording by Emanuela. Section number 33 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All the LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 33, Chapter 9, The Teutonic Migrations, 378-412, by M. Manitius, Part 2. The innate pride of Greeks and Romans alike was deeply wounded by this situation, and a very insignificant occurrence in the year 390 sufficed to make their hatred burst into flames. It happened in the following way. Boderic, the commandant of the town, had imprisoned a very popular charioteer and refused to set him free when the people clamoured for his deliverance because of the approaching circus games. This caused a rising against the obnoxious barbarian in which he lost his life. At the time of this incident, the Emperor Theodosius was at Milan, where he had frequent intercourse with the influential Bishop Ambrose. This was not without its effect upon him, though in his inmost heart the Emperor, as a secular autocrat, could not but be opposed to ecclesiastical pretensions. Although Theodosius, inclined by nature to leniency, or at any rate made a show of that quality, in this case at least, wrath overcame every human feeling in him, and he resolved to chastise the town in a way so cruel that nothing can be put forward in defense of it. When the people of Thessalonica were assembled in the circus and absorbed in contemplation of the games, Soldiers suddenly broke in and cut down all whom their swords could reach. For three hours the slaughter went on, till the victims numbered seven thousand. The emperor himself, urged perhaps to mercy by Ambrose, had at the last hour revoked his order, but it was too late. Probably Theodosius had been led to this unspeakable cruelty by persons of his intimate acquaintance, among whom Rufinus played a prominent part. It seems that Rufinus had been Magister Officiorum since 382, and 392 he rose to the position of Prefectus Pretorio. When the news of this massacre reached Milan, the Christian population of the town was paralyzed with terror. Ambrose left the town and addressed a letter of the utmost gravity to Theodosius. He explained to him that his deed called for penitence and warned him not to attend at church. The proud sovereign perceived that he would have to submit to the penitence imposed on him and obey the bishop's will. He did not leave Milan till the following year, but before returning to the eastern capital he had to sustain a dangerous attack from the Goths in Trace. In 390 the Visigoths broke the peace to which they had sworn and invaded Thrace. Hans and other tribes from beyond the Danube had thrown in their lot with them. They were commanded by Alaric, a prince of the Visigoths, belonging to the family of the Balti. This is the first appearance of Alaric, who was then about twenty years of age. 
and whose great campaigns subsequently excited such terror throughout the Roman Empire. But even then, the Thracians appeared to have been in great distress. For 1st July 391, Theodosius issued an edict at Aquileia, by which the inhabitants of the endangered district received permission to carry arms and to kill anybody found marauding in the open country. After Theodosius had entered the province, he took great pains to destroy the bands of murderers and in cells assisted in their pursuit. On the Maritza, however, he fell into an ambush and was completely defeated. Even his life seems to have been in danger, but he was rescued by his general Promotus. The latter continued the war against the Goths till the end of 391, though he had apparently fallen into disfavor at court. He lost his life in the war, and public opinion at the capital attributed his death to Rufinus. Stilico, the Vandal now, became commander of the troops in Thrace. He was born about 360 and had, at an early age, been attached to an embassy to Persia. Afterwards, Theodosius had given him his niece, Serena, in marriage and promoted him step by step. He was considered to be one of the able statesmen in the Eastern Empire, and the military command entrusted to him in 392 was destined to increase the importance of his position. For he succeeded at length in defeating the enemy, who, for so long a time, had been the terror of the empire. The Goths were surrounded on the Maritza, but again the emperor showed mercy and gave orders that the enemy should be permitted to go free. Theodosius' policy may probably be attributed to a certain fear of revenge, and it was doubtless influenced by Rufinus, who did not wish Stilico to become too powerful. Thus, a treaty with the vanquished Goth was concluded. Meanwhile, Arbogast had embarked upon a most ambitious course of politics. His aim was to get rid of the young and irresolute Valentinian II. Not indeed that he himself wished for the imperial crown, for he very likely felt its possession to be indesiderable. His idea was to get Valentinian II out of the way and then assist to the imperial throne someone of his ardent devotees, under whose name he himself hoped to wield the supreme power. For the attainment of this end, his first requisite was a trustworthy army. He therefore levied a large number of Teuton troops, in whose loyalty he could place the utmost confidence. When Valentinian took up his abode in Gaul, the relations between him and the powerful Frank became more and more strained, till finally the emperor from his throne handed to his rival a written order, demanding that he should resign his post. Arbogast tore the document in pieces before the eyes of the emperor, whose days were thenforth numbered. On 15 of May 392, the youthful sovereign was assassinated at Vienne. But whether Arbogast was directly responsible for this deed remains uncertain. The way was now clear for the Franks' ambitious plans. A short time previously, the Frank Ricomer had recommended to his tribesman Arbogast the head of the imperial chancery, the Magister Scriniorum, Eugenius. This Roman, 
formerly a rhetorician and grammarian, was the man whom Arbogast intended to raise to the imperial throne. Eugenius could not but yield to the mighty man's wish. He therefore sent an embassy to Theodosius in 392 to obtain his recognition. But Theodosius gave an evasive answer, and, as there was every prospect of a war, Arbogast deemed it necessary to make provision for a safe retreat. We know that the neighborhood of the Franks formed a very vulnerable point of the Roman government in Gaul. For this reason, in the winter of 392, Arbogast undertook a campaign against these dangerous neighbors. He probably hoped, at the same time, to reinforce his army with Frankish troops, should he be successful in this war. He pushed on through Cologne and the country along the river Lippe, into the territory of the Bucchery and Chamavi, after which he turned eastward against the Ampsivari, who had joined forces with the Chatti under Marcomir. Apparently, he met with but little resistance, for in the spring of 393, Eugenius succeeded in concluding treaties with the Franks and even the Alemanni, on condition that they supplied him with troops. The ensuing period was spent in preparations for war in both empires, Eugenius having been, thanks to Arbogast's influence, recognized as emperor in Italy also. Theodosius had reinforced his army more especially with Teutons. The Visigoths were again commanded by Alaric, whilst the leaders of the other federati were Gainas, Sol, and the Comes Domesticorum, Bacurius, an Armenian. The meeting of the two armies took place on the 5th of September 394 on the Frigidus, a tributary of the Isonza, probably the Hubel. As the Gothic troops formed the vanguard and opened the attack on the enemy, who were posted very favorably, they suffered severe losses on the first day of the battle, which greatly elated the Westerns. On the second day, the battle would in all probability have been decided in favor of Arbogast, had not his general Arbitrio, who commanded the Frankish troops, gone over to Theodosius. It is related besides that a violent storm from the northeast, the Bora, as it is called, wrought such havoc in the ranks of Eugenius' army that it helped Theodosius to gain a complete victory. Eugenius was taken prisoner and put to death, and Arbogast escaped into the mountains, where he died by his own hand, the 8th of September. But whilst the relations and followers of Eugenius and Arbogast were pardoned, Alaric waited in vain for the post in the Roman army which Theodosius had promised him. And when the 17 of January 395 Theodosius died at Milan, still in the prime of life, the Goths were sent home by Stilico, who had been second in command during the war. To make matters worse, the yearly payments which had hitherto been made to the Goths were now injudiciously held back. These various causes combined to disturb the peace between the Romans and Goths, which had so far been tolerably well preserved, and the Goths one more commenced hostilities. The time for a general rising seemed to be well chosen. Theodosius, whose strong hand had endeavoured to maintain the peace within the empire, 
was now no more, and his sons were yet of tender age. The late emperor had been the last to reign over the whole empire, and even he, powerless to stay its decline, had been obliged to cede to the Goths an extensive district within its borders. How important the Teutonic element had grown can best be understood from the fact that the Teutons not only furnished the best part of the troops, but also commanded the armies and held the highest appointments, both civil and military. Now that Theodosius was dead, the empire was divided forever. At an age of hardly 18 years, his son Arcadius received the empire of the East under the guidance of Rufinus, who had, in 394, during the absence of Theodosius, been entrusted with the regency as well as with the supreme direction of Arcadius. On 27 of April 395, to Rufinus's great vexation, the young emperor married Eudoxia, who had been brought to him by Eutropius, the eunuch of the palace. She was the daughter of Bauto, the Frank who had played an important part under Gratian and Valentinian. In the course of the same year, Rufinus was most cruelly slain by the soldiers whom Gamas had but recently led back to Constantinople. After his death, Eutropius stood in high favor with the emperor. He received the office of High Chamberlain, Prepositus Sacri Cubiculi, and later on the title Patricius. The younger son, Honorius, who was in his eleventh year, received the Western Empire. Stilico was appointed his guardian and also regent. He had been raised to the rank of Magister Utriusque Militiae by Theodosius before his death and, as we saw, had married the niece of the emperor. This capable man was no doubt better fitted than any other to rule the empire and the spirit of Theodosius, and when the emperor died, it was he who without delay hurried to the Rhine to receive homage for Honorius from the Teuton tribes, even as far as the Batavi. Apparently, on this journey, King Marcomir was delivered into his hands and was sent into exile to Tuscany. After this, Stilico immediately returned to Italy. Meanwhile, the Visigoths had broken loose from Moesia. Those of their tribesmen, who had formerly accompanied Alaric to Transylvania, had joined them and chosen Alaric, whose power, at that time, however, was still limited as leader in the coming war. This war was fraught with danger for the Eastern Empire, for it appears that in the early spring of 395, the whole mass of the Visigoths marched south towards Constantinople. As before, there could of course be no question of capturing the city, but the surrounding country was mercilessly devastated. It is most probable that Rufinus, who paid repeated visits to the hostile camp, bribed the enemy to retire. Alaric now made his way along the coast to Macedonia and Thessaly. Near Larissa, he encountered Stilico, who had left Italy with strong forces. These were the victorious East Roman soldiers, whom he was leading home to their own country, hoping, at the same time, to win back Illyria for the Western Empire. This province, though given to Theodosius by Gratian, was said to have been restored by the former a short time before his death. Apparently, the Goths had, first of all, tried to gain the valley of the Peneus, the Vale of Tempi. But meeting with resistance, they had pushed on across the eastern slopes of Olympus into Thessaly, 
where they barricaded themselves behind their wagons. Stilico was on the point of attacking them when he received a message from Arcadius ordering him to dismiss the army of the Eastern Empire and himself return to Italy. If at the first sight this order seems strange, it is because we have long been accustomed to seeing Stilico a disinterested statesman and general, who dedicated his labor and personality to the family of Theodosius. This disposition of Eastern Illyria, which Theodosius was supposed to have made shortly before his death, is however very doubtful, and it is certain that Stilico had entertained personal ambitions with regard to that province. Viewed in the light of these circumstances, the order from Arcadius appears in a very different light, especially if to this is added the fact that in the same year the Huns had broken through the gates of the Caucasus at Baku on the Caspian Sea and reached Syria by way of Armenia. There they laid siege to Antioch and proceeded thence to Asia Minor. Ravages of every kind marked their way. In this situation it was an absolute necessity for the welfare of the state that the army should return to its own country. Stilico obeyed the order, because, as has justly been remarked, he was probably uncertain about the future conduct of the East Roman troops, a section of whom remained in Greece under Gerontius' command to cover Thermopylae. Alaric, however, assisted perhaps by treachery, took possession of this famous pass without difficulty. After this, the Goths marched through Beotia into Attica. Here Alaric succeeded in seizing the Piraeus and forced Athens to capitulate by cutting off her supplies. It is probable that she escaped pillage by the payment of a sum of money. Alaric stayed for a short time peacefully within her walls. From Athens the march of the Goths was continued to Eleusis, where they ransacked the temple of Demeter and farther to Megara, which was quickly taken. Gerontius had left the entrance to the Poloponnesus undefended, and the Gothic hordes, meeting with no resistance, broke like a torrent upon Corinth and thence on Argos and Sparta. Many an ancient work of art must have perished in this rush, but no mention is made of any systematic and willful destruction of the ancient monuments. It is a curious fact that after all these, the East Roman government seems neither to have made war against the Huns who had invaded Asia, nor to have lent assistance to the Greeks. When Gerontius had so utterly failed to do his duty at Thermopylae and the Isthmus. Help came rather from another quarter, and primarily it must be owned, with a different purpose in view. Though Stilico had returned to Italy, he had been kept well informed about events in Greece, as he himself had designs on East Illyria to which Epirus and Achaia belonged, and as Alaric was to all appearances endeavoring to create an independent sovereignty in these provinces, it was imperative for the resurgent of the West to interfere. In 397, he transported an army to Greece and, landing on the south side of Corinth, expelled the Goths from Arcadia and surrounded them at Elis, near the Alpheus, on the plateau of Foley. But no decisive battle was fought, for Stilico was not sufficiently master of his own troops, and just then the revolt of the Moorish prince, Gildo, threatened to become a serious danger to the Western Empire. 
Gildo had formerly been prefect of Mauritania and had subsequently been raised to the office of Magister Utriusque Militiae. In the year 394, he began his revolt, whereby he intended to secure the north coast of Africa as a dominion of his own, and in 397 he offered Africa as a feudal province to the Eastern Empire, hoping thereby to kindle war between the two empires. In this predicament, Stilico avoided a decisive encounter with the Goths. For the second time, he allowed his adversary to escape. He even concluded a treaty with Alaric, which doubtless contained an alliance against the Eastern Empire. For in these precarious circumstances, the chief of the brave Goths might possibly prove of great service to Stilico in his ambitious private policy. The effect of these conditions on the mutual relations of the two empires was soon apparent. At Constantinople, Stilico was declared an enemy of the state, whilst in the Western Empire the consulship of Eutropius, who had been nominated for 399 and had entirely won the favour of Arcadius, was not acknowledged. Before his death, Theodosius had so arranged the division of the empire that the cohesion of the whole might for the future be firmly and permanently secured. Thus, the first deep cleft had been made in an union which was already difficult to maintain. Neither empire had a permanent diplomatic representation. Only special embassies were sent from time to time, so that unfounded suspicions were very likely to arise on either side. At this time, while Stilico was sailing back in haste from Greece to Italy to prepare for war against Gildo, the Goths made a raid into Epirus, which they devastated in a terrible manner. At last, the government at Constantinople was roused sufficiently to make proposals of peace to Alaric. In return, for a sum of money and the position of Magister Militum in Illyria, Alaric withdrew from the alliance with Stilico, made peace with the Eastern Empire and occupied Epirus, which had been assigned to him with his Gothic troops. Another trouble for the Eastern Empire at this time arose from the large number of Goths who served in the army, and more especially through their leader Gainas. At his command, they had killed Rufinus in 395. When Eutropius did not reward him for his services with the high military office he coveted, he joined a rebellion of his compatriot Tribigild in Phrygia, against whom he had been sent out with an army. 4. After the fall and execution of the powerful favorite Eutropius, in the summer of 399, a national movement was set on foot at Constantinople, having for its object the abolition of foreign influence in the high government offices. Aurelianus, Eutropius' successor, was at the head of this movement, but the Roman supremacy was not destined to be revived. The Gothic rebellion in Asia Minor grew more and more alarming, and Arcadius was soon obliged to negotiate with Gainas. During an interview with the emperor, the Goth succeeded in obtaining his nomination to the post of Magister Militum Presentalis and the extradition of the three leaders of the National Party, one of whom was Aurelianus. On his subsequent return to the capital, Gainas could consider himself master of the empire, and, as such, demanded of the emperor a place of worship for the Arian gods. But the famous theologian and bishop John Chrysostom contrived to avert this danger to the Orthodox Church. 
but the power of Gainas was not to be of long duration. When in July 400 he left the town with the majority of the Goths, owing to a feeling of insecurity, the inhabitants rose against those who had been left behind. At last, no refuge remained to them except the church they had lately been given. In its ruins, they were burned, as Gainas failed to come to the rescue in time to storm the city. Gainas was declared a public enemy, and the pursuit was entrusted to his tribesman Fravitta, who so far carried out his order that he followed Gainas to the Thrace and the Hellespont, and prevented him from crossing to Asia. Eventually, at the end of the year 400, Gainas was killed on the farther side of the Danube by a chief of the Huns, called Ulding, who sent his head to Constantinople. Nothing is more characteristic of the impotence of the Eastern Empire than the revolt of this Gothic general, whose downfall was only secured by a combination of favorable circumstances. The clever and valiant Goth succumbed only to strangers. The empire itself had no means to overthrow him. Such were the conditions at the dawn of the new century. The last 25 years of the old, having brought nothing but war, poverty and depopulation to the Eastern Empire. It is true that for the Western Empire, the century had closed more favorably. The campaign against Gildo especially had been prepared by Stilico with characteristic ability. This Moorish prince, after putting to death the sons of his brother Maschitzel, who had gone to Italy, had proceeded to conquer the north of Africa. Only the large and fortified towns could resist his ever-increasing power. He created great anxiety in Rome by cutting off her African corn supply, but the danger of a famine was averted by Stilico, who succeeded in having corn brought by sea from Gaul and Spain. When his preparations for war were completed, Stilico did not at this critical time put himself at the head of the army, but resigned the supreme command to Maschitzel. The army was not large, but it seems that Silico relied upon the skill of its commander for entering into circuit relations with the leaders of the enemy. Maschitzel departed for Africa, where the campaign was decided between Tebeste and Ammedera on the Ardelio, a tributary of the Bragradas. Apparently, no real battle was fought, but Gildo's troops went over to the enemy or fled into the mountains. Gildo himself first tried to escape by sea, but returned to land and soon after met his death at Tabraca. This wars against the two rebels, Gainas and Gildo, so excited the imagination of the contemporary world that they formed the subject of many poetical productions. Of these, the Egyptians, or On Providence, a novel by Synesius of Cyrene, and Claudian's War against Gildo are preserved. With the year 401, however, there began for the Western Empire a period similar to that which the Eastern Empire had already so long endured. The Teutons began to press forward in dense masses against the provinces of the Western Empire, which they had so long spared and finally effected the complete dissolution of that once so mighty realm. But this time the disturbance did not proceed from the Goths only. Other tribes also were involved in the movement, which could no longer be restrained, and the danger to the empire grew in proportion. In the first place, Alaric, had made use of the short time of his alliance with the Eastern Empire to increase his power, chiefly by rearming his Goths from the Roman arsenals. His plan 
of founding an independent kingdom for himself in Greece had failed, and it probably seemed most tempting to him to transfer his attentions to Italy, whose resources were not yet so completely drained by the gods. No doubt Stilico ruled there with a firm hand. He had in 398 created for himself an unassailable position by giving his daughter Maria, a mere child, a marriage to the Emperor Honorius, who was then 14 years of age. But apparently Alaric did not fear the power of Stilico, who had twice allowed him to escape from a most critical position. Furthermore, the Western Empire was just now engaged in a different direction. In the year 401, the Vandals, who had long ago settled in the regions between the Danube and the Thais, began to grow restless. On account of their increasing population, the majority of them had resolved to emigrate with their king Godigisel, retaining at the same time the right of possession over their old dominions. They were joined by Alani from Pannonia, and in the same year this new wave of migration reached Rezia, by way of Noricum. Stilico at first opposed them, but was eventually obliged to grant them territories in Noricum and Vindelicia, under the suzerainty of Rome, in return for which they bound themselves to serve in the Roman army. By this time, Alaric had already left Epirus far behind and reached Aquileia by way of Emona and the Burnbound Forest. This invasion of Italy by the barbarians caused great consternation. The fortifications of Rome were repaired and strengthened, and the young emperor Honorius even contemplated an escape into Gaul. Venezia was already in the enemy's hands, and the road to Milan was occupied by the Goths. As Honorius was a stay in this city, Alaric naturally desired above all to take possession of it. But Stilico came to the rescue. He had reinforced his army with the Vandals and Alani, with whom he had just made peace, and Alaric was forced to abandon the siege of Milan. He now tried to gain the coast in order to reach Rome. With Stilico at his heels, he turned to Ticinum and Hasta, and thence to Pollentia. Here, 6 of April 402, a battle was fought in the early stages of which it seemed likely that the Romans would be defeated, as Saul, the Roman general of the Alani, had begun the battle prematurely. But the appearance of Stilico with the main body of infantry changed the aspect of affairs. The fight was continued until nightfall, but though the Romans were left in possession of the field and took numerous prisoners, Stilico can hardly be said to have gained a victory. For Alaric's forces retreated in perfect order and were able to continue the march on Rome. In this crisis, Stilico was obliged to come to terms with Alaric. The Gothic chief was raised to the rank of Magister Militum and promised to evacuate Italy. For the future, the two generals arranged to conquer Eastern Illyria for the Western Empire. This treaty, which put a considerable check on the movements of the Goths, is explained not only by the state of affairs at that time, but also by the fact that Alaric's wife and children had been made prisoners during the battle. The Goths now left Italy, but remained close to the frontier and made a fresh invasion in 403. This time Alaric tried to lay siege to Verona, but was defeated by Stilico and on trying to gain Rezia, by way of the Brenner again found himself in a very dangerous plight, from which he could only extricate himself by concluding a new treaty with Stilico against the Eastern Empire. 
Probably it was at this juncture that Sarus, the Visigothic prince, with his followers, went over to Stilicho, a desertion which must be ascribed to Stilicho's diplomatic skill. The uncertainty of the situation may account for the very remarkable fact that Stilicho suffered the enemy to escape so often from his fatal embrace. Be that as it may, the Goths withdrew, and Stilicho could celebrate a brilliant triumph with Honorius. Alaric, however, does not appear to have returned to Epirus till much later, but remained for some time in the neighborhood of Illyria. End of section 33 Recording by Emanuela Section number 34 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emanuela. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 34. Chapter 9. The Teutonic Migrations. 378-412 by M. Manitius. In the following year, 405, the Ostrogoths and Vandals, the Alani and the Quadi under the leadership of Radagaisus, left their homes, crossed the Alps, and descended into Italy. Their number, though much exaggerated by contemporary historians, must have been considerable, for the hostile army marched through the north of the peninsula in several divisions. Stilico seems to have collected his troops at Pavia. The invasion happened at a very inopportune moment, as he was about to carry out his designs on eastern Illyria. This time, however, he quickly succeeded in ridding himself of the enemy. He surrounded the Radagaisus, who had attacked Florence, in the narrow valleys of the Apennines near Fesule, and destroyed a large part of his army. Radagaisus himself was captured with his sons whilst trying to escape, and was shortly afterwards executed. For this victory, Stilicho's thanks were chiefly due to two foreign generals, Sarus the Goth and Uldin the Hun. In this manner, Italy had indeed been speedily saved from great danger, but at the end of the next year, 406, hostile hordes broke into Gaul with so much the greater violence. It is very probable that this invasion, which was undertaken by the Vandals, had some connection with that of Radagaisus. In conjunction with the Vandals were the Alani, who had recently formed an alliance with them, and the Suevi, by whom we must understand the Quadi, who had formerly dwelt north of the Vandals. This great tribal migration, following the road along the Roman frontier, Limes, reached the river Main, where they met the Selingi, a Vandal tribe which had gone westward with the Burgundians in the 3rd century. This now helped to swell the Vandal hordes, whilst a part of the Alani, under the leadership of Gore, enlisted in the Roman army on the Rhine. Near this river, the Vandals were attacked by some Frankish tribes, who were keeping guard on the frontier, in accordance with their treaty with Stilico. In the ensuing fight, the Vandals suffered severe losses, their king Godigisel being amongst the slain. On receiving this news, the Alani immediately turned about and, led by their king Respendial, they completely routed the Franks. On the last day of 406, this mass of people crossed the Rhine at Mainz, which they invested and destroyed. The march was continued by Treves to Reims, 
where the bishop Nicasius was slain in his own church. Thence the Tournai, Teruen, Arras, and Amiens. From this point, the journey proceeded through Gallia Lugnunensis to Paris, Orleans, and Tours, and passing through Aquitania into Novem Populana by Bordeaux to Toulouse, which the bishop Exuperius saved from falling into the enemy's hands. But the fortified passes of the Pyrenees put a step to their farther advance. Thus, Spain remained unconquered for the present, and the Vandals now made their way into the rich province of Narbonensis. The devastation of the extensive provinces and the conquered city of Gaul was terrible. Contemporary writers of prose and verse alike complained bitterly of the atrocities committed by the barbarians in this unhappy country. The oldest people could not remember so disastrous an invasion. The weakness of the empire is revealed by the absence of a Roman army to oppose the Germans. Stilicho's policy was at that time directed towards Illyria, and for this reason he probably found it impossible to come to the assistance of Gaul. This first great danger was soon followed by a second. The migration of the Vandals had very likely caused the Burgundians along the middle course of the main to become restless. They now began to bear down upon the Alemanni on the lower main. A part of the Burgundians had perhaps intended to join the great migration of 406, for shortly after we meet with them on the west side of the Rhine. The most important result, however, was that the Alemanni now entered on a campaign against Roman Upper Germany and conquered Worms, Speyer and Strasbourg. Here again the Empire failed to send help and the Allied Franks remained quiet. Stilicho, meanwhile, collected an army in 406 and arranged a plan with Alaric by which he could carry out his Illyrian projects from Epirus. Already a prefectus pretorio for Illyria had been nominated in the person of Jovius, when in the year 407 an event occurred which threw everything else into the background. A new emperor appeared on the scene. When a rumor had spread that Alaric was dead, the legions in Britain, after two unsuccessful attempts, proclaimed Constantine emperor. Note 1. First, a man named Marcus and after him Gratian, a British official, had been declared emperors. Both, however, were after a short time put to death by the soldiers. End of note 1. According to Orosius, he was a common soldier, but his name excited hopes for better times. The new emperor crossed over to Gaul without delay, where he was recognized by the Roman troops throughout the country. He immediately pushed forward into the districts along the road, where, though he probably concluded treaties with the Alemanni, Burgundians and Franks, he made but little impression on the Teutons who had invaded the land. But Stilicho had already sent the experienced General Sarus with an army against him. In the neighborhood of Valens, which Constantine had made his temporary abode, his General Justinian was defeated and killed in battle by Sarus. Another of the usurper's generals met his death soon afterwards during an interview with the crafty Goth. When, however, Constantine sent against him his newly appointed generals, the Frank Edobic and the Brighton Gerontius. Sarus abandoned the siege of Valens and effected the passage into Italy by paying a sum of money to the fugitive peasants called Bagaude, who at that time held the passes of the Western Alps. Stilicho joined Honorius at Rome to discuss the serious situation. Constantine, however, directed his attention towards Spain, evidently with a view 
to protect his rear before attacking Italy. At the passes across the Pyrenees, he met with energetic resistance from Didymus, Verenianus, Theodosius and Logadius, all relatives of the emperor. But Constantine's son, Constance, soon overcame the enemy. He captured Verenianus and Didymus, whilst Theodosius and Logadius fled, the former to Italy, the latter to the east. After this, when Constance had returned to Gaul in triumph, he entrusted the passes to Geronsius, who was in command of the Honorians, a troop of barbarian federati. This, it appears, fulfilled their duty, but indifferently, for during the quarrels which ensued in the borderlands the Vandas, Alani and Suevi, who had pushed on as far as southern Gaul, saw an opportunity of executing their design on Spain. With these disturbances in Spain is generally connected a great rising of the Celts in Britain and Gaul, which was directed against the advancing Teutonic tribes as well as against the Roman rule, and in which the Gaulish district of Armonica was specially concerned. Thus, was prepared in these provinces the separation from the Roman government, which had lasted for centuries, and at the same time, Teutonic rule superseded that of the Romans in Spain. Meanwhile, Alaric had not failed to profit by the violent disturbances within the Western Empire. As Stilico had neither undertaken the campaign against Illyria nor met the demands of the Gothic soldiers for their pay, Alaric believed himself entitled to deal a powerful blow at the Western Empire. Stilico had recently strengthened his relations with the imperial house by a new link. The Empress Maria had died early, still a virgin as rumor went, and Stilico succeeded in persuading the emperor to marry his second daughter, Thermantia. Now Alaric tried to force his way into Italy. He had left Epirus and reached Emona. There he probably found the roads to the south buried. He therefore crossed the river Aquilis and made his way to Virunum in Noricum, whence he sent an embassy to Stilico at Ravenna. The ambassadors demanded the enormous sum of 4,000 pounds of gold as compensation for the long delay in Epirus and the present campaign of the Goths. Stilico went to Rome to discuss the matter with the Emperor and the Senate. The majority of the Senate was opposed to the concession of this demand and would have preferred war with the Goths, but Stilico's power in the assembly was still so great that his opinion prevailed and the huge sum was paid. At this juncture, the rumor spread that the Emperor of the East was dead. Arcadius had indeed died, 1st May, 408. This greatly altered the situation, for Theodosius II, the heir of the Eastern throne, was but a child of seven. Honorius now decided to go to Ravenna, but was opposed by Stilico, who wanted himself to inspect the troops there. But neither did Stilico succeed in dissuading Honorius, nor could a mutiny among the soldiers at Ravenna, which Sarus had promoted, induce the emperor to desist from his plan. Nevertheless, he eventually diverged from the route to Ravenna and went to Bologna, where he ordered Stilico to meet him for the purpose of discussing the situation in the East. Stilico's first concern at Bologna was to calm the agitation amongst the soldiers and recommend the ringleaders to the Emperor's mercy. Then he took counsel with Honorius. It was the Emperor's wish to go in person to Constantinople and settle the affairs of the Eastern Empire. But Stilico tried to turn him from this purpose, pointing out that the journey would cause too much expense 
and that the emperor could not well leave Italy whilst Constantine was as yet powerful and residing at Ars. Honorius bent his will to the prudent counsel of his great statesmen, and it was resolved that Stilicho should go to the east, whilst Alaric was sent with an army to Gaul against Constantine. Stilicho, however, neither departed from the east, nor did he gather together the troops which remained assembled at Pavia, and were ill-disposed towards him. Meanwhile, a cunning Greek, the Chancellor Olympius, profited by the change in the Emperor's feelings towards his great minister. Under the mask of a Christian piety, he secretly intrigued against Stilicho in order to undermine his position. Thus, Olympius accompanied the Emperor to Pavia, and on this occasion spread the calumnious report that Stilicho intended to kill the child Theodosius and put his own son Eucherius on the throne. The storm now gathered over Stilicho's head. The prelude to the catastrophe, however, took place at Pavia. When the emperor had arrived with Olympius at this town, the latter made an exhibition of his philanthropy by visiting the sick soldiers. Probably his real object was to gather the threads of the conspiracy which he had already spun and to weave them further. On the fourth day, Honorius himself appeared among the troops and tried to inspire them with enthusiasm for the fight against Constantine. At this moment, Olympius gave a sign to the soldiers and, in accordance with a previous arrangement, they threw themselves upon all the high military and civil officers present, who were supposed to be Stilicho's adherents. Some of them escaped to the town, but the soldiers rushed through the streets and killed all the unpopular dignitaries. The slaughter continued under the very eyes of the emperor, who had withdrawn at first but repaired without his royal robes and tried to check the mad fury of the soldiers. When the emperor, fearing for his own life, had a second time retired, Longinianus, the prefectus pretorio for Italy, was also slain. News of this horrible mutiny reached the Stilico at Bologna. He at once summoned all the generals of the Teutonic race in whose loyalty alone he could still trust. It was decided to attack the Roman army, should the emperor himself have been killed. When, however, Stilicho learned that the mutiny had not been directed against Honorius, he resolved to abstain from punishing the culprits, for his enemies were numerous and he was no longer sure of the emperor's support. But to this the tutor's generals would not agree, and Sarus even went so far as to have Stilicho's hunting bodyguard killed during the night. Stilicho now betook himself to Ravenna, and to this town Olympius dispatched a letter from the emperor addressed to the army with the order to arrest Stilicho and keep him in honorable custody. During the night Stilicho took refuge in a church to secure the right of sanctuary, but in the morning the soldiers fetched him away, solemnly assuring him that his life was safe. Then a second letter from the emperor was read, which condemned Stilicho to death for high treason. The fallen man might still have saved his life by appealing to the Teuton soldiers, who were devoted to him and would readily have fought for him. But he made no attempt to do so, probably to preserve the empire from a civil war, which would have been fatal at this time. Without resistance, he offered his neck to the sword. In him, the Roman Empire, 23 of August, 408, lost one of its most prominent statesmen, and at the same time, one of its ablest generals, one who had been in command of the army for 23 years. Without doubt, we should consider the fall of Stilicho as a manifestation of a national Roman reaction against the ever-increasing Teutonic influence within the empire, a reaction proceeding from the political party 
which saw in the removal of the barbarians the salvation of Rome. Whether this party was right or not, they certainly had acted most unwisely, for Olympius, the successor to Stilicho's position, turned his power to very foolish account. Even the severest tortures could not bring from Stilicho's friends and followers the confession desired by Olympius, that the executed minister had aspired to the imperial throne. And still, more unjudicious was the edict by which all those who had attained high office under Stilicho's administration forfeited their property to the state, but most incomprehensible of all was the fact that the Roman soldiers were allowed to wander about murdering and robbing the families of the Teuton troops in Italy. The consequence was that thousands of these soldiers deserted and went over to Alaric. Thermantia was sent back to her mother Serena by Honorius, who also sentenced Eucerius to death. But as the latter had escaped to Rome and taken refuge in a church, he was left unmolested for a time. Shortly afterwards, however, he was murdered by two eunuchs who were rewarded by high offices in the state. Alaric's opportunity had arrived. Now that the empire had, of its own free will, lost the services of its great leader. At first, the Gothic chief tried to maintain the peace. He sent ambassadors to the emperor with the message that he would adhere to the treaties made with Stilicho, if he received a moderate payment of money, and that, if an exchange of hostages were effected, he would withdraw his troops from Noricum to Pannonia. Although Honorius rejected Alaric's proposals for a peaceful arrangement, he did not take any active steps to ensure success in the campaign which had now become inevitable. Instead of entrusting to Sarus the command of the troops against Alaric, Olympius bestowed it on two men who were faithfully devoted to him, but absolutely devoid of merit. This time Alaric did not tarry long. However, as the campaign promised to assume greater dimensions, he sent for reinforcements from his brother-in-law Ataulf, who was stationed in Upper Pannonia with Hunnic and Gothic troops. Without waiting for Ataulf's arrival, Alaric marched to Aquileia, and thence westward to Cremona, where he crossed the Po without meeting with the slightest resistance. Then the Goths proceeded southeast from Placentia to Ariminum, leaving Ravenna unmolested and Tropicenum until they arrived before Rome without opposition. When Alaric surrounded the city, the Senate believed Serena, Stilicho's widow, to be in connivance with him, and as Placidia, the sister of Honorius, was of the same opinion, Serena was put to death. This act of violence had, of course, no influence upon Alaric's policy. On the contrary, the investment of the city was carried on with greater vigor than before. As the Goths also blockaded the Tiber, the city was cut off from all supplies, and soon famine broke out. No help came from Ravenna, and when the distress in the city was at its highest, ambassadors were sent to the hostile camp to ask for moderate terms. At first, Alaric demanded the surrender of all the gold and silver in the city, inclusive of all precious movable goods and the emancipation of all Teuton's slaves, but in the end he lowered his demand to an imposition which, however, was still so heavy that it necessitated the confiscation of the sacred treasures stored in the temples. After this, he withdrew his troops from Rome and went into the neighboring province of Tuscany, where he collected around his standard a great number of slaves who had escaped from Rome. But even in this situation, Honorius declined the negotiations for peace, which were now urged by Alaric and the Senate alike. This temporizing policy could not but bring ruin upon Italy, the more so, 
as at the beginning of 409, ambassadors came to treat with Honorius about the recognition of Constantine. The usurper had raised his son Constans, who had returned from Spain to Gaul, to the dignity of a co-emperor, and had had the two cousins of Honorius put to death. The emperor, who entertained hopes that they were still alive and counted upon assistance from Constantine against Alaric, no longer withheld his recognition, and even sent him an imperial robe. During this time, Olympius did not shew himself in any way equal to the situation, but continued to persecute those whom he believed to be Stilicho's adherents. Honorius now ordered a body of picket troops from Dalmatia to come to the protection of Rome. These 6,000 men, however, under their leader Valens, were on their way surprised by Alaric, and all of them but 100 were cut down. A second Roman embassy, in which the Roman bishop Innocent took part, and which was escorted by troops furnished by Alaric, was now sent to the emperor. In the meantime, Ataulf had at last made his way from Pannonia across the Alps, and, although an army sent by the emperor caused him some loss, probably near Ravenna, his junction with Alaric could not be prevented. Now, at last, a general outcry against Olympius, who had shown himself so utterly incompetent, arose at the imperial court. The emperor was forced to give in and depose his favorite, and after this he at length inclined his ear to more peaceful proposals. When, however, the Gothic chief, in an interview with the Prefectus Pretorio Jovius at Ariminum, demanded not only an annual subsidy of money and corn, but also the cession of Venezia, Noricum and Dalmatia, and when, moreover, the same Jovius, in a letter to the emperor, proposed that Alaric should be raised to the rank of a magister utrisque milite, because it was hoped that this would induce him to lower his terms, Honorius refused everything and was determined to go to war. Apparently, this bellicose mood continued, for, shortly afterwards, a fresh embassy from Constantine appeared at the court, promising Honorius' speedy support from British, Gaulish and Spanish soldiers. Even Jovius had allowed himself to be persuaded by the emperor and, together with other high officials, had taken an oath of pain of death never to make peace with Alaric. At first all seemed to go well. Honorius levied 10,000 Huns for his army and to his great satisfaction found that Alaric himself was inclined to peace and was sending some Italian bishops as ambassadors to him. Of his former conditions, he only maintained the cession of Noricum and a subsidy of corn, the amount of which was to be left to the emperor's decision. He requested Honorius not to allow the city of Rome which had ruled the world for more than a thousand years, to be sacked and burnt by the Teutons. There can be no doubt that the Goths were forced by the pressure of circumstances to offer these conditions. But Honorius was prevented from complying with them by Jovius, who is said to have pleaded the sanctity of the oath which he and others had taken. Alaric now had recourse to a simple device in order to attain the object of his desires. As he could not out of consideration for the Goths aspire to the imperial crown himself, he caused an emperor to be proclaimed. In order to put this proclamation into effect, he marched to Rome, seized the arbor of Portus, and told the senate of his intention to divide among his troops all the corn which he found stored there should the city refuse to obey his orders. The Senate gave in, and in compliance with Alaric's wish, was Attalus raised to the throne. 
He was a Roman of noble descent, who had been given a high government post by Olympius and shortly afterwards made prefect of the city by Honorius. Attalus thereupon raised Alaric to the rank of Magister Militum Presentalis and Atalf to that of Comes Domesticorum, but he gave them each a Roman colleague in their office and Valens was made Magister Militum, while Lampadius, an enemy of Alaric, became prefect of the city. On the next day, Attalus delivered a high-flown oration in the Senate, boasting that it would be a small matter for him and the Romans to subjugate the whole world. Soon, however, his relations with Alaric became strained. Formerly he had been a heathen, but though he now accepted the Arian faith and was baptized by the Gothic bishop Sigesar, he not only openly slighted the Goths, but also, disregarding Alaric's advice to send a Gothic army under Druma to Africa, dispatched the Roman Constans, with troops still prepared for war, to that country. Africa was at that time held by Heraclian, one of Honorius' generals, the murderer of Stilico, and the province required the emperor's whole attention as the entire corn supply of Rome depended upon its possession. Attalus himself now marched against Honorius at Ravenna. The latter, who had already contemplated an escape to the east, sent Attalus a message to the effect that he would consent to acknowledge him as co-emperor. Attalus replied, through Jovius, that he would order Honorius to be mutilated and banish him to some remote island besides depriving him of his imperial dignity. At this critical moment, however, Honorius was saved by 4,000 soldiers of the Eastern Empire, who disembarked at Ravenna and came to his assistance. When the news arrived that the expedition against Heraclian in Africa had proved a complete failure and that Rome was again exposed to a great famine, owing to this victory of Honorius' arms, Attalus and Alaric abandoned the siege of Ravenna. Alaric turned against Emilia, where he took possession of all the cities except Bologna, and then advanced in a northwesterly direction toward Liguria. Attalus, on the other hand, hastened to Rome to take counsel with the Senate about the pressing African question. The majority of the assembly decided to send an army of Gothic and Roman troops to Africa under the command of the Goth Druma, but Attalus opposed the plan. This brought about his fall, for when Alaric heard of it, he returned, stripped Attalus of the diadem and purple at Ariminum, and sent both to Honorius. He did not, however, leave the deposed emperor to his fate, but kept him and his son Ampelius under his protection till peace had been concluded with Honorius. Placidia, Honorius' sister, was also in Alaric's keeping. If we may believe Zosimus, she was brought from Rome as a kind of hostage by Alaric, who, however, granted her imperial honours. The deposition of Attalus in May or June 410 was the starting point for renewed negotiations for peace between Alaric and the Emperor, in the course of which the former perhaps claimed a part of Italy for himself. But the peaceful propositions were nipped in the bud by the god Sarus. He was hostile to Alaric and Autaulf. At that time he lay encamped in Picenum, under pretense of being menaced by Ataulf's strong body of troops, he went over to the emperor and violated the truce by an attack on the Gothic camp. Alaric now marched for the third time against Rome, doubtless firmly resolved to punish the emperor for his duplicity by throughoutly chastising the city and to establish at last a kingdom of his own. 
The investment by the Goths caused another terrible famine in the city, and at last, during the night preceding 24 August 410, the Salarian Gate was treacherously opened. Then followed a complete sack of the city, which did not, however, degenerate into mere wanton destruction, especially as it only lasted three days. The deeds of violence and cruelty which are mentioned more particularly in the writings of contemporary Christians were probably for the greater part committed by the slaves, who, as we know, had flocked to the gods in great numbers. As early as 27 August, the gods left Rome, laden with enormous spoil and marched by Capua and Nola into southern Italy. For Alaric, who had probably borne the title of king already for a considerable time, had resolved to go to Africa by way of Sicily, and gain the dominion of Italy by the possession of that rich province. But when part of the army had embarked at Regium, his ships were scattered and destroyed by a storm. Alaric therefore turned back, but on the way north were seized by an illness which proved fatal before the end of the year 410. He was laid to rest in the river Basentus, Busento, near Cosentia. A large number of slaves were employed in first diverting the course of the river and then bringing it back into its former channel after the dead king and his treasures had been buried. In order that nobody might ever know the burial place, all the slaves who had been employed in the labor were killed. Atauf was now elected king. He seems, at first, to have thought of carrying out the plans of his brother-in-law, Alaric, but on further consideration of the great power of Heraclian in Africa, he abandoned them and resolved rather to lead the gods against Gaul. It is possible that on his march northward he again sacked Rome and he certainly married Placidia before he withdrew from Italy. He invaded Gaul in 412 and in that year commenced the war which was waged so long by the Teutons against the Roman supremacy in that country. A little earlier a similar struggle had begun in Spain which resulted in the victory of the barbarians. In the autumn of 409, the Vandals, Alani and Suevi, had penetrated into Spain, tempted thither, no doubt, by the treasures of that rich country and by the greater security of a future settlement there. The course followed by those tribes was toward the west of the peninsula, first of all passing through Galicia and Lusitania, Constance, on leaving Spain, had suddenly made an unfortunate choice in appointing Geroncius prefect, for not only did this official allow the Teutons to enter the country, but he tried, at the same time, to put an end to Constantine's rule, by deserting him and causing one of his own followers, Maximus, to be proclaimed emperor. Circumstances even forced Geroncius into an alliance with the barbarians. For when Constance returned to Spain, the usurper could only drive him out of the country by making common cause with the Teutons. Geroncius followed Constance to Gaul, invested him at Vienne, and put him to death at the beginning of 411. He then turned his attention to Constantine, who concentrated his forces at Arles. But Honorius had by now recovered sufficiently to make war against Constantine. For that purpose, he sent the Roman Constantius and the Goth named Wulfila with an army to Gaul. When Geroncius advanced to meet them, his soldiers deserted him and joined the imperial troops. He himself met his death shortly afterwards in a burning house, whilst Maximus succeeded in escaping. This sealed the fate of Constantine, for Constantius and Wulfila defeated the army of the Frank Edobic, who came to render him assistance. 
Constantius then proceeded to besiege Ars, which for a considerable time withstood his efforts, but eventually surrendered on conditions to the general of Honorius. The reason for this was that Constantius had heard that Guntiarius, king of the Burgundians, and Goar, king of the Alani, had raised the Gaulish noble Jovinus to the imperial throne at Mainz, and in these circumstances he deemed it necessary to offer easy terms of capitulation to Constantine. The usurper submitted, but on the way to Ravenna he and his youngest son were killed by Honorius' command. His head was brought to Ravenna, 18 of September 411. Meanwhile, Jovinus, with an army consisting of Burgundians, Franks and Alemanni, had marched southward, apparently in the belief that the critical situation of the empire, which was at war with both Goths and Vandals, would facilitate a rapid extension of his power. In these circumstances, it was an easy matter for the Teutons, who had invaded Spain, to spread over a large part of the peninsula. For two years, they scoured the west and south of the country, devastating and plundering as they went, until the alteration in the political situation caused by the victories of Constantius induced them to join the United Empire as Federati. In 411, they concluded a treaty with the Emperor, which imposed upon them the duty of defending Spain from foreign invasions. In return, the Asdingi and Suevi received landed property for settlements in Galicia, the Silingi in Betica, and the Alani in Lusitania, and Carthaginensis. The larger Roman landowners probably ceded a third part of the land to them. It was a time of the gravest convulsions for the Western Empire, for during these years were laid the foundations on which the first important Teutonic states on Roman soil were built. Stilico seems to have thought it possible for a kind of organic whole to develop out of the Roman and Teutonic nationalities, at least that great statesmen had always promoted peaceful relations between Romans and Teutons. But the change in politics after his death as well as the immense size of the empire, made a fusion of those two factors impossible. Now, the time of the Teutonic conquests begins, though the name of Federati helped for a while to hide the real state of affairs. The very foundation of the Western Empire were shaken. But, above all, the future of Italy as the ruling power of the West was endangered by violent agitations in Africa, the country from which she drew her food supplies. Just as here, in the heart of the empire, so too on its borders, could serious danger be foreseen. Throughout the provinces, the dissolution of the empire was threatening. It had probably only been delayed so far by the lack of system in the Teutonic invasions and by the immense prestige of the empire. But in respect of this, the last generation had wrought a very perceptible change. During the long continued warfare, the Teutons had had time to become familiar with the manners of the Romans, their strategy, diplomacy and political institutions, and it was owing to this that the great coalition of tribes in 405 and 406 had already taken place. They are probably to be explained by the ever-increasing political discernment of the Teutons. Another result of those years of war was that under Alaric's rule, the principle of monarchy was evolved out of military leadership. For the continuous warlike enterprises could not but develop an appreciation of a higher and more comprehensive supreme power. Thus, Alaric was no longer the mere advisor of his tribe. His actions, however, do not show that he abused his high rank 
in his behavior towards his tribesmen, while at the same time he ever displayed towards the Romans a humane and generous spirit which was remarkable in those times. On the other hand, the Teutonic tribes, and especially the Visigoths, has seen enough of the internal weakness of the great empire and of the impotence of its rulers to encourage them to make more serious attacks on the western half, although Alaric, in 410, would willingly have saved from pillage the capital of the world, that capital which, according to his own words in a message brought to Honorius by an embassy of bishops, had ruled the world for more than a thousand years. The fact that he nevertheless led his army to the sack of the city proves that he did not shrink from extreme measures when it was important to display the superiority of the Gothic army over the Roman mercenaries. Thus it is evident that the Teutonic tribes, and more especially the Visigoths, were at this time passing through a transition stage. They had not yet forgotten their native customs and manner of living, whilst, at the same time, the foreign influences to which they had been exposed had been sufficiently strong to modify, to some extent, their original disposition and mode of viewing things. But as far as may be gathered from contemporary sources, their policy had not been influenced by Christian principles, and Christianity altogether played an important part in the history of these migrating Teutons. It is true that owing to the scantiness of contemporary evidence, we have in many decisive cases to trust to conjecture, and it is a cause for much regret that the moving political forces and even more the real conditions of life among the migrating Teutons are wrapped in impenetrable darkness, which is only dispersed as they begin to live a more settled life, and in particular after the establishment of the Visigoths in Gaul and Spain, the Vandals in Africa and the Ostrogoths in Italy. End of section 34 Recording by Emanuela Section 35 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C.J. Byrne. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Chapter 10a, by Ludwig Schmidt. The Visigoths in Gaul, 412-507. King Othulf had no intention of establishing a permanent dominion in Italy. As an occupation of Africa seemed hopeless, he turned towards Gaul in the year 412, probably making use of the military road, which crossed Mount Genevre via Turin to the Rhone. Here he at first joined the anti-emperor Jovinus, set up in the summer of 411, who had a sure footing, especially in Auvergne, but was little pleased by the arrival of the Visigoths, which interfered with his plans of governing the whole of Gaul. Hence the two rulers soon came to open strife, especially as Jovinus had not named the Gothic king co-ruler as he had hoped, but his own brother Sebastian. Athelwulf went over to the side of the emperor Honorius and promised, in return for the assurance of supplies of grain and assignments of land, to deliver up the heads of both usurpers and to set free Placidia, the emperor's sister, who was held as a prisoner by the Goths. He certainly succeeded without much trouble in getting rid of the usurpers. As, however, Honorius kept back the supply of grain, and Athulf, exasperated by this, did not give up Placidia, hostilities once more began between the Goths and the Romans. After an unsuccessful attempt to surprise Marseille, Athaulf captured the towns of Narbonne, Toulouse, and Bordeaux by force of arms, 413. But a complete alteration took place in the king's intentions, obviously through the influence of Placidia, whom he took as his second wife in January 414. 
As he himself repeatedly declared, he now finally gave up his original cherished plan of converting the Roman Empire into a Gothic one, and rather strove to identify his people wholly with the Roman state. His political program was therefore just the same as that of the Ostrogoth king Theodoric, later on when he accomplished the founding of the Italian kingdom. In spite of these assurances, the emperor refused him every concession. Influenced by the general Constantius, who had himself desired the hand of the beautiful princess, Honorius looked upon the marriage of his sister with the barbarian as a grievous disgrace to his house. In consequence, Athelwulf was again compelled to turn his arms against the empire. He first appointed an anti-emperor in the person of Attalus, without, however, achieving any success by this move, since Attalus had not the slightest support in Gaul. When Constantius then blockaded the Gallic ports with his fleet and cut off supplies, the position of the Goths there became quite untenable, so that Athelwulf decided to seek a place of retreat in Spain. He evacuated Gaul after terrible devastation and took possession of the Spanish province of Tarraconensis in the beginning of 415, but without quite giving up the thought of a future understanding with the imperial power. In Barcelona, Placidia bore him a son who received the name of Theodosius at his baptism, but he soon died, and not long afterwards death overtook the king from a wound which one of his followers inflicted out of revenge in the summer of 415. After Athelwulf's death, the anti-Romanizing tendencies among the Visigoths, never quite suppressed, became active again. Many pretenders contended for the throne, but all, as it seems, were animated by the thought of governing independently of Rome and not in subjection to it. At length, Sigurek, brother of the Visigoth prince Sarus, murdered by Athelwulf, succeeded in getting possession of the throne. Sigurek at once had the children of Athelwulf's first marriage slaughtered, and Placidius suffered the most shameful treatment from him. However, after reigning for one week only, he was murdered, certainly by the instigation of Walia, who now became head of the Goths, autumn 415. Walia, although no less an enemy to Rome than his predecessor, at once granted the imperial princess a more humane treatment, and first tried to develop further the dominion already founded in Spain. But as the imperial fleet again cut off all supplies and famine broke out, he determined to take possession of the Roman granary in Africa. But the undertaking miscarried because of the foundering in the Straits of Gibraltar of a detachment sent on in advance, which was looked upon as a bad omen. 416. The king, obliged by necessity, concluded a treaty with Constantius, in consequence of which the Goths pledged themselves in return for a supply of 600,000 measures of grain from the emperor, to deliver up Placidia, to free Spain from the Vandals, Alans, and Sueves, and to give hostages. After fierce protracted fighting, the Gothic army overcame first the Selingian Vandals, and then the Alans, 416 to 418. But when Walia also wanted to advance against the Asdingian Vandals and the Swaves in Galicia, he was suddenly called back by Constantius, who did not wish the Goths to become too powerful, and land for his people to settle upon was assigned to him in the province of Aquitanica Secunda, and in some adjoining districts by the terms of a treaty of alliance. End of 418. Shortly after, Walia died and was succeeded on the Visigoth throne by Theodoric I, chosen by the people. Historical tradition is silent over the first years of Theodoric's reign. They were taken up with the difficulties of devising and executing the partition of the land with the settled Roman population. The Goths kept their national constitution and were pledged to give military assistance to the empire. Their king was under the supreme command of the emperor, he only possessed a real power over his own people, while he had no legal authority over the Roman provincials. Such an indeterminate situation, after the endeavor so long directed towards the attainment of political independence, could not last long. In 421 or 422, Theodoric fulfilled his agreement by sending a contingent to the Roman army which was marching against the Vandals. But in the decisive battle, these troops fell upon the Romans from behind and so helped the Vandals to a brilliant victory. 
In spite of this base breach of faith, the Goths came off unpunished and even dared to advance southwards to the Mediterranean coast. In the year 425, a Gothic corps was before the important fortress of Arles, the coveted key of the Rhone Valley, but it was forced to retreat by the rapid approach of an army under Aetius. After further fighting, about which unfortunately nothing detailed is known to us, peace was made, and the Goths were granted full sovereignty over the provinces, which had originally been assigned to them for occupation only, Aquitanica Secunda and the northwest corner of Narbonensis Prima, while they restored all their conquests, circa 426. This peace continued for a considerable period and was only interrupted by the unsuccessful attempt of the Goths to surprise Arles, 430. But when, in 435, fresh disturbances broke out in Gaul, Theodoric took up once more his plans for the conquest of the whole of Narbonensian Gaul. The Goths went on fighting, but without success, and were at last driven back as far as Toulouse. But in the decisive battle, which was fought before the walls of this town, 439, the Romans suffered a severe defeat, and only the heavy loss of life which the Goths themselves sustained could decide the king to agree to the provisional restoration of the status quo. Theodoric was certainly not disposed to be satisfied with the narrow territory surrendered to him. Therefore, circa 422, we find him again on the side of Rome's enemies. First he entered into close relations with Geyseric, the dreaded king of the Vandals. But this coalition, which would have been so dangerous for the Roman Empire, was broken up by the ingenious diplomacy of Aetius. He next tried to attach himself to the powerful and rising kingdom of the Suaves by giving King Recyar one of his daughters in marriage, and by furnishing troops to assist his advance into Spain, 449. It was only when danger threatened the whole of the civilized West by the rise of the power of the Huns under Attila that the Goths again allied themselves with the Romans. In the beginning of the year 451, Attila's mighty army, estimated at half a million, set out from Hungary, crossed the Rhine at Easter time, and invaded Belgica. It was only now that Aetius, who had been deceived by the false representations of the king of the Huns, thought of offering resistance. But the standing army at his command was absolutely insufficient to hold the field against such a formidable opponent. He found himself, therefore, obliged to beg for help from the king of the Visigoths, who, although he had at first intended to keep himself neutral and await the development of events in his territory, thought, after long hesitation, that it would be in his own interest to obey the call. Theodoric joined the Romans with a fine army which he himself led, accompanied by his sons Thorismud and Theodoric. Attila had, in the meantime, advanced as far as Orléans, which Sangabin, the king of the Alans who were settled there, promised to betray to him. The proposed treachery, however, was frustrated, for the Allies were already on the spot before the arrival of the Huns, and had encamped in strength before the city. Attila thought he could not venture an attack on the strong fortifications with his troops, which principally consisted of cavalry, so he retreated to Troyes and took up a position five miles before that town on an extensive plain near the place called Mariacus, there to await a decisive battle with the Gotho-Roman army which was following him. Attila occupied the center of the Hun array with the picked troops of his people, while both the wings were composed of troops from the subjected German tribes. His opponents were so arranged that Theodoric, with the bulk of the Visigoths, occupied the right wing, Aetius with the Romans, and a part of the Goths under Thorismud, formed the left wing of the army, while the untrustworthy Alans stood in the center. Attila first tried to get possession of a height commanding the battlefield, but Aetius and Thorismud were beforehand, and successfully repulsed all the attacks of the Huns on their position. The king of the Huns now hurled himself with great force on the Visigothic main body commanded by Theodoric. After a long struggle, the Goths succeeded in driving the Huns back to their camp. Great losses occurred on both sides. The aged king of the Goths was among the slain, as was also a kinsman of Attila's. The battle, however, remained drawn, for both sides kept the field. The moral effect, which told for the Romans and their allies, was, however, very important, inasmuch as the belief that the powerful king of the Huns was invincible had suffered a severe shock. At first, it was decided to shut up the Huns in their barricade of wagons and starve them out. 
But when the body of Theodoric, who had been supposed up till then to be among the survivors, had been found and buried, Thorizamud, who was recognized as king by the army, called upon his people to revenge and to take the enemy's position by storm. But Aetius, who did not wish to let the Goths become too powerful, succeeded in persuading Thorizamud to relinquish his scheme, advising his return to Toulouse to prevent any attempt on his brother's part to get possession of the crown by means of the royal horde there. Thus were the Goths deprived of the well-earned fruits of their famous exploit. The Huns returned home unmolested. 451. Thorizamud proved himself anxious to develop the national policy adopted by his father, and in the same spirit. After he had succeeded, for the time being, in keeping possession of the throne, he subdued the Alans who had settled near Orléans, and thereby made preparations for extending the Gothic territory beyond the Loire. Then he tried to bring Arles under his power, but without having attained his object, he returned once more to his country, where in the meanwhile his brothers Theodoric II and Friedrich had stirred up a rebellion. After several armed encounters, Thorizamud was assassinated. 453. Theodoric II succeeded him on the throne. The characteristic mark of his rule is the close, though occasionally interrupted, connection with Rome. The treaty broken under Theodoric I, which implied the supremacy of the empire over the kingdom of Toulouse, was renewed immediately after his accession to the throne. For the rest, this connection was never taken seriously by Theodoric, but was principally used by him as a means towards the attainment of that end which his predecessors had vainly striven for by direct means, the spread of the Visigoth dominion in Gaul, and more especially in Spain. Already in the year 454, Theodoric found an opportunity for activity in the interest of the Roman Empire. A Gothic army under Friedrich marched into Spain and pacified the rebellious Bogadae ex octatorite Romana. After the murder of Valentinian III, March 455, Avitus went as Magister Militum to Gaul to win over the most influential powers of the country for the new emperor, Petronius Maximus. In consequence of his personal influence, he had formerly initiated Theodoric into the knowledge of Roman literature, he succeeded in bringing the king of the Goths to recognize Maximus. When, however, soon after this, the news of the murder of the emperor arrived, 31 May, Theodoric requested him to take the imperium himself. On 9 July, Avitus, who had been proclaimed emperor, accompanied by Gothic troops, marched into Italy where he met with universal recognition. The close relations between the empire and the Goths came again into operation against the Suaves, As the latter repeatedly made plundering expeditions into Roman territory, Theodoric, with a considerable force to which the Burgundians also added a contingent, marched over the Pyrenees in the summer of 456, decisively defeated them, and took possession of a large part of Spain, nominally for the empire, but actually for himself. But the state of affairs changed at one stroke when Avitus, in the autumn of the year 456, abdicated the purple. Theodoric had now no longer any interest in adhering to the empire. He had, in fact, required the promotion of Avitus because he enjoyed a great reputation in Gaul, and possessed there a strong support among the resident nobility. Friendship with him could only be of use to the king of the Goths in respect to the Roman provincials living in Toulouse. But the elevation of the new emperor Majorian on 1 April 457 had occurred in direct opposition to the wishes of the Gallo-Roman nobility to place one of themselves upon the imperial throne. Taking advantage of the consequent discord in Gaul, Theodoric appeared as the open foe of the imperial power of Rome. He himself marched with an army into the Gallic province of Narbonne and once more began with the siege of Arles. He also sent troops to Spain, which, however, only fought with varying success. But in the winter of 458, the emperor appeared in Gaul with considerable forces, quieted the rebellious Burgundians, and obliged the Visigoths to raise the blockade of Arles and again conclude peace. Spring 459. Although in the year 461 yet another change took place on the imperial throne, Theodoric thought it more advantageous for the time being to maintain, at least formally, the imperial alliance. On the other hand, 
the chief general, Aegidius, a faithful follower of Majorian, supported by a fine army, marched against the new imperial ruler. In the conflict which then ensued, Theodoric found a favorable opportunity for resuming his policy of expansion in Gaul. At the call of Count Agrippinus, who was commanding in Narbonne and was hard-pressed by Aegidius, he marched into the Roman territory and quartered upon that important town Gothic troops under the command of his brother Friedrich, 462. Driven out of southern Gaul, Aegidius turned northwards, whither a Gothic army led by Friedrich followed him. A great battle took place near Orléans, in which the Goths suffered a severe defeat, chiefly through the bravery of the Salian Franks, who were opposed to them and lost their leader in the battle, 463. Taking advantage of the victory, Aegidius now began to press victoriously into the Visigoth territory, but sudden death prevented him from carrying out his purposes, 464. Theodoric, freed from his most dangerous enemy, did not delay making good the losses he had suffered, but he died in the year 466 at the hand of his brother Euric, who was a champion of the anti-Roman national party and now ascended the throne. Contemporaries agree in describing the new king as characterized by great energy and warlike ability. We may venture to add from historical facts that he was also a man of distinguished political talent. The leading idea in his policy, the entire rejection of even a formal suzerainty of the Roman Empire, came into operation on his accession to the throne. The embassy which he then sent off to the emperor of eastern Rome can only have had for its object a request for the recognition of the Visigoth sovereignty. As no agreement was arrived at, he tried to bring about an alliance with the Vandals and the Suebes. But the negotiations came to nothing when a strong East Roman fleet appeared in African waters, 467. Yurik at first pursued a neutral course, but as the Roman expedition, set on foot with such considerable effort against the Vandal kingdom, resulted so lamentably, 468, he did not hesitate to come forward as assailant while he simultaneously pushed forward his troops into Gaul and Spain, 469. He opened hostilities in Gaul with a sudden attack on the Bretons, whom the emperor had sent to the town of Bourges. At Diol, not far from Chateauroux, a battle took place in which the Bretons were overthrown. Yet the Goths did not succeed in pushing forward over the Loire to the north. Count Paulus, supported by Frankish auxiliaries, successfully opposed them here. Euric therefore concentrated his whole strength partly on the conquest of the province of Equitanica Prima, partly on the annexation of the lower Rhone Valley, especially the long-coveted Arles. The provinces of Novem Populana and, for the most part, Narbonensis Prima, had been probably already occupied by the Goths under Theodoric II, an army which the West Roman Emperor Anthemius sent to Gaul for the relief of Arles was defeated in the year 470 or 471, and for the time being a large part of Provence was seized by the Goths. In Aquitanica Prima, also, town after town fell into the hands of Euric's general Victorious. Only Clermont, the capital city of Auvergne, obstinately defied the repeated attacks of the barbarians for many years. The moving spirits in the resistance were the brave Actitius, a son of the former Emperor Avitus, and the poet Sidonius Apollinaris, who had been its bishop from about 470. The letters of the latter give us a clear picture of the struggle which was waged with the greatest animosity on both sides. Euric is said to have stated that he would rather give up the much more valuable Septimania than renounce the possession of that town. The wholly impotent Western Empire was unable to do anything for the besieged. In the year 475, peace was at last made between the Emperor Nepos and Euric by the intervention of Bishop Epiphanius of Ticinum Pavia. Unfortunately, the conditions are not more accurately known, but there can be no doubt that, besides the previously conquered territory in Spain, the district between the Loire, the Rhone, the Pyrenees, and the two seas, was relinquished to Euric in sovereign possession. Thus Auvergne, so fiercely contended for, was surrendered to the Goths. But in spite of this important success, the king of the Goths had by no means reached the goal of his desires. 
it may be seen from the line of policy he followed later that the present moment seemed to him fit for carrying out that subjection of the whole of the West, which had long since been the aim of Alaric I. For this reason, peace only lasted for a year, which was spent in settling internal affairs. The most important event under Yurik's government at this time is the publication of a code of law which was intended to settle the legal relations of the Goths, both amongst themselves and with the Romans who had come under the Gothic dominion. The deposition of the last West Roman emperor, Romulus, by the leader of the mercenaries, Udavasar, September 476, gave the king a welcome reason for renewing hostilities, as he looked upon the treaty made with the empire as dissolved. A Gothic army crossed the Rhone and obtained final possession of the whole of southern Provence, as far as the Maritime Alps, together with the cities of Arles and Marseille, after a victorious battle against the Burgundians, who had ruled over this district under Roman suzerainty. But when Uric also marched a body of troops into Italy, it suffered defeat from the officers of Odovasar. Consequently, a treaty was concluded by the East Roman Emperor Zeno and the King of the Burgundians, whereby the newly conquered territory in Gaul, between the Rhone and the Alps south of the Durance, was surrendered by Odovasar to the Goths, while Uric evidently pledged himself to undertake no further hostilities against Italy, circa 477. Yurik was incessantly harassed by the difficulties of defending this mighty conquest from foes without and within. In particular, very frequent cause for interference was given by the conduct of the Catholic clergy, who openly showed their disloyalty, and, in the Vandal kingdom, did not shrink from the most treacherous actions. Yet they seem only in rare instances to have been answered by violence and cruelty. The Saxon pirates who, according to old custom, infested the coast of Gaul were vigorously punished by a fleet sent out against them. In the same way, it seems that an invasion of the Salian Franks was warded off successfully. It is not strange that, owing to the prestige of the Visigoth power, Uric's help was repeatedly requested by other peoples, as by the Heruli, Warni, and Tulingi, who, settled in the Netherlands, found themselves threatened by the overwhelming might of the Franks, and owed to the intervention of the Gothic king the maintenance of their political existence. The poet Sidonius Apollinaris has left behind a vivid description of the way in which, at that time, the representatives of the most diverse nations pressed round Uruk at the Visigoth court, even the Persians are said to have formed an alliance with him against the Eastern Empire. It seems that envoys from the Roman population of Italy also appeared at Toulouse to ask the king to expel Odovasar, whose rule was only reluctantly endured by the Italians. We do not know if you are contended gratifying this last request. In any case, he was prevented from executing any such designs through death, which overtook him in Arles in December 484. Under his son, Alaric II, the Visigoth power fell from its height. To be sure, the beginning of the decline originated at a time further back. Athulf's political program, as already observed, had originally contemplated the establishment of a national Gothic state in the place of the Roman Empire. Yet not one of the Visigoth rulers, in spite of honest purpose, could accomplish this task. It is to their credit that they succeeded at last, after severe fighting, in freeing themselves from the suzerainty of the emperor and obtaining political autonomy. But the state which thus resulted resembled a Germanic national state no more than it did a Roman imperium, and it could not contain the seeds of life because it was in a great measure dependent on foreign obsolescent institutions. The Goths had entered the world of Roman civilization too suddenly to be able either to resist or to absorb the foreign influences which pressed in on them from all sides. It was fortunate for the progress of Romanization that the Goths, cut off from the rest of the German world, could not draw thence fresh strength to recuperate their nationality or to replace their losses, and moreover that, through the immense extension of the kingdom under Europe, the numerical proportion between the Roman and Gothic population had altered very much in favor of the former. 
So, under the circumstances, it was a certainty that the Gothic kingdom in Gaul must succumb to the rising and politically creative power of the Franks. Neither the personality of Alaric, who was little fitted for ruling, nor the antagonism between Catholicism and Arianism caused the downfall. They only hastened it. End of section 35. Section 36 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C.J. Byrne. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Chapter 10a, by Ludwig Schmidt. Alaric ascended the throne on 28 December, 484. The king was of an indolent, weak nature, altogether the opposite of his father, and without energy or warlike capacity, as immediately became evident. For example, he submitted to give up Siagrius, whom he had received into his kingdom after the Battle of Soissons, 486, when the victorious king of the Franks threatened him with war. The inevitable settlement by arms of the rivalry between the two principal powers in Gaul was of course only put off a little longer by this compliance. About 494 the war began. It lasted for many years and was carried on with varying success on both sides. Hostilities were ended through the mediation of the Ostrogoth king Theodoric, who in the meanwhile had become Alaric's father-in-law. By the conclusion of a treaty of peace on the terms of Uti Possidetis, circa 502. But this condition could not last long, for the antagonism was considerably aggravated by the conversion of Clovis to the Catholic Church in the year 496, 25th of December. Consequently, the greatest part of Alaric's Roman subjects, with the clergy of course at their head, adhered to the Franks, and jealously endeavored to bring about the subjection of the Visigoth kingdom to their rule. Alaric was obliged to adopt severe measures in some instances against such treasonable desires, but usually he tried by gentleness and the granting of favors to win over the Romans to his support, an attempt which, in view of the prevalent and insurmountable antagonism, was of course quite ineffectual and even defeated its own ends, being regarded only as weakness. Thus he permitted the bishoprics kept vacant under Uric to be again filled, he moreover permitted the Gallic bishops to hold a council at Agde in September 506 and, indication of the ambiguous attitude of the clergy, it was opened with a prayer for the prosperity of the Visigoth kingdom. The publication of the so-called Lex Romana Visigothorum, also named Breviarum Alaricianum, represented the most important act of conciliation. This code of law, which had been composed by a commission of lawyers together with prominent laymen and even clergy, and was drawn from extracts and explanations of Roman law, was sanctioned by the king at Toulouse, 2 February 506, after having received the approval of an assembly of bishops and distinguished provincials, and was ordered to be used by the Roman population in the Gothic kingdom. Why the explosion was delayed until the year 507 is unknown. That the king of the Franks was the aggressor is certain. He easily found a pretext for beginning the war as champion and protector of Catholic Christianity against the absolutely just measures which Alaric took against his treacherous Orthodox clergy. Clovis had sufficiently appreciated the by no means despicable power of the Visigoth kingdom and had summoned a very considerable army, one contingent of which was furnished by the Ripuarian Franks. His allies, the Burgundians, approached from the east in order to take the Goths in the flank. Among his allies, Clovis probably also counted on the Byzantines, who placed their fleet at his disposal. On his part, Alaric had not looked upon coming events idly, but his preparations were hampered by the bad state of the finances of his kingdom. In order to obtain the necessary funds, he was obliged to coin gold pieces of inferior value, which were soon discredited everywhere. Apparently, the fighting strength of the Gothic army was inferior to the army of Clovis, but if the Ostrogoth troops, who had held out prospects of coming, should arrive at the right time, Alaric could hope to oppose his foe successfully. 
the King of the Franks had to endeavor to bring about a decisive action before the arrival of these allies. In the spring of 507, he suddenly crossed the Loire and marched towards Poitiers, where he probably joined the Burgundians. On the campus Vaucladensis, ten miles from Poitiers, the Visigoths had taken up their position. Alaric put off beginning battle because he was waiting for the Ostrogoth troops, but as they were hindered by the appearance of a Byzantine fleet in Italian waters, he determined to fight instead of beating a retreat, as it would have been wise to do. After a short engagement, the Goths turned and fled. In the pursuit, the king of the Goths was killed, it was said by Clovis's own hand, 507. With this overthrow, the rule of the Visigoths in Gaul was ended forever. The principal town of the Gothic kingdom was Toulouse, where the royal treasure was also kept. Euric, from time to time, also held court in Bordeaux, Alaric II in Narbonne. The Gothic rule originally stretched, as has already been mentioned, as far as the province of Aquitania Secunda and some bordering municipalities, among which was the district of Toulouse. But later on it extended not only over the whole territory of the Gallic provinces, but in addition to several parts of the provinces Vienensis, Narbonensis Secunda, Alps Maritime, and Lugdunensis Tertia. The Gothic possessions included also the greater part of the Iberian Peninsula, i.e. the provinces of Baetica, Lusitania, Terraconensis, and Carthaginensis. The provinces named were in Roman times, insofar as it was a question of civil administrations, governed by consulares or presides, and they were again divided into city districts, civitates or municipia. Under the sovereignty of the Goths, this constitution was maintained in its chief features. The inhabitants of the kingdom of Toulouse were composed of two races, the Goths and the Romans. The Goths were regarded by the Romans as foreigners so long as the federal connection remained in force. Yet both peoples lived side by side, each under its own law and jurisdiction. Intermarriage was forbidden. This rigid line of separation was adhered to even when the Goths had shaken off the imperial suzerainty and the Gothic king had become the sovereign of the native population of Gaul. Theoretically, the Romans had equal privileges in the state. Thus they were not treated as a conquered people without rights, as the Vandals and Langobards Lombards, dealt with the inhabitants of Africa and Italy. That the Goths were the real rulers was clearly enough made manifest to the Romans. The domestic condition of the Visigoths before the settlement in Gaul was undoubtedly on the same level as in their original home. Private property and land was unknown. Agriculture was comparatively primitive and cattle rearing provided the principal means of subsistence. A national change began with the settlement in Aquitaine. This was done on the principle of the Roman quartering of troops, so that the Roman landowners were obliged to give up to the Goths in free possession a portion of their total property, together with coloni, slaves, and cattle appertaining to it. According to the oldest Gothic codes of law, the Goth received two-thirds of the tilled land and, it seems, one-half of the woods. The wood and the meadow land, which was not partitioned, belonged to the Goths and the Romans for use in common. The parcels of land subjected to partition were called sortes, the Roman share, generally tertia, their occupants hospites or consortes. The Gothic sortes were exempt from taxation. As the invaders were very numerous compared with the extent of the province to be apportioned, there is no doubt that not only the large estates, but also the middle-sized and smaller properties were partitioned. Nevertheless, it is evident that not every Goth can have shared with a Roman possessor, because there certainly would not have been estates enough. We must rather assume that in the share given up, larger properties were split up among several families, as a rule among kinsmen. As the apportionment of the single lots undoubtedly took place through the decisive influence of the king, it is natural that the nobility, i.e. nobility by military service, was favored in the partition above the ordinary freemen. The landed property of the monarch's favorites must have gained considerably in extent, as elsewhere, through assignments from state property. The very considerable imperial possessions, both crown and private property, as a rule, fell to the share of royalty.
Land partition in the districts conquered later followed the same plan as in Aquitaine. Seizures of entire Roman estates certainly occurred, but they were exceptions and happened under special circumstances. As a rule, the Romans were protected by law in the possession of their tertiae, even if it were only for fiscal reasons. The considerably extended range of the Gothic kingdom offered the people ample space for colonization, so it was not necessary to encroach on the whole of the Roman territory, as had been the case in Aquitaine. It is to be assumed that in the newly won territories, only the superfluous element of the population had to be provided for. We are not to suppose a general desertion of the homeland. The social economy proceeded, on the whole, on the same lines as before, i.e. through colony and slaves, from whose toil the owners derived their principal support, at least in so far as it was a question of food. For the Goths, whose favorite occupations were warfare and the chase, had no inclination to devote themselves to arduous agricultural toil. They only wanted to control directly the rearing of cattle, as they did of old. Animal food seems to have been provided principally by means of large herds of swine. The revolution which the partition of land brought about in the habits of the Goths was too powerful not to exert the deepest influence on all the conditions of life. The rich revenues led to the display of a wanton and indolent way of living. The close contact with the Romans, who were for the most part morally decadent, was bound to affect injuriously a people so famous in earlier times for its austere manners. The old national bonds of union, besides having been relaxed through the migration, now from the scattering of the mass in colonization lost more and more of their original importance, since kinsmen need no longer be companions on the farmstead in order to obtain a living. The adoption of the Roman conditions of landholding obliged the Goths to accept numerous legal arrangements which were foreign to their national law and altered its principles considerably. Nevertheless, the national consciousness was strong enough to prevent it from merging itself quickly and completely in the Roman system. In contrast to the Ostrogoths, who did nothing but carefully conserve the Roman institutions which they found, the Visigoths are remarkable for an attitude in many respects independent towards the foreign organization. The entire power of government lay in the hands of the king, but the several rulers did not succeed in making their power absolute. Outwardly, the Visigoth king was only slightly distinguished from the other freemen. Like them, he wore the national skin garment and long curly hair. The raised seat as well as the sword appear as tokens of royal power. The insignia such as the purple mantle and the crown do not come till later. The old succession to the throne follows the system peculiar to the old German constitution of combined election and inheritance. After the death of Alaric I, his brother-in-law, Othewulf, was chosen king. Thus, a kindred connection played an important part in this choice. Othewulf's friendliness to Rome had placed him in opposition to the great mass of the people. Therefore, his successor was not his brother as he had wished, but first Sigaric and then Walia, who both belonged to other houses. The elevation of Theodoric I is also an instance of free election, the royal dignity remained in his house for over a century. Thorizamud was appointed king by the army. The succession of Theodoric II, Euric, and Alaric II, on the other hand, was only confirmed by popular recognition. Just as the people regularly took part in the choice of the successor to the throne, so their influence was often brought to bear on the sovereign's conduct of government. After the settlement in Gaul, there could certainly no longer be any question of a national assembly in the old sense of the word, especially after the great expansion of territory under Yorick. Meetings of all the freemen had become impossible on account of the expansion of the Gothic colonies. The circle of those who could obey the call to assemble became, therefore, smaller and smaller, while in carrying out the principal public functions, such as the coronation of the king, only those of the people who happened to be present at the place of election, or who lived in the immediate neighborhood, could as a rule take part. The importance which the commonalty hereby lost was gained by the nobility, an aristocracy founded on personal service to the king. It was only in the army that the greater part of the people found opportunity of expressing its will. It is certain that among the Visigoths, as among the Franks, regular military assemblies were held, 
which at first served the purpose of reviews and were under the command of the king. In these assemblies, important political questions were discussed, but the decision of the people was not always for the welfare of the state. The kingdom was subdivided very nearly on the lines of the previous Roman divisions into provinciae, and these again into civitates, territoria. At the head of the province was the dukes as magistrate for the Goths and Romans. He was also, as his title implies, in the first place the commander of the militia in the district, and he provided also the final authority and appeal in matters of government, corresponding to the praefectus praetorio, or vicarius of imperial times. The center of gravity of the government lay in the municipalities whose rulers were comites civitatum. They took exactly the place of the Roman provincial governors, so that the city districts also appear under the title of provinciae. Their authority extended even to the exercise of jurisdiction, with the exception of such cases as were reserved to the civic magistrates, and included control of the police and the collection of taxes. The dukes could at the same time be comes of a kiwitas in his district. At the head of the towns themselves were the curiales who, as hitherto, were bound by oath to fill their offices, and they were personally responsible for collecting the taxes. The most important official was the defensor, who was chosen from among the curiales by the citizens and only confirmed by the king. He exercised, in the first instance, jurisdiction in minor matters, but his activity extended over all the branches of municipal administration. Side by side with this Roman magistrature existed the national system which the Goths had brought with them. The Gothic people formed themselves into bodies of thousands, five hundreds, hundreds, and tens, which also remained as personal societies after the settlement. The millenarius, as of old, led the thousand in war and ruled over it jointly with the heads of the hundreds both in war and in peace. The comes Civitatis and his vicar originally only possessed jurisdiction over the Romans of his own circuit, but in Eurek's time that had so far changed that he now possessed authority to judge the Goths as well, in civil suits in conjunction with the Melenarius. Thus, the later condition was prepared in which the Melenarius appears only as military official. On the other hand, the defensor remained a judiciary solely for the Romans. We know but little about the officers of the central government. The first minister of Uric and of Alaric II was Leo of Narbonne, a distinguished man of varied talents. His duty comprised a combination of the functions of Questor, Sacre Palatae, and of the Magister Officiorum at the official court. He drew up the king's orders, conducted business with the ambassadors, and arranged the applications for an audience. A higher minister of the royal chancery was Anianus, who attested the authenticity of the official copies of the Lex Romana Visigothorum and distributed them. He seems to have answered to the Roman Primicieris notoriorum, or referendarius. The organization of the Catholic Church was not disturbed by the Visigoth rule. Rather, it was strengthened. The ecclesiastical subdivision of the land, as it had developed in the last years of the Roman sway, corresponded on the whole with the political. The bishoprics, which coincided in extent with the town districts, were grouped under metropolitan sees, which corresponded with the provinces of the secular administration. Since the middle of the 5th century, the authority of the Roman bishop over the church had been generally recognized. Next to the pope, the bishop of Arles exercised over the Gallic clergy a theoretically almost unlimited disciplinary power. A bishop was chosen by the laity and the clergy of his see, and was ordained by the metropolitan bishop of the province together with the other bishops. Although the boundaries of the Visigoth kingdom now in no way coincided with the old provincial and metropolitan boundaries, the hitherto existing metropolitan connection was nevertheless not set aside, nor were the relations of the bishops with the pope interfered with. The Gothic government as a rule showed great indulgence and consideration to the Catholic Church, which only changed to a more severe treatment when the clergy were guilty of treasonable practices, as happened under Uric. No organized and general persecution of the Catholics from religious fanaticism ever took place. The Catholic Church enjoyed particularly favorable conditions under Alaric II, 
who, in consideration of the threatening struggle with Clovis, acknowledged the formal legal position of the Roman Church according to the hitherto existing rules. Hardly anything is known of the ecclesiastical organization of the Arians in the kingdom of Toulouse. Probably in all the larger towns there were Arian bishops as well as Orthodox ones, and no doubt in earlier times they had been appointed by the king. Under the several bishops were the different classes of subordinate clergy. Presbyters and deacons are mentioned as in the Orthodox Church. The endowment of the Arian Church was probably as a rule allowed for, out of the revenue. Now and then, confiscated Catholic churches, as well as their endowments, were also made over to it. The church service was of course held in the vernacular, as it was in other German churches. The greater number of the clergy were therefore of Gothic nationality. The opposition between the two creeds was also certainly a very sharp one. Both sides carried on an active propaganda, which on the Arian side not unfrequently seems to have been urged by force, but such abolitions scarcely had the support and approval of the Gothic government. Very scanty indeed is our knowledge of the civilization of the kingdom of Toulouse. That the Romance element was foremost in almost every department has already been observed. The Goths, however, held to their national dress until a later period. They wore the characteristic skin garment which covered the upper part of the body, and laced boots of horsehide which reached up to the calf of the leg. The knee was left bare. There is no doubt that the Gothic tongue was spoken by the people in intercourse with each other. Unhappily, no vestiges remain of it except in proper names. It is certain, however, that a great part of the nobility, especially the higher officials, understood Latin well. Most of the Aryan clergy undoubtedly were also masters of both languages. Latin was the language of diplomatic intercourse and of legislation. Theodoric II was trained in Roman literature by Avitus. Uric, however, understood so little of the foreign language that he was obliged to use an interpreter for diplomatic correspondence. Yet this king was in no way opposed to the knowledge and significance of classical culture. The Visigothic court, therefore, formed a haven of frequent resort for the last representatives of Roman literature in Gaul. And the kings, from various motives, but especially from a fondness for Roman models, would employ the art of these men to celebrate their own deeds. Here may be named in the first place the poet Sidonius Apollinaris, who for a long time lived, first in the court of Theodoric II, and then in that of Euric. Euric's minister, Leo, also is said to have distinguished himself as a poet, historian, and lawyer, but no more of his writings have been preserved than of the rhetorician Lampridius, who sang the fame of the Gothic royal house at the court of Bordeaux. But the decay of literature, and of culture in general, which had been for so long in progress in spite of the support of the still existent schools of rhetoricians, could assuredly not be stayed by the patronage of the Gothic kings. End of section 36. End of chapter 10a. Section 37 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by C.J. Byrne. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Chapter 10b, by Christian Pfister. The Franks Before Clovis. Tacitus, in the De Moribus Germanorum, tells us that the Germans claimed to be descended from a common ancestor, Manus, son of the earth-born god Twisco. Manus, according to the legend, had three sons, from whom sprang three groups of tribes, the Istavones, who dwelt along the banks of the Rhine, the Ingavones, whose seat was on the shores of the two seas, the Oceanus Germanicus, North Sea, and the Mare Suevicum, the Baltic, and in the Cimbric Peninsula between. And lastly, more to the east and south, on the banks of the Elbe and the Danube, the Hermonones. After indicating this general division, Tacitus, in the latter part of his work, enumerates about forty tribes whose customs presented, no doubt, a strong general resemblance, but whose institutions and organization showed differences of a sufficiently marked character. When we pass from the first century to the fifth, we find that the names of the Germanic peoples given by Tacitus have completely disappeared. 
Not only is there no mention of Istevones, Ingevones, and Hermenones, but there is no trace of individual tribes such as the Chati, Chaoshi, and Cheruski. Their names are wholly unknown to the writers of the 4th and 5th centuries. In their place, we find these writers using other designations. They speak of Franks, Saxons, Alamans. The writers of the Merovingian period not unnaturally supposed that these were the names of new peoples who had invaded Germany and made good their footing there in the interval. This hypothesis found favor especially with regard to the Franks. As early as Gregory of Tours, we find mention of a tradition according to which the Franks had come from Pannonia, had first established themselves on the right bank of the Rhine, and had subsequently crossed the river. In the chronicler known under the name of Fredegar, the Franks are represented as descended from the Trojans. Quote, Their first king was Priam. Afterwards, they had a king named Friga. Later, they divided into two parts, one of which migrated into Macedonia and received the name of Macedonians. Those who remained were driven out of Phrygia and wandered about with their wives and children for many years. They chose for themselves a king named Francion, and from him took the name of Franks. Francion made war upon many peoples, and after devastating Asia, finally passed over into Europe and established himself between the Rhine, the Danube, and the sea. The writer of the Liber Historiae combines the statements of Gregory of Tours and of the pseudo Fredegar, and, with a fine disregard of chronology, relates that, after the fall of Troy, one part of the Trojan people, under Priam and Antinor, came by way of the Black Sea to the mouth of the Danube, sailed up the river to Pannonia, and founded a city called Sicambria. The Trojans, so this anonymous writer continues, were defeated by the emperor Valentinian, who laid them under tribute and named them Franks, that is, wild men, pharaohs, because of their boldness and hardness of heart. After a time, the Franks slew the Roman officials whose duty it was to demand the tribute from them. And, on the death of Priam, they quitted Sicambria and came to the neighborhood of the Rhine. There they chose themselves a king named Pharamon, son of Marcomir. This naive legend, half popular, half learned, was accepted as fact throughout the Middle Ages. From it alone comes the name of Pharamon, which in most histories heads the list of the kings of France. In reality, there is nothing to prove that the Franks, any more than the Saxons or the Alamans, were races who came in from without, driven into Germany by an invasion of their own territory. Some modern scholars have thought that the origin of the Franks, and of other races who make their appearance between the 3rd century and the 5th, might be traced to a curious custom of the Germanic tribes. The nobles, whom Tacitus calls principes, attached to themselves a certain number of comrades, comites, whom they bound to fealty by a solemn oath. At the head of these followers they made pillaging expeditions and levied war upon the neighboring peoples. The Combs was ready to die for his chief. To desert him would have been an infamy. The chief, on his part, protected his follower and gave him a war horse, spear, etc., as the reward of his loyalty. Thus there were formed, outside the regular state, bands of warriors united together by the closest ties. These bands, so it said, soon formed, in the interior of Germany, what were virtually new states, and the former princeps simply took the title of king. Such, according to the theory, was the origin of the Franks, the Alamans, and the Saxons. But this theory, however ingenious, cannot be accepted. The bands were formed exclusively of young men of an age to bear arms. Among the Franks, we find from the first old men, women, and children. The bands were organized solely for war, whereas the most ancient laws of the Franks have much to say about the ownership of land and about crimes against property. They represent the Franks as an organized nation with regular institutions. The Franks, then, did not come into Germany from without, and it would be rash to seek their origin in the custom of forming bands. That being so, only one hypothesis remains open. From the second century to the fourth, the Germans lived in a continual state of unrest. The different communities ceaselessly made war on one another and destroyed one another. 
civil war also devastated many of them. The ancient communities were thus broken up, and from their remains were formed new communities which received new names. Thus is to be explained why it is that the nomenclature of the Germanic peoples in the 5th century differs so markedly from that which Tacitus has recorded. But neighboring tribes presented, despite their constant antagonisms, considerable resemblances. They had a common dialect and similar habits and customs. They sometimes made temporary alliances, though holding themselves free to quarrel again before long and make war on one another with the utmost ferocity. In time, groups of these tribes came to be called by generic names, and this is doubtless the character of the names like Franks, Alamans, and Saxons. These names were not applied in the 4th and 5th centuries to a single tribe, but to a group of neighboring tribes who presented, along with real differences, certain common characteristics. It appears that the people who lived along the right bank of the Rhine, to the north of the Main, received the name of Franks. Those who had established themselves between the Ems and the Elbe, that of Saxons. Ptolemy mentions the Saxons as inhabitants of the Kimbric Peninsula, and perhaps the name of this petty tribe had passed to the whole group. While those whose territory lay to the south of the main, and who at some time or another had overflowed into the Agri Decumates, the present Baden, were called Alamans. It is possible that, after all, we should see in these three peoples, as Waits has suggested, the Istevones, Ingevones, and Hermanones of Tacitus. But it must be understood that between the numerous tribes known under each of the general names of Franks, Saxons, and Alamans, there was no common bond. They did not constitute a single state, but groups of states without federal connection or common organization. Sometimes two, three, even a considerable number of tribes might join together to prosecute a war in common. But when the war was over, the link snapped and the tribes fell asunder again. Documentary evidence enables us to trace how the generic name Franchi came to be given to certain tribes between the Main and the North Sea, for which we find these tribes designated now by the ancient name, which was known to Tacitus, and again by the later name. In Putinger's chart, we find Shamavi qui est Franchi, and there is no doubt that we should read qui est Franchi. The Chamavi inhabited the country between the Isel and the Ems. Later on, we find them a little further south on the banks of the Rhine in Hameland, and their laws were collected in the ninth century document known as the Lex Francorum Chamavorum. Along with the Chamavi, we may reckon among the Franks the Aturae or the Chaturai. We read in Ammianus Marcellinus 10, Reno transmisso. Reginum pervasit, Julian in A.D. 360, Francorum quos atuarios vocant. Later, the pagus atuariorum will correspond to the country of Emmerich, of Cleves, and of Xanton. We may note that in the Middle Ages there was to be found in Burgundy, in the neighborhood of Dijon, a pagus atuariorum, and it is very probable that a portion of this tribe settled at this spot in the course of the 5th century. The Bructeri, the Amsivari, and the Chati were, like the Chamavi, reckoned as Franks. They are mentioned as such in a well-known passage of Sulpicius Alexander, which is cited by Gregory of Tours, Historia Francorum 2.9. Arbogast, a barbarian general in the service of Rome, desires to take vengeance on the Franks and their chiefs, Subregli, Suno, and Marcomir. Consequently, in midwinter of the year 392, Collecto exercito transgressus renum, bructeros ripae proximus, pagum etiam cem chavari inculunt de populatus est nulo unquam occursante, nisse quad pauci e ampsivarius e cathes marcomer dus in ulteriorbus colium iugis. Aparuer. It is this Marcomir, chief of the Amsivari and Chati, whom the author of the Liber Historiae makes the father of Pharamon, though he has nothing whatever to do with the Salian Franks. Thus it is evident that the name Franks was given to a group of tribes, not to a single tribe. 
The earliest historical mention of the name may be that in Pudinger's chart, supposing at least that the words a pranchi are not a later interpolation. The earliest mention in a literary source is in the Vita Oriolani of Vopiscus, Capitulum 7. In the year 240, Aurelian, who was then only a military tribune, immediately after defeating the Franks in the neighborhood of Mainz, was marching against the Persians, and his soldiers, as they marched, chanted this refrain, Mila Sarmatas, Mila Francos Semel e Semel Oxidimus, Mil Persas Querimus. It would be, in any case, impossible to follow the history of all these Frankish tribes for want of evidence, but even if their history was known, it would be of quite secondary interest, for it would have only a remote connection with the history of France. Offshoots from these various tribes no doubt established themselves sporadically here and there in ancient Gaul, as in the case of the Atuari. It was not, however, by the Franks as a whole, but by a single tribe, the Salian Franks, that Gaul was to be conquered. It was their king who was destined to be the ruler of this noble territory. It is therefore to the Salian Franks that we must devote our attention. The Salian Franks are mentioned for the first time in A.D. 358. In that year, Julian, as yet only a Caesar, marched against them. Petit primos omnium francos eos fidelicet quos consuetudo salios epelevit. Ammianus Marcellinus 8. What is the origin of the name? It was long customary to derive it from the river Isel, Isala, or from Salin to the south of the Zyder Zee. But it seems much more probable that the name comes from Sal, the Salt Sea. The Salian Franks at first lived by the shores of the North Sea and were known by this name in contradistinction to the Ripuarian Franks who lived on the banks of the Rhine. All their oldest legends speak of the sea, and the name of one of their earliest kings, Merovich, signifies sea-born. From the shores of the North Sea, the Salian Franks had advanced little by little towards the south, and at the period when Ammianus Marcellinus mentions them, they occupied Toxandria, that is to say, the region to the south of the Meuse, between that river and the Scheldt. Julian completely defeated the Salian Franks, but he left them in possession of their territory of Toxandria. Only, instead of occupying it as conquerors, they held it as fuadrati, agreeing to defend it against all other invaders. They furnished also to the armies of Rome soldiers whom we hear of as serving in far distant regions. In the Notitia Dignitatum, in which we find a sort of army list of the empire drawn up about the beginning of the 5th century, there is mention of Sale Signors and Sale Juniors, and we also find Sali figuring in the Auxilia Palatina. At the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 5th century, the Salian Franks established in Toxandria ceased to recognize the authority of Rome and began to assert their independence. It was at this period that the Roman civilization disappeared from these regions. The Latin language ceased to be spoken and the Germanic tongue was alone employed. Even at the present day, the inhabitants of these districts speak Flemish, a Germanic dialect. The place names were altered and took on a Germanic form, with the terminations Hem, Gem, Seel, and Sel indicating a dwelling place, Lu, Wood, Dal, Valley. The Christian religion retreated along with the Roman civilization, and those regions reverted to paganism. For a long time, it would seem, the Salian Franks were held in check by the great Roman road, which led, by way of Arras, Cambrai, and Bavay, to Cologne, and which was protected by numerous forts. The Salians were subdivided into a number of tribes, each holding a pagus. Each of these divisions had a king who was chosen from the most noble family, and who was distinguished from his fellow Franks by his long hair, Crinity Regis. The first of these kings, to whom we have a distinct reference, bore the name of Clogio, or Clojo Clodion. He had his seat at Dispargum, the exact position of which has not been determined. It may have been in Deist, in Brabant. 
Desiring to extend the borders of the salient Franks, he advanced southwards in the direction of the great Roman road. Before reaching it, however, he was surprised near the town of Helena, Elesma Nor, when engaged in celebrating the betrothal of one of his warriors to a fair-haired maiden by Aetius, who exercised in the name of Rome the military command in Gaul. He sustained a crushing defeat. The victor carried off his chariots and took prisoner even the trembling bride. This was about the year 431. But Clodion was not long in recovering from this defeat. He sent spies into the neighborhood of Cambrai, defeated the Romans, and captured the town. He had thus gained command of the great Roman road. Then, without encountering opposition, he advanced as far as the Somme, which marked the limit of Frankish territory. About this period, Tournai on the Scheldt seems to have become the capital of the Salian Franks. Clodion was succeeded in the kingship of the Franks by Merovich. All of our histories of France assert that he was the son of Clodion, but Gregory of Tours simply says that he belonged to the family of that king, and he does not even give this statement as certain. It is maintained, he says, by certain persons, Duhuis Stirpe Gidem Merovich, Regium Fuis Adzerunt. We should perhaps refer to Merovich certain statements of the Greek historian Priscus, who lived about the middle of the 5th century. On the death of a king of the Franks, he says, his two sons disputed the succession. The elder betook himself to Attila to seek his support. The younger preferred to claim the protection of the emperor and journeyed to Rome. Quote, I saw him there, he says. He was still quite young. His fair hair, thick and very long, fell over his shoulders. End quote. Aetius, who was at this time in Rome, received him graciously, loaded him with presents, and sent him back as a friend and ally. Certainly, in the sequel, the Salian Franks responded to the appeal of Aetius, and mustered to oppose the great invasion of Attila, fighting in the ranks of the Roman army at the Battle of the Moriac Plain, A.D. 451. The Vita Lupi, in which some confidence may be placed, names King Merovich among the combatants. Various legends have gathered round the figure of Merovich. The pseudo fredegar narrates that as the mother of this prince was sitting by the seashore, a monster sprang from the waves and overpowered her, and from this union was born Merovich. Evidently, the legend owes its origin to an attempt to explain the etymology of the name Merovich, son of the sea. In consequence of this legend, some historians have maintained that Merovich was a wholly mythical personage, and they have sought out some remarkable etymologies to explain the name Merovingian, which is given to the kings of the First Dynasty. But in our opinion, the existence of this prince is sufficiently proved, and we interpret the term Merovingian as meaning descendants of Merovich. Merovich had a son named Childeric. The relationship is attested in precise terms by Gregory of Tours, who says, Cujus filius fuit Childericus. In addition to the legendary narratives about Childeric, which Gregory gathered from oral tradition, we have also some very precise details which the celebrated historian borrowed from annals, now no longer extant. The legendary tale is as follows. Childeric, who was extremely licentious, dishonored the daughters of many of the Franks. His subjects, therefore, rose in their wrath, drove him from the throne, and even threatened to kill him. He fled to Thuringia. It is uncertain whether this was Thuringia beyond the Rhine, or whether there was a Thuringia on the left bank of the river, but he left behind him a faithful friend, whom he charged to win back the allegiance of the Franks. Childeric and his friend broke a gold coin in two, and each took a part. When I send you my part, said the friend, and the pieces fit together to form one whole, you may safely return to your country. The Franks unanimously chose for their king Aegidius, who had succeeded Aetius in Gaul as Magister Militum. At the end of eight years, the faithful friend, having succeeded in gaining over the Franks, sent to Childeric the token agreed upon and the prince, on his return, was restored to the throne. The queen of the Thuringians, Bassina by name, left her husband Bassinus to follow Childeric. I know thy worth, said she, and thy great courage, therefore I have come to live with thee. 
If I had known, even beyond the sea, a man more worthy than thou art, I would have gone to him. Childeric, well pleased, married her forthwith, and from their union was born Clovis. This legend, on which it would be rash to base any historical conclusion, was amplified later, and the further developments of it have been preserved by the pseudo Fredegar and the author of the Liber Historiae. But alongside of this legendary story, we have some definite information regarding Childeric. While the main center of his kingdom continued to be in the neighborhood of Tournai, he fought along with the Roman generals in the valley of the Loire against all the enemies who sought to wrest Gaul from the empire. Unlike his predecessor Clodion and his son Clovis, he faithfully fulfilled his duties as Federatus. In the year 463, the Visigoths made an effort to extend their dominions to the banks of the Loire. Egidius marched against them and defeated them at Orléans. Friedrich, brother of King Theodoric II, being slain in the battle. Now we know for certain that Childeric was present at this battle. A short time afterwards, the Saxons made a descent by way of the North Sea, the Channel, and the Atlantic under the leadership of a chief named Odovasar, established themselves in some islands at the mouth of the Loire, and threatened the town of Angers on the Mayenne. The situation was the more serious because Egidius had lately died, October 464, leaving the command to his son, Siagrius. Childeric threw himself into Angers and held it against the Saxons. He succeeded in beating off the besiegers, assumed the offensive, and recaptured from the Saxons the islands which they had seized. The defeated Odovasar placed himself, like Childeric, at the service of Rome, and the two adversaries, now reconciled, barred the path of a troop of Alamans who were returning from a pillaging expedition into Italy. Thus Childeric policed Gaul on behalf of Rome and endeavored to check the inroads and forays of the other barbarians. The death of Childeric probably took place in the year 481, and he was buried at Tournai. His tomb was discovered in the year 1653. In it was a ring bearing his name, Childerici Regis, with the image of the head and shoulders of a long-haired warrior. Numerous objects of value, arms, jewels, remains of a purple robe ornamented with golden bees, gold coins bearing the effigies of Leo I and Zeno, emperors of Constantinople, were found in the tomb. Some of these treasures, as could be preserved, are now in the Bibliothèque Nationale at Paris. They serve as evidence that these Merovingian kings were fond of luxury and possessed quantities of valuable objects. In the ensuing volume, it will be seen how Childeric's son Clovis broke with his father's policy, threw off his allegiance to the empire, and conquered Gaul for his own hand. While Childeric was reigning at Tournai, another salient chief, Ragnachar, reigned at Cambrai, the town which Clodion had taken. The residence of a third, named Chararic, is unknown to us. The Salian Franks, as we have said above, were so called in contradistinction to the Ripuarians. The latter doubtless included a certain number of tribes, such as the Amsivari and the Bructeri. Julian, in the year 360, checked the advance of these barbarians and forced them to retire across the Rhine. In 389, Arbogast similarly checked their inroads and conquered all their territory in 392, as we have already said. But in the beginning of the 5th century, when Stilicho had withdrawn the Roman garrisons from the banks of the Rhine, they were able to advance without hindrance and establish themselves on the left bank of the river. Their progress, however, was far from rapid. They only gained possession of Cologne at a time when Salvian, born about 400, was a man in middle life, and even then the town was retaken. It did not finally pass into their hands until the year 463. The town of Treves was taken and burned by the Franks four times before they made themselves masters of it. Towards 470, the Ripuarians had founded a fairly compact kingdom, of which the principal cities were Aix la chapelle Bonn, Juliet, and Zulpic. They had advanced southwards as far as Dividurum, Metz, the fortifications of which seem to have defied all their efforts. The Roman civilization, the Latin language, and even the Christian religion seem to have disappeared from these regions occupied by the compact masses of these invaders. The present frontier of the French and German languages, 
or a frontier drawn a little further to the south, for it appears that in course of time French has gained ground a little, indicates the limit of their dominions. In the course of their advance southwards, the Ripuarians came into collision with the Alamans, who had already made themselves masters of Alsace and were endeavoring to enlarge their borders in all directions. There were many battles between the Ripuarians and Alamans, one of which, fought at Zulpic, Tolbiacum, a record has been preserved. Sigebert, king of the Ripuarians, was there wounded in the knee and walked lame for the rest of his life, whence he was known as Sigebertus Claudus. It appears that at this time the Alamans had penetrated far north into the kingdom of the Ripuarians. This kingdom was destined to have but a transient existence. We shall see in the following volume how it was destroyed by Clovis and how all the Frankish tribes on the left bank of the Rhine were brought under his authority. While the Salian and Ripuarian Franks were spreading along the left bank of the Rhine and founding flourishing kingdoms there, other Frankish tribes remained on the right bank. They were firmly established, especially to the north of the Main, and among them the ancient tribe of the Chatti, from whom the Hessians are derived, took a leading place. Later, this territory formed one of the duchies into which Germany was divided, and took from its Frankish inhabitants the name of Franconia. If we desire to make ourselves acquainted with the manners and customs of the Franks, we must have recourse to the most ancient document which has come down from them, the Salic Law. The oldest redaction of this law, as will be shown in the next volume, probably dates only from the last years of Clovis, 507 to 511, but in it are codified much more ancient usages. On the basis of this code, we can conjecture the condition of the Franks in the time of Clodion, of Merovich, and of Childeric. The family is still a very closely united whole. There is solidarity among relatives, even to a remote degree. If a murderer could not pay the fine to which he had been sentenced, he must bring before the Mal court twelve comprobators who made affirmation that he could not pay it. That done, he returned to his dwelling, took up some earth from each of the four corners of his room, and cast it with the left hand over his shoulder towards his nearest relative. Then, barefoot and clad only in his shirt, but bearing a spear in his hand, he leaped over the hedge which surrounded his dwelling. Once this ceremony had been performed, it devolved upon his relative, to whom he had thereby ceded his house, to pay the fine in his place. He might appeal in this way to a series of relatives one after another, and if, ultimately, none of them was able to pay, he was brought before four successive mouths, and if no one took pity on him and paid his debt, he was put to death. But if the family was thus a unit for the payment of fines, it had the compensating advantage of sharing the fine paid for the murder of one of its members. Since the solidarity of the family sometimes entailed dangerous consequences, it was permissible for an individual to break these family ties. The man who wished to do so presented himself at the mall before the centenarius and broke into four pieces above his head three wands of alder. He then threw the pieces into the four corners, declaring that he separated himself from his relatives and renounced all rights of succession. The family included the slaves and liti, or freemen. Slaves were the chattels of their master. If they were wounded, maimed, or killed, the master received the compensation. On the other hand, if the slave had committed any crime, the master was obliged to pay, unless he preferred to give him up to bear the punishment. The Franks recognized private property, and severe penalties were denounced against those who invaded the rights of ownership. There are penalties for stealing from another's garden, meadow, cornfield, or flax field, and for plowing another's land. At a man's death, all his property was divided among his sons. A daughter had no claim to any share of it. Later, she is simply excluded from Salic ground, that is, from her father's house and the land that surrounds it. We find also in the Salic law some information about the organization of the state. The royal power appears strong. Any man who refuses to appear before the royal tribunal is outlawed. 
All his goods are confiscated, and anyone who chooses may slay him with impunity. No one, not even his wife, may give him food, under penalty of a very heavy fine. All those who are employed about the king's person are protected by a special sanction. Their vergelt is three times as high as that of other Franks of the same social status. Over each of the territorial divisions called Pagi, the king placed a representative of his authority known as the Graffio, or, to give him his later title, the Cones. The Graffio maintained order within his jurisdiction, levied such fines as were due to the king, executed the sentences of the courts, and seized the property of condemned persons who refused to pay their fines. The Pagus was in turn subdivided into hundreds, centenae. Each hundred had its court of judgment known as the Mal. The place where it met was known as the Malberg. This tribunal was presided over by the Centenarius or Thunginus. These terms appear to us to be synonymous. Historians have devoted much discussion to the question whether this official was appointed by the king or elected by the freemen of the hundred. At the court of the hundred, all the freemen had a right to be present, but only a few of them took part in the proceedings. Some of them would be nominated for this duty on one occasion, some on another. In their capacity as assistants to the centenarios at the Mal, the freemen were designated Rashinburgi. In order to make a sentence valid, it was required that seven Rashinburgi should pronounce judgment. A plaintiff had the right to summon seven of them to give judgment upon his suit. If they refused, they had to pay a fine of three souls. If they persisted in their refusal and did not undertake to pay the three souls before sunset, they incurred a fine of fifteen souls. Every man's life was rated at a certain value. This was his price, the vergelt. The vergelt of a salient franc was two hundred souls, that of a Roman one hundred souls. If a salient franc had killed another salient, or a Roman, without aggravating circumstances, the court sentenced him to pay the price of the victim, the two hundred or one hundred souls. The compositio in this case is exactly equivalent to the vergelt. If, however, he had only wounded his victim, he paid, according to the severity of the injury, a lower sum proportionate to the vergelt. If, however, the murder has taken place in particularly atrocious circumstances, if the murderer has endeavored to conceal the corpse, if he has been accompanied by an armed band, or if the assassination has been unprovoked, the compositio may be three times, six times, nine times the vergelt. Of this compositio, two-thirds were paid to the relatives of the victim. This was the fida, and bought off the right of private vengeance. The other third was paid to the state or to the king. It was called fritus or freedom from the German word frida, peace, and was a compensation for the breach of the public peace of which the king is the guardian. Thus a very lofty principle was embodied in this penalty. The Salic law is mainly a tariff of the fines which must be paid for various crimes and offenses. The state thus endeavored to substitute the judicial sentences of the courts for private vengeance, part of the compensation being paid to the victim or his family to induce them to renounce this right. But we may safely conjecture that the triumph of law over inveterate custom was not immediate. It was long before families were willing to leave, to the judgment of the courts, serious crimes which had been committed against them, such as homicides and adulteries. They flew to arms and made war upon the guilty person and his family. The forming in this way of armed bands was very detrimental to public order. The crimes mentioned most frequently in the Salic Law give us some grounds on which to form an idea of the manners and characteristics of the Franks. These Franks would seem to have been much given to bad language, for the law mentions a great variety of terms of abuse. It is forbidden to call one's adversary a fox or a hare, or to reproach him with having flung away his shield. It is forbidden to call a woman meretrix, or to say that she had joined the witches at their revels. Warriors who are so easily enraged readily pass to violence and murder. Every form of homicide is mentioned in the Salic law. The roads are not safe, and are often infested by armed bands. 
In addition to murder, theft is very often mentioned by the code. Theft of fruits, of hay, of cattle bells, of horse clogs, of animals, of river boats, of slaves, and even of freemen. All these thefts are punished with severity and are held by all to be base and shameful crimes. But there is a punishment of special severity for robbing a corpse which has been buried. The guilty person is outlawed and is to be treated like a wild beast. The civilization of these Franks is primitive. They are, above all else, warriors. As to their appearance, they brought their fair hair forward from the top of the head, leaving the back of the neck bare. On their faces they generally wore no hair but the mustache. They wore close-fitting garments fastened with brooches and bound in at the waist by a leather belt which was covered with bands of enameled iron and clasped by an ornamental buckle. From this belt hung the long sword, the hanger or scramasax, and various articles of the toilet, such as scissors and combs made of bone. From it, too, was hung the single-bladed axe, the favorite weapon of the Franks, known as the Francisca, which they used both at close quarters and by hurling it at their enemies from a distance. They were also armed with a long lancer spear, Latin, framia, formed of an iron blade at the end of a long wooden shaft. For defense, they carried a long shield made of wood or wattles covered with skins, the center of which was formed by a convex plate of metal, the boss, umbo, fastened by iron rods to the body of the shield. They were fond of jewelry, wearing gold finger rings and armlets, and collars formed of beads of amber or glass or paste inlaid with color. They were buried with their arms and ornaments, and many Frankish cemeteries have been explored in which the dead were found fully armed, as if prepared for a great military review. The Franks were universally distinguished for courage. As Sidonius Apollinaris wrote of them, from their youth up, war is their passion. If they are crushed by weight of numbers, or through being taken at a disadvantage, death may overwhelm them, but not fear. End of section 37. End of chapter 10b. Section 38 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 38. Chapter 11. The Suevis, Allens, and Vandals in Spain, 400 to 429. The Vandal Dominion in Africa by Ludwig Schmidt, Part 1. Thanks to its geographically strong position, the Iberian Peninsula had, up till now, escaped barbarian invasions. When, however, the Roman troops stationed to protect the passes of the Pyrenees gave way to negligence, the Asdingian and Selingian Vandals, the non-German Alans, and the Suevis availed themselves of the favorable opportunity to cross the mountains, autumn 409. For two whole years, the four peoples wandered about, devastating the flourishing country, especially the western and southern provinces, without settling anywhere. It was only when famine and disease broke out and menaced their own existence that they were persuaded to more peaceful relations. They concluded a treaty in the year 411 with the emperor, according to which they received land to settle on as federati, i.e. as subjects of the empire, with the duty of defending Spain against attacks from without. The assignment of the provinces in which the different people should settle was decided by lot. Galicia fell to the Asdingians and the Suevas, while the Selingians received Baetica, southern Spain, and the Alans, numerically the strongest people, Lusitania, Portugal, and Carthaginensis, capital Cartagena. Probably they divided the land with the Roman proprietors. The peace brought about in this way did not, however, last long. The imperial government had professed only to regard the arrangement as a temporary expedient. As early as the year 416, the Visigoth king Valia appeared in Spain with a considerable army to free the land from the barbarians in the name of the emperor. 
First of all, the Selingians were attacked and, after repeated combats, completely destroyed, 418, their king, Fredbal, being carried to Italy as prisoner. As a tribal name, the name of Astingians disappears. It only survived as the appellation of members of the royal family. The Alans also, against whom Valia next marched, were severely beaten and so much weakened that after the death of King Attic, the people decided not to choose another head, but to join the Asdingian Vandals, whose kings from that time bore the title Regis Vandalorum et Alanorum, 418. Only the recall of Valia, end of 418, saved the Asdingians and the Suevis from the extermination which menaced them. The former rallied wonderfully. They first of all turned against their Suevian neighbors, then under the rule of Hermeric, who had once more made overtures to the emperor, and pressed them back into the Cantabrian mountains, from which they were only extricated by a Roman army which hurriedly came to their assistance. 419. Obliged to retreat to Baetica, the Vandals encountered in 421 or 422 a strong Roman army under Castinus, but owing to the treachery of the Visigoth troops who were fighting on the Roman side, they gained a brilliant victory. This success immensely stimulated the power of the Vandals and their desire for expansion. They then laid the foundation of their maritime power, afterwards so formidable. We understand that they infested the Balearic Isles and the coast of Mauritania in the year 425. At that time, Cartagena and Seville, the last bulwarks of the Romans in southern Spain, also fell into their power. Three years later died Gunderic, who had ruled over the Vandals since 406. He was succeeded on the throne by his brother Gesseric, born about 400, one of the most famous figures in the Wandering of the Nations, 428. A year after his accession, Gesseric led his people over to Africa. This undertaking sprang from the same political considerations as had earlier moved the Visigoth kings, Alaric and Valia, the rulers of that province, whose main function it was to supply Italy with corn, had the fate of the Roman Empire in their hands, but they were themselves in an almost unassailable position so long as a good navy was at their disposal. The immediate occasion was furnished by the confusion which then reigned in Africa, the revolt of the Moors, the revolutionary upheaval of the severely oppressed peasantry, the revolt of the ecclesiastical sects, particularly the Donatists, Circumcelliones, the manifest weakness of the Roman system of defense everywhere, and, finally, a quarrel between the military governor of Africa, Bonifacius, and the imperial government. The well-known story that Bonifacius himself had called the Vandals into the land to revenge the wrongs he had suffered is a fable, which first appeared in Roman authorities of a later time and was invented to veil the real reason. The crossing took place at Iulia Traducta, now Tarifa, in May 429. Shortly before embarking, the Vandal king turned back with a division of his army and totally defeated the Suaves in a bloody fight near Merida. The Suaves had taken advantage of the departure of their enemies to invade Lusitania. According to a trustworthy account, Gesseric's people numbered at that time about 80,000 souls, i.e. about 15,000 armed men. Their numbers were made up of Vandals, Alans, and Visigoth stragglers who had remained behind in Spain. The Germans first met with the sternest resistance when they entered Numidia in the year 430. Bonifacius opposed them here with some hurriedly collected troops, but was defeated. The open country was then completely given over to the enemy. Only a few forts, Hippo Regius, now Bona, Sirta, Constantine, and Carthage, were kept by the Romans. Hippo, mainly through the influence of St. Augustine, who died during the siege, 28 August, 430. As it was impossible for the barbarians to take these strongholds, owing to their inexperience in siege work, and as the Romans, in the meantime, sent reinforcements under Aspar into Carthage by sea, Gesseric, after heavy losses, resolved to enter into negotiations with the emperor. On 11 February, 435, at Hippo Regius, a treaty was concluded with the imperial agent Trigetius, according to which the Vandals entered the service of the empire as federati and were settled in the proconsulate of Numidia, capital Hippo, probably in the same way as earlier in Spain, 
for here, too, no formal cession of territory took place. Gesserich, however, no doubt regarded the situation thus produced as only temporary. After he had again to some extent united his forces, he posed as a perfectly independent ruler in the district assigned to him. The arbitrary actions in which he indulged comprised the deposition of a number of Orthodox clergy who had tried to hinder the performance of the Aryan service. Vandal pirates scoured the Mediterranean and even plundered the coasts of Sicily in 437. But on 19 October 439, Gesseric unexpectedly attacked Carthage and captured the city without a stroke. The occupation was followed by a general pillage, which naturally did not end without deeds of violence, even if we are not told of any deliberate destruction or damage to particular buildings. The Catholic clergy and the noble inhabitants of Carthage experienced the fate of banishment or slavery. All the churches inside the town, as well as some outside, were closed for Orthodox services and given over to the Arian clergy together with the ecclesiastical property. Gesserich must have expected that after these proceedings, the imperial government would use every possible means of chastising the bold raiders of its most valuable province. To prevent this, and to reduce the Western Empire to a state of permanent helplessness by continuously harassing it, he fitted out a powerful fleet in the harbor of Carthage in the spring of 440, with the special aim of attacking Sardinia and Sicily, which were now primarily relied upon to supply Italy with corn. Although extensive preparations for defense had been arranged, the Vandals landed in Sicily without encountering any resistance and moved to and fro, burning and laying waste, but returned to Africa in the same year, 440, on hearing tidings of the approach of powerful Byzantine succors. The expected Greek fleet certainly appeared in Sicilian waters in 441, but the commanders wasted their time there in useless delay and when the Persians and the Huns invaded the borderlands which had been denuded of troops, the whole fighting force was called back without having effected anything. Under these circumstances, the emperor of western Rome found himself obliged to conclude a peace with Gesseric, whose rule was officially recognized as independent in 442. It is stated by some authorities that Africa was divided between the two powers. The best parts of the country— Tingitian Mauritania, by which the Straits of Gibraltar were controlled, Zugatena, or Proconsularis, Byzacena and Numidia Proconsularis fell to the Vandals, whilst Mauritania Caesariensis and Sidifensis, Sirtan Numidia, and Tripolis remained to the Roman Empire. This treaty forms an important epoch in the history of the Vandals and marks the end of their migration. A final settlement of the conditions for colonization now took place. The Vandals settled down definitely in the country districts of Zugatena in the neighborhood of Carthage. Military reasons, which made a settlement of the people desirable, especially in the neighborhood of the capital city, as well as the circumstance that the most fertile arable lands lay there, were of principal weight in this step. The former landowners, as many as had not been slain or exiled during the conquest, had to choose whether, after the loss of their property, they would make their home as freemen elsewhere or remain as servants, i.e., probably as colony, on their former estates. The Catholic clergy, if they resided within the so-called Vandal allotment, met with the same fate as the landowners, a measure which was principally directed against their suspected political propaganda. In the other provinces, and especially in the towns, the Roman conditions of property remained as a rule undisturbed, although the Romans were considered as a subject people and the land the property of the state or the king. In order to deprive his enemies, internal or external, of every possible gathering point, Gesseric next had the fortifications of most of the towns demolished, with the exception of the castle Septa in the Straits of Gibraltar and the towns Hippo Regius and Carthage. The last was looked upon as the principal bulwark of the Vandal power. The sovereign position which Vandal power had now attained found expression in the legal dating of the regnal years from 19 October 439, the date of the taking of Carthage, which was reckoned as New Year's Day. There is no trace here of any reckoning according to the consular years or indictions, as was the custom, for example, in the kingdom of the Burgundians, 
who continued to consider themselves formally as citizens of the Roman Empire. How powerful the kingdom of Gesseric was at this epoch is seen from the fact that the Visigoth king, Theodoric I, sought to form alliance with him by marrying his daughter to the king's son, Huneric, the heir presumptive to the throne. This state of affairs, however, did not last long, for Gesseric, under the pretext that his daughter-in-law wanted to poison him, sent her back to her father after having cut off her nose and her ears. Probably the dissolution of this coalition, so menacing to Rome, was brought about by a diplomatic move on the part of the West Roman minister Aetius, who held out prospects to the king of the Vandals of a marriage between his son and a daughter of the Emperor Valentinian III. Although the projected wedding did not take place, friendly relations were begun between the Vandals and the Romans, which lasted until the year 455. Gesseric was even induced to allow the See of Carthage, which had been vacant since 439, to be again filled. But this friendly connection ceased at once when the Emperor Valentinian, the murderer of Aetius, was himself slain by that general's following, 16 March 455. Gesseric announced that he could not recognize the new Emperor Maximus, who had had a hand in the murders of Aetius and Valentinian, and had forced the widowed Empress Eudoxia to marry him, as a fit inheritor of the imperial throne. Under this pretext, he immediately sailed to Italy with a large fleet, which seems to have been long since equipped in readiness for coming events. That he came in response to an appeal from Eudoxia cannot be for a moment supposed. Without meeting any resistance, the Vandals, amongst whom also were Moors, landed in the harbor of Portus and marched along the Via Portuensis to the Eternal City. A great number of the inhabitants took to flight. When Maximus prepared to do likewise, he was killed by one of the soldiers of his bodyguard, 31st May. On the 2nd of June, Gesseric marched into Rome. At the Porta Portuensis, he was received by Pope Leo I, who is said to have prevailed upon the king to refrain at least from fire and slaughter, and content himself merely with plundering. The Vandals stayed a fortnight, June 455, in Rome, long enough to take all the treasures which had been left by the Visigoths in the year 410, or restored since. First of all, the imperial palace was fallen upon. All that was there was brought to the ships to adorn the royal residence in Carthage, among other things, the insignia of imperial dignity. The same fate befell the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus, of which even the half of the gilded roof was taken away. Among the plundered treasure, the vessels of Solomon's temple, formerly brought to Rome by Titus, took a conspicuous place. On the other hand, the Christian churches, as a rule, were spared. Murder and incendiarism also, as has been certainly proved, did not take place, neither was there any wanton destruction of buildings or works of art. It is therefore very unjust to brand Gesseric's people with the word vandalism, which indeed came into use in France no earlier than the end of the 18th century. Besides the enormous spoil which the Vandals carried away were numerous prisoners, in particular the widowed Empress Eudoxia with her two daughters, Eudoxia and Placidia, as well as Gaudentius, the son of Aetius. The Vandals and the Moors divided the prisoners between them on their return. Nevertheless, Bishop Deogratius raised funds to ransom many of them by selling the vessels of the churches. The capture of the Empress Eudoxia and her daughters gave the king valuable hostages against the hostile invasion of his kingdom, which might now be expected. He was now fully master of the situation. His personality is from this time the center of Western history. The Vandal fleet ruled the Mediterranean and cut off all supplies from Italy, so that a great famine broke out. In order to put an end to this intolerable state of affairs, Avitus, the new emperor of Western Rome from 9 July 455, sent an embassy to Byzantium to induce the emperor to take part in a joint attack against the Vandal Empire, for in an attack on Africa he could not dispense with the East Roman fleet. But Martian, probably influenced by the chief general Aspar, all-powerful in the east, still clung to inactivity, and contented himself with asking Gesseric to refrain from further hostilities towards Italy, and to deliver up the prisoners of the imperial house, 
a proceeding which, of course, was quite ineffectual. The result of this lethargy on the part of both empires was that the Vandals were in a position to seize the rest of the African provinces belonging to Rome. Even the Moorish tribes seem to have acknowledged the Vandal sovereignty without positive resistance. Moreover, Gesseric made an alliance with the Spanish Sueves, who had invaded and plundered the province of Tarraconensis, 456, which belonged to the Roman Empire. At the same time, a Vandal fleet laid waste Sicily and the bordering coast territory of South Italy. It is true that on land the Romans succeeded under Richimer in defeating a hostile division at Agrigentum, as well as one at sea in Corsican waters. But these successes had no lasting effect, for the Vandals still commanded the Mediterranean as before. The populace, furious from the continued famine, compelled Avitus to fly to Gaul, where he died at the end of the year 456. His successor on the imperial throne, Majorian, from 1 April 457, at once began in real earnest to consider schemes for the destruction of the Vandal Empire. It might be looked upon as auspicious that not long after his accession, a body of Roman troops succeeded in defeating a band of Vandals and Moors, led by Gesseric's brother-in-law, who were engaged in desultory plunder in South Italy. The emperor himself marched with a large army, which he had not got together without difficulty, from Italy to Gaul in November 458, in order to exact recognition of his authority from the Visigoths and Burgundians who had succeeded from Rome, and his success in this task at once rendered nugatory Gesseric's conclusion of a Visigoth, Suebian, and Vandal alliance. In May 460, Majorian crossed the Pyrenees and moved upon Zaragoza to Cartagena in order to cross from thence to Africa. The force that had been raised was so impressive that the king of the Vandals did not feel himself a match for it and sent messengers to sue for peace. When peace was refused, he laid waste Mauritania and poisoned the wells in order to delay the advance of the enemy as much as possible. The Roman attack, however, could not be carried out, for the Vandals managed by means of treachery to seize a great number of the Roman ships which were lying outside the naval harbor near the modern Elka. Majorian had no alternative but to make peace with Gesseric. His authority, however, was so shaken by this failure that he was divested of his dignity by Richimer in August 461. The result of the elevation of a new emperor, Libius Severus, was that Gesseric once more declared the agreements he had but just made to be at an end. He again began his naval attacks on Italy and Sicily. The embassies sent to him by the West Roman, as well as by the Byzantine Emperor Leo, had no further result than the deliverance of Valentinian's widow and her daughter Placidia, for he had previously given the elder princess Eudoxia to his son Huneric in marriage. The king received as ransom a part of the treasure of Valentinian. It also seems that an agreement was come to with the East Roman Empire. On the other hand, the hostile relations with West Rome continued for Richimer refused to comply with Gesseric's principal demand, the bestowal of the imperial throne of the West upon Olibrius, Huneric's brother-in-law. Every year, in the beginning of spring, detachments of the Vandal fleet left the African harbors to infest the Mediterranean coasts. Unprotected places were plundered and destroyed, while the garrisoned places were carefully avoided. The danger threatening the Western Empire reached its height when the commander Egidius, who maintained an independent position in Gaul, made an alliance with Gesseric, and prepared to attack Italy in conjunction with him. This scheme was not carried out, for Aegidius died prematurely in 464, but the situation still remained dangerous. These miserable conditions lasted until the end of 467. The energetic Emperor Leo had by this time succeeded in overcoming the influence of Aspar, who had always been a hindrance to hostile measures against the Vandals. He dispatched a fleet under the command of Marcellinus to convey the newly created Western Emperor Anthemius to Italy, and afterwards proceed to Africa. But first he sent an embassy to Gesseric to inform him of the accession of Anthemius and to threaten him with war, unless he would relinquish his marauding expeditions. The king instantly refused the demand and declared the agreements made with Byzantium at an end. 
His ships no longer sought Italy, but the coasts of the Eastern Empire, Illyria, the Peloponnesus, and all the rest of Greece felt his powerful arm, and even Alexandria felt itself menaced. But when the attempt of Marcellinus to advance against Africa miscarried on account of contrary winds, Leo determined to make great warlike preparations and to destroy his terrible opponent at one blow. Eleven hundred ships were got together and an army of one hundred thousand men raised. The plan of campaign was to attack the Vandal Empire on three sides. The main army was to march under Basiliscus direct to Carthage. Another body under Heraclius and Marsus was to advance over land from Egypt to the west, while Marcellinus, with his fleet, was to strike at the Vandal center in the Mediterranean. But once more, fortune favored the Vandals. They succeeded under cover of night in surprising Basiliscus's fleet, which was already anchored at the Promontorium Mercuri, now Cape Bon, and destroyed a part of it by fire. The rest took to flight, and scarcely one half of the fine armada managed to escape to Sicily, 468. The not unimportant successes which the other Byzantine generals had in the meantime achieved could not balance this catastrophe, and as a crowning misfortune, the able Marcellinus, when on the point of sailing for Carthage, was murdered, August 468. Leo was therefore obliged to relinquish further undertakings and make peace once more with Gesseric. The peace, however, only lasted a few years. After Leo's death, January 474, the Vandals again devastated the coast of Greece in frequent expeditions. The Emperor Zeno, who was not prepared to punish the marauders, was obliged to sue for peace and sent the senator Severus to Carthage to superintend negotiations. It was agreed that the two empires from that time should not be hostile to each other. The king promised to guarantee freedom of worship to the Catholics in Carthage and to permit the return of the clergy who had been banished for political intrigues, though he could not be prevailed upon to allow a new appointment to the Carthaginian bishopric, vacant since Deogracia's death, 457. Besides this, he restored without ransom the Roman prisoners who had been allotted to him and his family and gave Severus permission to buy back the slaves allotted as booty among the Vandals with the goodwill of their owners. In return, the Byzantine emperor, as the overlord of both halves of the empire, no doubt formally recognized the Vandal kingdom in its then extent. It comprised the entire Roman province of Africa, the Balearic Isles, Pithyusae, Corsica, Sardinia, and Sicily, autumn 476. Gesseric soon afterwards made over Sicily to Odovacar in return for the payment of a yearly tribute, only reserving for himself the town of Lilibaeum, which had a strategical importance as a starting point for Africa. On the 25th of January, 477, Gesseric died at a very great age, after he had raised the Vandal Empire to the height of its power. What he accomplished as general and politician in his active life is beyond praise and is unreservedly acknowledged by contemporaries. On the other hand, a less favorable verdict must be pronounced on his statesmanship. The empire he established was a hybrid state and therefore bore from the beginning the seeds of decay in itself. The nations under his rule were kept strictly separate from each other, and the possibility of an amalgamation, which might have been the foundation of a new political organization, was thus prevented. Herein is seen the truth found by experience that the existence of all kingdoms erected by conquest is bound up with the life of their creator, unless the latter can succeed in creating a united organism on a national, constitutional, or economic basis. End of section 38. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 39 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 39. Chapter 11. The Sueves, Alans, and Vandals in Spain, 400-429. The Vandal Dominion in Africa. By Ludwig Schmidt. Part 2. 
The decline was already noticeable under Gesseric's eldest son and successor, Huneric, the husband of the imperial princess Eudoxia. The Moorish tribes living in the Aris Mountains, after fighting for some time with varying fortune, succeeded at last in shaking off the Vandal rule. In a quarrel with the Eastern Empire over the surrender of Eudoxia's fortune, Huneric early gave in. He was even willing to permit the Episcopal See at Carthage to be filled again in 481, and grant the Catholics in his empire still greater freedom of movement. Only when he learned that he had not to fear hostilities from Byzantium did he show himself in his true colors, a tyrant of the worst, most bloodthirsty type. Then he raged against the members of his own house and against his father's friends. Some of them he banished, others he murdered in a horrible manner in order to secure the succession to his son Hilderic. When nothing more remained for him to do in this direction, he proceeded to oppress his Catholic subjects. Among some of the measures taken by him, the most important is the notorious Edict of 24th of January, 484, in which the king ordered that the edicts made by the Roman emperors against heresy should be applied to all his Catholic subjects, unless they adopted Arianism by the 1st of June in that year. Next, Orthodox priests were forbidden to hold religious services, to possess churches or build new ones, to baptize, consecrate, and so forth, and they were especially forbidden to reside in any towns or villages. The property of all Catholic churches and the churches themselves were bestowed on the Arian clergy. Laymen were disabled from making or receiving gifts or legacies. Court officials of the Catholic creed were deprived of their dignity and declared infamous. For the several classes of the people, graduated money fines were established according to rank. But in case of persistence, all were condemned to transportation and confiscation of property. Huneric gave the execution of these provisions into the hands of the Arian clergy, who carried out the punishments threatened with the most revolting cruelty, and even went beyond them. Repeated intervention on the part of the emperor and the pope remained quite ineffectual, for they confined themselves to representations. Perhaps Catholicism might have been quite rooted out in Africa if the king had not died prematurely on the 23rd of December, 484. Under his successor, Guntamund, better times began for the oppressed Orthodox Church. As early as the year 487, most of the Catholic churches were opened again and the banished priests recalled. The reason for these changed circumstances lay partly in the personal character of the king partly in the emperor's separation from the Roman Church, which appeared to debar Guntaman's Catholic subjects from conspiring with Byzantium, and partly in the now ever-increasing dimensions of Moorish rebellion. Guntaman was very fortunate in driving back these last to their haunts, but he did not succeed in completely defeating them. He absolutely failed when he attempted to regain possession of Sicily during the struggle between Odovacar and Theodoric the Great. The expedition sent thither was expelled by the Ostrogoths, and the king was compelled even to relinquish the tribute which had hitherto been paid to him in 491. Guthaman died on the 3rd of September, 496. Thrasimund, his brother, distinguished for his beauty, amiability, wisdom, and general culture, succeeded him on the throne. He pursued yet a different course from that of his predecessors with regard to the Catholics. He tried, like Huneric, to spread Arianism in his kingdom, yet as a rule he avoided the violent measures to which that king had recourse. Thus several bishops, among whom was the Bishop of Carthage, were once more banished, but they were all well treated in their exile. His action was mainly due to religious fanaticism, for there was no ground for political suspicion, at least during the greater part of his reign. The king was on friendly terms with the schismatical Emperor Anastasius. After the accession of the Orthodox Emperor Justin in 518, Thrasimund's aversion to the Catholics is easier to understand, especially when the emperor took steps to improve the position of the Orthodox Episcopate in Africa. The Vandal Kingdom found a real support in the alliance with the Ostrogoths in Italy. Theodoric the Great, swayed by the desire to bring about an alliance of all German princes of the Aryan faith, wedded his widowed sister Amalafrida to Thrasimund, whose first wife had died childless. 
She came to Carthage with a retinue of 1,000 distinguished Goths as her bodyguard, as well as 5,000 slaves capable of bearing arms, and brought her royal husband a dowry of the part of the island of Sicily round Lilibaeum in 500. A temporary interruption occurred in the alliance between the two states in 510 through 511 because Thrasimund gave pecuniary support to Gesellic, the pretender to the Visigothic throne, who was not recognized by Theodoric, but on the representation of his brother-in-law he repented and apologized. Serious difficulties occurred in the Vandal kingdom once more through the Moors. The tribes of Tripolis really succeeded in making themselves independent. At the end of his reign, the king himself took the field against them, but suffered defeat. Thrasimund died on the 6th of May, 523. He was succeeded by the already aged, utterly effeminate son of Huneric and Eudoxia, Hilderic, who was averse from warfare. Thrasimund, having a presentiment of future events, had exacted an oath from him not to restore to the banished Catholics either their churches or their privileges, but Hilderic evaded his pledge, for even before his formal accession, he recalled the exiled clergy and ordered fresh elections in the place of those who had died. In foreign politics also, the new king turned entirely from the system hitherto followed of alliance with the Ostrogoth kingdom and entered into a close connection with the Byzantine Empire, where Justinian, the nephew of the aging Emperor Justin, already practically wielded the scepter. Inasmuch as he had coins struck bearing the effigy of Justin I, Hilderic formally gave the impression of recognizing a kind of suzerainty of the Byzantine Empire. To the opposition of Amalafrida and her following, he replied by slaughtering the Goths and flinging the sister of Theodoric into prison. To avenge this insult, the Gothic king fitted out a strong fleet, but his death in 526 prevented the dispatch of the expedition, which would probably have been fatal to the Vandal kingdom. Theodoric's grandson and successor, Athalaric, or rather his mother, Amalasuntha, was content with making remonstrances, which of course received no attention. Though there was nothing to fear from the Ostrogoths, the danger from the Moors waxed ever greater. After the year 525, it appears that they had acquired control over Mauritania Caesariensis, with the exception of its capital city, of the Sidifensis province, and of southern Numidia as well. Mauritania Tingitana had already been given up, but especially momentous in its widespread results was the rise of Antalus, who at the head of some tribes in the southern part of Byzacene infested this province more and more, and at last severely defeated the relieving Vandal troops commanded by Elmer, a cousin of Hilderic. The dislike of the Vandals to their king, which had been existent long before this event, showed itself fully at this failure. Hilderic was deposed by the defeated army on its return home and was imprisoned together with his followers, and in his stead the next heir to the throne, Gelimer, a great-grandson of Gesseric, was called upon to rule. On the 19th of May, 530. Doubtless this usurpation was mainly the result of Gelimer's ambition and love of power, but on the whole it was sustained by the will of the people. They were discontented with the policy hitherto pursued towards the Catholics and Byzantium, as well as with the unwarlike, inconsistent character of Hilderic, who was, to Teutonic ideas, utterly unworthy of royalty. This course of events was most welcome to the Byzantine emperor, who in any case had, for some time past, harbored some idea of the plan, which later he definitely announced for joining all the lands belonging to the old Roman Empire under his own scepter. Just as he afterwards posed as the avenger of Amalasuntha, so he now became the official protector of the rights of the deposed king of the Vandals. He asked Gelimer in the most courteous manner not openly to violate the law regarding the succession to the throne, which had been decreed by Gesseric and had been always hitherto respected, but to be satisfied with the actual exercise of power and to let the old king, whose death might shortly be expected, remain as nominal ruler. Gelimer did not deign at first to answer the emperor. When, however, the latter took a sharper tone and demanded the surrender of the prisoners, he haughtily rejected the interference, emphatically claimed validity for his own succession, and declared that he was ready to oppose with the utmost vigor any attack which might occur. Justinian was now firmly resolved to bring matters to an armed decision, 
but first took steps to end the war which had begun against the Persians. In the year 532, peace was concluded with them. The scheme directed against the Vandal kingdom found no approval from the body of crown councillors, before whom Justinian laid it for an opinion. They objected to the chronic want of money in the state treasury, and that the same fate might easily be prepared for the Byzantines as had befallen Basilicus under Gesseric. The troops, too, which had just sustained the fatigues of the Persian campaign, were little fit to be again sent to an uncertain conflict against a powerful and famous kingdom on the other side of the sea. Justinian was almost persuaded to give up the undertaking when a fresh impulse, that of religion, made itself felt. An oriental bishop appeared at court and declared that God himself had, in a dream, commanded him to reproach the emperor on account of his indecision and to tell him that he might count on the support of heaven if he would march forth to liberate the Christian, that is, the Orthodox, people of Africa from the dominion of the heretics. Through this kind of influence on the part of the Catholic clergy, and through the endeavors of the Roman nobility, who had been reinstated by Hilderic but driven forth again by Gelimer, Justinian was entirely brought round. Belisarius, previously commander-in-chief in the Persian War, was placed at the head of the expedition with unlimited authority. It was very fortunate for the emperor that, in the first place, the Ostrogoth queen, Amalasuntha, declared for him and held out prospects of supplying provisions and horses in Sicily, and further, that the Vandal governor of Sardinia, Godus, rose against Gelimer and asked for troops to enable him to hold his own, and finally, that the population of Tripolis, led by a distinguished Roman, Prudentius, declared itself in favor of union with Byzantium. In June 533, the preparations for war were completed. The army mustered reckoned 10,000 infantry under Johannes of Epidamnus and about 5,000 cavalry. Also, the 5,000 men of Belisarius's powerfully mounted guard, 400 heralds, and 600 Huns. The fleet was composed of 500 transport vessels and 92 battleships under the command of Colonimus. Among Belisarius's attendants was the historian Procopius of Caesarea, to whom we owe the vivid and trustworthy description of the campaign. The departure of the ships took place at the end of July, and the last hour of the kingdom, which was once so powerful, had struck. It is only in Africa that we are well acquainted with the internal circumstances of the Vandal Kingdom, for of the parallel conditions in the Spanish communities of the Suevis, Alans, and the Silingian and Esdingian Vandals, we only know at the present time that they were under monarchical rule. The center of Vandal rule in Africa was Carthage. Here, all the threads of the government converged. Here, the king also held court. The Roman division of the land into provinces, Mauritania, Tingitana, Caesariensis, Sidifensis, Numidia, Proconsularis or Zugatana, Byzacene, Tripolitana, remained the same. The districts assigned to the Vandals, the so-called Sortus Vandalorum, were separated as a special commands. The governing people were the Vandals of the Astingian branch, which now alone survived, with whom were joined the Alans and contingents from different peoples, among whom in particular were Goths. The Alans, who probably were already Germanized at the time of the transference to Africa, seem to have maintained a kind of independence for a while, but in Procopius's time these foreign elements had become completely merged in the Vandals. The Romans were by far more numerous. These were by no means looked upon as having equal privileges, but were treated as conquered subjects according to the usages of war. Marriages between them and the Vandals were forbidden, as they were in all the German states founded on Roman soil, except among the Franks. If, however, the hitherto existing arrangements outside the Vandal settlements remained the same in the main, and indeed even the high offices were left in the hands of the Romans, this only happened because the Vandal kings proved themselves incapable of providing a fresh political organization. On the other hand, the numerous Moorish tribes were to a great extent held in only slight subjection. They retained their autonomy as they did in the time of the Romans, but their princes received from the hands of the Vandal kings the insignia of their dignity. 
Under Gesserik's stern government, they conducted themselves quietly and completely left off their raids into civilized districts, which had occurred so frequently in the last years of the Roman rule. But even under Huneric, they began with ever-increasing success to struggle for their independence. The destruction which befell the works of ancient civilization in Africa must be placed to the account of the Moors, not of the Vandals. The first settlement of the Vandals in Africa was on the basis of a treaty with the Roman Empire, when the people were settled among the Roman landowners, and as an equivalent became liable to land tax and military service. The land settlement, which took place after the recognition of the Vandal sovereignty, was carried out as by right of conquest. The largest and most valuable estates of the country landowners in the province of Zugatena were taken possession of and given to individual Vandal households. Further particulars of the details are wanting, yet it is certain that the Roman organization arranged on the basis of landed property grants was not disturbed. The property only changed hands, otherwise the conditions were the same as they had been under Roman government. Of the villa, the manor house on the Roman estate, a Vandal with his family now took possession and the colony had to pay the necessary dues to the landed proprietor or his representative and render the usual compulsory service. The profits of the single estates were in any case on an average not insignificant, for they made the development of a luxurious mode of life possible, even after an increase in the number of the population. The management of the estate was, as formerly, directed only in a minority of cases by the new masters themselves, for they lacked the necessary knowledge, and service in the court and in the army compelled them to be absent frequently from their property. More often, the management was entrusted to stewards or farmers, conductores, who were survivals from the earlier state of things. Nevertheless, the position of the dependents of the manor, wherever they were directly under the Vandal rule, must have been materially improved in comparison with what it had been formerly. For we know from various authorities that the country people were in no way content with the reintroduction of the old system of oppression by the Byzantines after the fall of the Vandal kingdom. The Vandals, like the other German races, were divided into three classes, slaves, freemen, and nobles. The nobleman, as he now appears, is a noble by service who derives his privileged position from serving the king, not as earlier from birth. The freemen comprised the bulk of the people. Nevertheless, they had, in comparison with earlier times, lost considerably in political importance, while the rights of the popular assembly had devolved in the strengthened monarchy. The slaves were entirely without rights. They were reckoned not as persons, but as alienable chattels. The position of the coloni, who were taken over from the Roman settlement, was wholly foreign to the Vandals. They remained tied to the soil, but were personally free peasants who kept their former constitutional status. At the head of the state was the king, whose power had gradually become unlimited and differed but little from that of the Byzantine Roman emperor. His full official title was Rex Vandalorum et Alinorum. His mark of distinction and that of his kindred was, as with Mervings, long hair falling to the shoulders. While the earlier rulers dressed in the customary Vandal costume, Gelimer wore the purple mantle like the emperor. The succession to the throne was legally settled by Gesserik's so-called testament. Gesserik, who himself had obtained the throne through the choice of the people, ignoring probably the sons of his predecessor Gunderic, who were still minors, considered himself, after he had fully grasped monarchical power, as the new founder of the Vandal kingship as the originator of a dynasty. The sovereignty was looked upon as an inheritance for his family, over which no right of disposal belonged to the people. As, however, the existence of several heirs threatened the by no means solidly established kingdom with the risk of subdivision into several portions, Gesserik established the principle of individual succession. Moreover, he provided that the crown should pass to the eldest of his male issue at the time being. By this last provision, the government of a minor, unable to bear arms, was made, humanly speaking, impossible. The Vandal Kingdom was the first, and for a long time, the only state in which the idea of a permanent rule of succession came to be realized, and rightly is Gesserik's family statute reckoned in history among the most remarkable facts relating to public law. 
It remained valid until the end of the kingdom. Gesseric himself was succeeded by his eldest son Huneric, who was succeeded in turns by two of his nephews, Guntamund and Thrasimund, and only after the death of the latter came Huneric's son Hilderic. Gelimer obtained the throne, on the other hand, in a direct and irregular way, and his endeavors to represent himself to Justinian as a legitimate ruler did not succeed. The scope of the royal power comprised the national army, the convening of the assembly, justice, legislation, and executive, the appointments to the prefecture, the supreme control of finance, of police, and of the church, of any cooperation in the government by the people, by the vandals, not, of course, by the Romans, such as obtained in olden times, there is no sign whatever. The development of absolute government seems to have been completed in the year 442. According to the brief but significant statements of our authorities, several nobles, who had twice risen against the king because he had overstepped the limits of his authority, were put to death with a good many of the people. The origin of the royal power is traceable to God. The dominant center of the state is the king and his court. In war, the king is in chief command over the troops and issues the summons to the weapon-bearing freemen. The arrangement of the army was, like that of the nation, by thousands and hundreds. Larger divisions of troops were placed under commanders appointed especially by the monarch and generally selected from the royal family. The Vandals had been, even in their settlements in Hungary, a nation of horsemen, and they remained so in Africa. They were chiefly armed with long spears and swords and were little suited to long campaigns. Their principal strength lay in their fleet. The ships they commanded were usually small, lightly built, fast-sailing cruisers, which did not hold more than about forty persons. In the great mobility of the army as well as of the navy lay the secret of the surprising successes which the Vandals achieved. But immediately after Gesseric's death, a general military decline began. Enervated by the hot climate and the luxury into which they had been allured by the produce of a rich country, they lost their warlike capacity more and more and thus sank before the attack of the Byzantines in a manner almost unique in history. The king is the director of the whole external polity. He sends forth and receives envoys, concludes alliances, decides war and peace. On single and peculiarly important questions, he may take counsel beforehand with the chiefs of his following, but the royal will alone is absolute. The Vandals were judged according to their national principles of jurisprudence in the separate hundred districts by the leaders of the thousands. Sentences for political offenses were reserved for the king as executor of justice in the National Assembly. Legal procedure for the Romans remained the same as before. Judgment was passed on trivial matters by the town magistrates, on greater by provincial governors according to Roman law, but in the name of the king. Quarrels between Vandals and Romans were, of course, settled only in the Vandal Court of Justice, according to the law of the victor. That the king often interfered arbitrarily in the regular legal proceedings of the Romans is not surprising, considering the state of affairs, but a similar arbitrary interference among the Vandals is a circumstance of political importance. Treason, treachery against the person of the king in his house, apostasy from the Arian church, come into prominence so that the life and freedom of individuals were almost at the mercy of the monarch's will. The laws which the Vandal kings enacted were, as far as we know, for the most part directed against the Romans and the Catholics. In addition to the numerous edicts concerning religion, the regulations issued against the immorality so widespread in Africa are especially worthy of remark, but like all regulations of the kind only possessed a temporary efficiency. On the other hand, the law of royal succession, which we have already alluded to, possessed universal validity. The officials in the service of the court and state, as also those in the church, are all subject to the royal power. They are nominated by the monarch, or at least confirmed by him, and can be deprived of their functions by peremptory royal decree. The members belonging to the household of the king represent different elements, spiritual and lay, German and Roman, free and unfree together. The highest official in the Vandal court was the Prepositus Regni, whose importance lay entirely in the sphere of the government of the kingdom. His position corresponded to that of a prime minister. 
as holders of this office appear, so far as is known, only persons of Teutonic nationality. An important post was also that of head of the Chancery of the Cabinet, who had to draw up the king's written edicts, and was, besides, frequently entrusted with different missions of a special political importance. The existence of a special Arian court clergy is to be inferred from the fact that at the princely courts house chaplains are mentioned. Besides these, there lived permanently at the Vandal court a supernumerary class of men who, without holding any definite office, enjoyed the favor of the king and were employed by him in different ways. A number of them seem to have borne the title Comes, as among the Franks, Ostrogoths, and others. From among them were taken, for example, the envoys sent to foreign nations. Together with the provincial officials who might be temporarily present at the court, and the Arian bishops, the persons of principal position in the king's circle frequently cooperated in the decision of important questions of state affairs. As a general designation for these persons when they belong to the laity, the expression domestici appears. Admittance into the royal household required an oath of fealty. From among the king's circle were drawn the greater part of the higher officials in the provincial government, especially over the Vandals. The most important officers of the Vandals were the heads of the thousands, the Chiliarchs, Milinari, on whom devolved the management of the districts, i.e. the settlements of a thousand heads of families, in judicial, military, administrative, and fiscal respects. Outside the Vandal allotments, the organization of the Roman system in Africa still remained, with the exception of the military, and the duties of the separate offices were discharged by the Romans themselves. The only exceptions were the islands in the Mediterranean. Sardinia, Corsica, and the Balearic Isles were united into one province and placed under a governor of German nationality who resided in Sardinia and exercised both military and civil functions. The ruler has, by virtue of his position, absolute right over the revenue of the state. State property and royal private property are identical. A principal source of revenue is provided by the produce of the royal domains, which in Roman Africa occupy a particularly important place. To this was added the taxes paid by the provincials, from which the Vandals themselves were entirely exempt. The burdens, however, cannot, as a rule, have been so oppressive as they were under the Roman rule, for later on, under the government of the Byzantines, the former more lenient conditions were regretted. Besides the taxes were to be taken into account the proceeds from the tolls, the right of coinage, fines, dues from mines and manufactures, and other unusual receipts. The Arian, as well as the Catholic Church, is subject to the royal power. The appointment of bishops is dependent on the consent of the sovereign. The synods are convoked by the king and can only meet with his permission. The Astingian Vandals, in their seats in Hungary, had clearly been already converted to Arianism, while the Selingians, Alans, and Suaves, in the first phase of their Spanish career, were still adherents of paganism. After the occupation of Africa, the Catholic clergy were entirely expelled from the country districts in the province of Zugatena, as well as from Carthage, and the vacant places were given over to the Arian clergy, with the whole of the church property. In the other parts of the kingdom, few or no Arian priests were to be found. Only under Huneric, who presented the whole of the Catholic churches to the Arians, a measure which certainly was never wholly carried out, were they installed in greater numbers. The bishop residing in Carthage bore the title of patriarch and exercised as metropolitan a supreme power over the whole of the Arian clergy. Since the Arian church service was held in the vernacular, as among the other Germans, the clergy were mostly of German nationality. The position of the Catholic Church was, as has been already remarked, very varied under the different rulers and very largely dependent on the state of foreign politics. In Africa, after the tumult of the conquest had passed over and the endowment of the Arian established church was put into effect, Gesseric only proceeded against those adherents of orthodoxy from whom danger to the state was to be feared. The clergy beyond the Vandal allotment were closely supervised, but they were not molested if they did not oppose the royal will, but confined themselves to the execution of their pastoral duties. The real persecutions began first under Huneric, and were continued, after an interval of peace, by Guntamund and Thrasimund, 
though in a milder form. Hilderic gave the Catholic Church its complete freedom again. His successor, Gelimer, an ardent Arian, was too much occupied with political complications to be able to be active in that sphere. Ecclesiastical conditions suffered, therefore, only temporary, not permanent disturbance, and sustained no material hurt. Rather, the persecutions contributed largely to temper the inner strength of the African church. When the Vandals occupied Africa, they were undoubtedly still in the same primitive stage of civilization in which they had lived in their homes in Hungary. Their political position as conquerors, the settlement in an enclosed district, the sharp religious opposition, must certainly have hindered a rapid acceptance of the Roman influence. But under Gelimer, they quite adopted the luxurious mode of life of the Romans, i.e. of the rich nobility. They lived in magnificent palaces, wore fine clothes, visited theaters, gave themselves up to the pleasures of an excellent table, and did homage with great passion to Aphrodite. Roman literary culture had just made its appearance in the royal court and among the nobility. Gesseric was himself certainly, at least at first, not skilled in Latin, but one of his grandsons was famous for having distinguished himself in the acquisition of manifold knowledge. The same is said of Thrasimund, and we may assume it of Hilderic. Latin was the language of diplomatic intercourse and legislation, as it was in the other German kingdoms. The Vandal language was quite supplanted, and only remained in use in popular intercourse and in the church service. So, in the last years of the Vandal dominion, Roman literature in Africa produced a tiny harvest. The poet Dracontius is to be remembered in this connection, and the poets preserved in the anthology of the Codex Salmasianus and Bishop Fulgentius of Ruspe. The art of architecture found in Thrasimund an eager patron. Mention is made of splendid buildings which were raised under this king. There is certainly no authentic trace extant of any artistic capacity among the Vandals themselves. End of section 39. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 40 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 40. Chapter 12a, The Asiatic Background, by T. Peisker, Part 1. The Asiatic background has its basis in the immense zone of steppes and deserts which stretches from the Caspian Sea to the Kingan Mountains, and is divided into two regions by the Pamir and the Tian Shan ranges. The western region, like the whole lowland district of West Asia, even to the extreme north, is a deserted seabed. The eastern, Tarim Basin and Gobi, seems formerly to have been covered with great freshwater lakes. The water basins began to evaporate and to shrink to inland seas, while the intervening country became a desert. The largest remains of former enormous water basins are the Salt Caspian Sea and the Sweetwater Aral Sea. In both regions, all the moisture that falls evaporates, so that no rivers reach the open sea. Most of them ooze away in the sand, and only the greatest, such as the Sir, Amu, Ili, Chu, Tarim, flow into large inland seas. The fact that the evaporation is greater than the fall of moisture, and that the latter takes place chiefly in the cold season, has important consequences which account for the desert nature of the land. All the salt which is released by the weathering and decomposition of the soil remains in the ground, and only in the higher regions, with greater falls of moisture, and by the banks of rivers, is the soil sufficiently lixiviated to be fit for cultivation. Everywhere else is steppe and desert absolutely uncultivable. The surface of the land can be divided into six categories, sand deserts, gravel deserts, salt steppes, loam steppes, less land, and rocky mountains. Of these, the sand deserts form by far the greatest part. They consist of fine drift sand, which the driving storm wind forms into sickle-shaped shifting dunes, barkans. The loose drift sand is waterless, and for the most part without vegetation. The barkans, however, here and there, display a few poor saxol and other shrubs. Human life is impossible. 
the gravel deserts, also very extensive, which form the transition between the sand deserts and the steppes, and serve the nomads as grazing grounds in their wanderings to and from winter quarters and summer pastures. The adjoining salt steppes, consisting of loam and sand, are so impregnated with salt that the latter settles down on the surface like rime. In spring, they bear a scanty vegetation, which, on account of its saline nature, affords excellent pasture for numerous flocks of sheep. During the rain of autumn and spring, the loam steppes, consisting of less soil mixed with much sand, are covered with luxuriant verdure and myriads of wildflowers, especially tulips, and, on the drier ground, with camel thorn, alhagi camelorum, without which the camel could not exist for any length of time. These steppes form the real pastures of the nomads. In the less land, agriculture and gardening are only possible where the soil has been sufficiently softened by rainfall and artificial canals and is constantly irrigated. It forms the subsoil of all cultivable oases. Without irrigation, the soil becomes in summer as hard as concrete and its vegetation dies completely. The oases comprise only 2% of the total area of Turkestan. As a rule, the Rocky Mountains are quite bare. They consist of black, gleaming stone cracked by frost and heat and are waterless. Roughly speaking, these differences of vegetation follow one another from south to north, that is, the salt, the sand, and the grass steppes. A little below 50 degrees north latitude, the landscape of West Asia changes in consequence of a greater fall of moisture. The undrained lakes become less frequent. The rivers reach the sea, Ishim, Tobal, etc., and trees appear. Here begins, as a transition to the compact forest land, the tree steppe on the very fertile black earth. On the Yenise are park-like districts with splendid grass plains and luxuriant trees. Northward come endless pine forests, and beyond them, towards the Arctic Sea, is the moss steppe or tundra. The climate is typically continental, with icy cold winters, hot summers, cold nights, and hot days, with enormous fluctuations of temperature. The warmth increases quickly from winter to spring and decreases just as quickly from summer to autumn. In West Turkestan, the summer is almost cloudless and rainless and at this time the steppes become deserts. On account of the dryness, little snow falls. As a rule, it remains loose and is whirled aloft by the northeast storm wind, buran. These storm burans are just as terrible as the summer storms of salt dust in Transcaspia at a temperature of 104 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Considering that in summer the temperature sometimes reaches 118 degrees in the shade, exceeding body heat by 20 degrees, and that in the winter it seeks below minus 31 degrees, and further that the heat, especially in the sand deserts, reaches a degree at which the white of egg coagulates, the climate, even if not deadly, should be very injurious to man. Hindustan, which is far less hot, enervates the European on account of the greater moisture, and has changed the Aryan, once so energetic, to the weak and cowardly Hindu. Nevertheless, the contrary is the case. The climate of Turkestan is wholesome, and its people are long-lived and healthy, and that especially in the hot summer, on account of the unparalleled dryness of the air. Once acclimatized, one bears the heat very well, and likewise the extreme cold of winter. The climate of Central Asia furthers a rapid bodily and mental development and premature aging, as well as corpulence, especially among the Altaians. Obesity is even regarded as a distinction, and it became so native to the mounted nomads that it accompanied them to Europe. It is characteristic of all the nomads who have invaded Europe, and Hippocrates mentions it expressly as a characteristic of the Scythians. The climate of Turkestan also influences the character, leading to an apathy which creates indifference to the heaviest blows of fate and even accompanies the condemned to the scaffold. The entire West Asiatic region, from the salt steppes to the compact forest land, forms one economic whole. The well-watered northern part, which remains green throughout the summer, feeds countless herds in the warm season, but affords no pasturage in winter owing to the deep snow. On the other hand, the southern part, which is poor in water, 
the grass, sand, and salt steppes, is uninhabitable in summer. Thus, the northern part provides summer pastures, the southern, the Aral Caspian Basin, winter pastures to one and the same nomad people. The nomad, then, is the son and product of the peculiar and variable constitution, which nevertheless is an indivisible economic whole of the Asiatic background. Any agriculture worthy of the name is impossible in the steppes and deserts, the few oases excepted, on account of the dryness of the summer, when animals also find no food. Life on the steppes and deserts is only possible in connection either with the Siberian grass region or with the mountains. This life is necessarily extremely hard and restless for man and beast, and it creates a condition of nomadism, which must at the same time be a mounted nomadism, seeing that a wagon would be an impossibility in the long trackless wanderings over mountain and valley, river and swamp, and that goods and chattels, together with the disjoinable dwellings, can only be carried on the backs of beasts of burden. Setting aside the glacial period and the small Bruckner cycle of 35 years or so, the climactic changes of Central Asia, according to Huntington, fall into cycles of several hundred years' duration, within which the aridity rises and sinks considerably. Quote, all Central Asia has undergone a series of climactic pulsations during historic times. There seems to be strong evidence that at the time of Christ, or earlier, the climate was much moister and more propitious than it now is. Then, during the first few centuries of the Christian era, there appears to have been an epoch of increasing aridity. It culminated about A.D. 500, at which time the climate appears to have been drier than at present. Next came an epoch of more propitious climate, which reached its acme about A.D. 900. There is a little evidence of a second epoch of aridity, which was especially marked in the 12th century. Finally, in the later Middle Ages, a rise in the level of the Caspian Sea and the condition of certain ruins render it probable that climatic conditions once again became somewhat favorable, only to give place ere long to the present aridity. End of quote. But Central Asia has not been, since the beginning of historic records, in a state of desiccation. The process of geological desiccation was already ended in prehistoric times, and even the oldest historic accounts testify to the same climactic conditions as those of today. The earliest Babylonian kings maintained irrigation works, and Hammurabi, 23rd century BC, had canals made through the land, one of which bore his name. Thus, at present, without artificial irrigation, agriculture was not possible there 4,200 years ago. Palestine's climate, too, has not changed in the least since biblical times. Its present waste condition is the result of Turkish mismanagement, and Biot has proved from the cultivated plants grown in the earliest times that the temperature of China has remained the same for 3,300 years. Curtius Rufus and Ariane give similar accounts of Bactria. Amid the enormous wastes, there are countless sand-buried ruins of populous cities, monasteries, and villages, and choked-up canals standing on ground won from the waste by systematic canalization. Where the system of irrigation was destroyed, the earlier natural state, the desert, returned. The causes of such destruction are manifold. 1. Earthquake. 2. Violent rain spouts, after which the river does not find its former bed, and the canals receive no more water from it. 3. On the highest edge of the steppe, at the foot of the glacier, lie enormous flat heaps of debris, and here the canalization begins. If one side of this heap rises higher than the other, the direction of the current is shifted, and the oases nurtured by the now forsaken stream become derelict. But the habitable ground simply migrates with the river. If, for example, a river altered its course four times in historic times, three series of ruins remain behind. But it is erroneous simply to add these ruins together, and to conclude from them that the whole once formed a flourishing land which has become waste, when in reality the three series of settlements did not flourish side by side, but consecutively. This fallacy vitiates all accounts which assume a progressive or periodic desiccation as the chief cause of the abandonment of oases. 4. Continuous drought, in consequence of which the rivers become so waterless, 
that they cannot feed the canals of the lower river basin, and thus the oases affected must become parched and are not always resettled in more favorable years. 5. Neglect of the extreme care demanded in the administration of the canal system. If irrigation is extended in the district next to the mountain from which the water comes, just so much water is taken from the lower oases. But in this case, too, nothing is lost which cannot be replaced in another direction. Vice versa, if an oasis on the upper course of the river disappears through losing its canal system, the lower river course thus becomes well watered and makes possible the formation of a new oasis. 6. The most terrible mischief is the work of enemies. In order to make the whole oasis liable to tribute, they need only seize the main canal, and the nomads often blindly plundered and destroyed everything. A single raid was enough to transform hundreds of oases into ashes and desert. The nomads, moreover, not only ruined countless cities and villages of Central Asia, but they also denuded the steppe itself and promoted drift sand by senseless uprooting of trees and bushes for the sake of firewood. But for them, according to Berg, there would be little drift sand in Central Asia, for in his opinion, all sand formations must in time become firm. All the sand deserts which he observed on the Aral Sea and in Semiraichensk were originally firm, and even now most of them are still kept firm by the vegetation. With the very dangers of irrigation systems, it is impossible to decide, in the case of each group of ruins, what causes have produced them. It is therefore doubtful whether we can place in the foreground the secular changes of climate. It is not even true that the cultivation of the oases throve better in the damper and cooler periods than in the arid and hot ones. Thus, the oases of Turfan in Chinese Turkestan, which is so extremely arid and so unendurably hot in summer, are exceptionally fertile. We may therefore conclude that the cultivation of the oases was considerably more extended in the damper and cooler periods, but considerably less productive than in the arid and hot ones of today. Changes in the volume of water of single rivers and lakes are clearly apparent within short periods, and these lead to frequent local migrations of the peasant population and to new construction as well as to the abandonment of irrigation canals. Thus there is here a continual local fluctuation in the settlements, but history knows nothing of regular migrations of agriculturists. Still less is an unfavorable climactic change the cause of the nomad invasions of Europe. The nomad does not remain at all during the summer, in the parched steppe and desert, and in the periods of increasing aridity and summer heat, South Siberia was warmer and the mountain glaciers retreated and hence the pastures in both these directions were extended. The only consequence of this was that the distance between summer and winter pastures increased, and the nomad had to wander further and quicker. The computation is correct in itself that the number of animals that can be reared to the square mile depends on and varies with the annual rainfall. But the nomad is not hampered by square miles. The poorer or richer the growth of grass, the shorter or longer time he remains, and he is accustomed from year to year to fluctuations in the abundance of his flocks. Moreover, a shifting of the winter pastures is not impossible, for their autumn and spring vegetation is not destroyed by a progressive aridity, and if the water current changes its bed, the nomad simply follows it. Further, the effect of a secular progressive aridity is spread over so many generations that it is not catastrophic for any one of them. The nomad invasions of China and Europe must therefore have had other causes, and we know something about the invasions of several nomad hordes, of the Avars, Turks, Osmans, and Cumans, for example. Since the second half of the 5th century AD, that is, the time to which Huntington assigns the greatest aridity, there had existed in the Oxus Basin the powerful empire of the Ephthalite Horde, on the ruins of which the Empire of the West Turks was founded in the middle of the 6th century. Had Central Asia been at that time so arid and therefore poor in pasture, the then victorious horde would have driven out the other hordes in order to secure for themselves more pasture land. Yet, exactly the opposite took place. The Turks enslaved the other hordes, and when the Avars fled to Europe, the Turkish Kagan claimed them back at the Byzantine court. In like manner, the Turks, Osmans, 
fled from the sword of the Mongols in 1225 from Khorasan to Armenia, and in 1235 the Cumans fled to Hungary. The violence of the Mongols is strikingly described by Gibbon. Quote, from the Caspian to the Indus they ruined a tract of many hundred miles, which was adorned with the habitations and labors of mankind, and five centuries have not been sufficient to repair the ravages of four years. End of quote. Therefore, the main cause of the nomad invasions of Europe is not increasing aridity, but political changes. There remains the question, how did the nomads originate? On the theory of a progressive desiccation, it is assumed that the Aryan peasantry of Turkestan was compelled to take to a nomad life through the degeneration of their fields to steppes and wastes. But the peasant bound to the soil is incapable of a mode of life so unsettled and requiring of him much new experience. Robbed of his cornfields and reduced to beggary, could he be at the same time so rich as to procure himself the herds of cattle necessary to his existence? and so gifted with divination as suddenly to wander with them in search of pasture over immeasurable distances. A decrease of cultivable soil would bring about only a continual decrease in the number of inhabitants. The peasant, as such, disappeared, emigrated, or perished, and his home became a desert, and was occupied by another people who knew from experience how to make use of it in its changed state, that is, as winter grazing ground. This new people must have been already nomadic and have made their way from the pastures of the north, and therefore they must have belonged to the Altaian race. The Delta Oases have been the home of man from early prehistoric time, throughout Turkestan and northern Persia. The two oldest culture strata of Anau prove that the settlers of the first culture cultivated wheat and barley, had rectangular houses of air-dried bricks, but only wild animals at first, out of which were locally domesticated the long-horned ox, the pig, and horse, and successively two breeds of sheep. The second culture had the domestic ox, both long and short-horned, the pig and the horse. The domestic goat, camel, and dog appear, and a new hornless breed of sheep. The cultivation of cereals was discovered in Asia long before B.C. 8000. The domestication of cattle, pigs, and sheep, and probably of the horse, was accomplished at Anau between B.C. 8000 and 6800. Consequently, the agricultural stage preceded the nomadic shepherd stage in Asia. It follows, therefore, that before domestication of animals was accomplished, mankind in Central Asia was divided sharply into two classes, settled agriculturists on the one hand, and hunters who wandered within a limited range on the other hand. When the nomadic hunters became shepherds, they necessarily wandered between ever-widening limits, as the season and pasturage required for increasing herds. The establishment of the first domestic breeds of pigs, long-horned cattle, large sheep, and horses was followed by a deteriorating climate, which may have, as Pompelli, though questionably, assumes, changed these to smaller breeds. Dr. Durst identifies the second breed of sheep with the Turbary sheep, Torfschaf and the pig with the Turbary pig, Torfschwein, which appear as already domesticated in the Neolithic stations of Europe. They must therefore have been descendants of those domesticated on the oases of the Anal district. They make their appearance in European Neolithic stations apparently contemporaneously with an immigration of a people of a round-headed Asiatic type, which seems to have infiltrated gradually among the prevailing long-headed Europeans. The presumption is, therefore, that these animals were brought from Asia by this round-headed people, and that we have in this immigration perhaps the earliest post-glacial factor in the problem of Asiatic influence in European racial as well as cultural origins, for they brought with them both the art of cattle breeding and some knowledge of agriculture. The skulls of the first and second cultures in Inau are all dolichocephalic or mesocephalic, without a trace of the round-headed element. We are therefore justified in assuming that the domestication and the forming of the several breeds of domestic animals were effected by a long-headed people. And since the people of the two successive cultures were settled oasis agriculturists and breeders, we may assume as probable that agriculture and settled life in towns on the oases originated among people of a dolichocephalic type. 
since Dr. Durst identifies the second breed of sheep established during the first culture of Anau with the Turbary sheep in Europe, contemporaneously with skulls of the round-headed Galka type, it should follow that the domestic animals of the European Neolithic stations were brought thither, together with wheat and barley, by round-headed immigrants of an Asiatic type. Since the original agriculturists and breeders were long-headed, it seems probable that the immigrants were broad-headed nomads, who, having acquired from the Oasis people domestic animals and rudimentary agriculture of the kind still practiced by the shepherd nomads of Central Asia, infiltrated among the Neolithic settlements of Eastern and Central Europe and adopted the stone implement culture of the hunting and fishing peoples among whom they came. In this connection, it is not without significance that throughout the whole historical period, the combination of settled town life and agriculture has been the fundamental characteristic of the Aryan-speaking Galkas and of the Iranians inhabiting Western Central Asia and the Persian Plateau, while the peoples of pure Asiatic Mongoloid type have been essentially shepherd nomads, who, as already shown, could have become shepherds only after the settled agriculturists of the oases had established domesticated breeds of cattle. The origin of the taming of wild into domestic animals is one of the most difficult problems of economic history. What was its aim? The use that we could make of domestic animals? Certainly not, for adaptability thereto could only gradually be imparted to the animals, and could not be foreseen. It could not be anticipated that the cow and the goat would ever give more milk than their young needed, and that beyond the time of lactation. Nor could it be anticipated that sheep not woolly by nature would develop a fleece. Even for us, it would be too uneconomical to breed such a powerful animal and such a large consumer of fodder as the ox merely for a supply of meat. And besides, beef is not readily eaten in Central Asia. Moreover, the wild ox is entirely unsuitable for draft, for it is one of the shyest as well as strongest and most dangerous of animals. And it should be specially emphasized that a long step lies between taming individual animals and domesticating them, for as a rule, wild animals, however well tamed, do not breed in captivity. Consequently, the domestication was not produced simply by taming or for economic ends. It is the great service of Edward Hahn to have laid down the theory that the domestication, involuntary and unforeseen, was the result of forcing for religious purposes certain favorite animals of certain divinities into reservations where they remained reproductive and at the same time gradually lost their original wildness through peaceful contact with man. The beasts of sacrifice were taken from these enclosures. Thus originated the castrated ox which quietly let itself be yoked before the sacred car, and by systematic milking for sacrificial purposes, the milk secretion of the cow and the goat were gradually increased. Lastly, when man perceived what he had gained from the animals, he turned to his own use the peculiarities thus produced by enclosure and gradual domestication. In general, cattle rearing is unknown to the severest kind of nomadism. The ox soon dies of thirst, and it has not sufficient endurance or speed for the enormous wanderings. Its flesh has little value in the steppe. The animals actually employed for rearing and food are consequently the sheep, to a less extent the goat as leader of the sheep flocks, the horse, and here and there the ass. Also in smaller number, the two-humped camel, in Tehran the one-humped dromedary as well, as a beast of burden. Where the district admits of it, and long wanderings are not necessary, e.g. in Mongolia, in the Pamir, in the Amu Delta, in South Russia, etc., the Altaian has engaged in cattle breeding from the remotest times. A wealthy Mongolian possesses as many as 20,000 horses, and still more sheep. Rich Kyrgyz sometimes have hundreds of camels, thousands of horses, tens of thousands of sheep. The minimum for a Kyrgyz family of five is five oxen, 28 sheep, and 15 horses. Some have fewer sheep, but the number of horses cannot sink below 15, for a stud of mares with their foals is indispensable for the production of kumis. The Turkoman is poorest in horses. However, the Turkoman horse is the noblest in the whole of Central Asia, 
and surpasses all other breeds in speed, endurance, intelligence, faithfulness, and a marvelous sense of locality. It serves for riding and milk giving only, and is not a beast of burden, as are the camel, the dromedary, or the ox. The Turkoman horse is tall, with long, narrow body, long, thin legs and neck, and a small head. It is nothing but skin, bones, muscles, and sinews, and even with the best attention it does not fatten. The mane is represented by short, bristly hairs. On their predatory expeditions, the Turkomans often cover 650 miles in the waterless desert in five days, and that with their heavy booty of goods and men. Their horses attain their greatest speed when they have galloped from 7 to 14 miles, and races over such a distance as that from London to Bristol are not too much for them. Of course, they owe their powers to the training of thousands of years in the endless steppes and deserts, and to the continual plundering raids, which demanded the utmost endurance and privation of which horse and rider were capable. The least attractive to look at in Turkestan is the Kyrgyz horse, which is small, powerful, and strong-maned. During snowstorm or frost, it often does without food for a long time. It is never sheltered under a roof, and bears minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the open air, and the extremest summer heat, during which it can do without water, for from three to four days. It can easily cover 80 miles a day and never tastes barley or oats in its life. End of section 40. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 41 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Atean rides with a very short stirrup, and thus trotting would be too exhausting both for man and horse. So, as a rule, he goes at a walk or a gallop. Instead of the trot, there is another, more comfortable movement, in which the horse's center of gravity moves steadily forward in a horizontal line, and shaking and jolting is avoided. The horse advances the two left feet, one after the other, and then the two right feet, keeping the time of four threshers. In this way, it can cover ten miles per hour. The most prized horses are the amblers which always move the two feet on one side simultaneously and are sometimes so swift that other horses can scarcely keep up with them at a gallop. Spurs are unknown to the Altaian, and in the steppe horseshoes are not needed. The nomad spends the greater part of his life in the saddle. When he is not lying inactive in the tent, he is invariably on horseback. At the markets, everybody is mounted. In the saddle, all bargains are struck, Meetings are held, kumis is drunk, and even sleep is taken. The seller, too, has his wares, felt, furs, carpets, sheep, goats, calves, before, behind, and beneath him on his horse. The riding horse must answer promptly to the bridle, and must not betray his master by neighing during a raid. Therefore, the young stallion, for mares are not ridden, is taken from the herd with a lasso and castrated. The nomads of the Asiatic background all belong to the Altaian branch of the Euro-Altaian race. The Altaian primitive type displays the following characteristics. Body compact, strong-boned, small to medium-sized, trunk long, hands and feet often exceptionally small, feet thin and short, and in consequence of the peculiar method of riding with short stirrup, bent outwards, whence the gait is very waddling, calves very little developed, head large and brachycephalic, face broad, cheekbones prominent, mouth large and broad, jaw mesognathic, teeth strong and snow white, chin broad, nose broad and flat, forehead low and little arched, ears large, eyes considerably wide apart, deep sunken, and dark brown to piercing black, eye opening narrow and slit obliquely, with an almost perpendicular fold of skin over the inner corner, Mongol fold, and with elevated outer corner, skin wheat color, light buff, Mongols, to bronze color, Turks, 
hair coarse, stiff as a horse's mane, coal black, beard scanty and bristly, often entirely wanting, generally only a mustache, bodily strength considerable, sensitiveness to climactic influences and wounds slight, sight and hearing incredibly keen, memory extraordinary. Six to ten blood-related tents, Mongolian yurta, on the average, families of five to six heads form a camp. Turkish al, Mongolian kotan, kotun, Romanian katun, which wanders together. Even the best grazing ground would not admit of a greater number together. The leader of the camp is the eldest member of that family which possesses most animals. Several camps make a clan, Turkish tire, Mongolian aymak. Hence, there are the general interests of the clan, and also the individual interests of the camps, which latter frequently conflict. For the settlement of disputes, an authority is necessary, a personality who, through wealth, mental capacity, uprightness, bravery, and wide relationships, is able to protect the clan. As an election of a chief is unknown to nomads, and they could not agree if it were known, the chieftainship is usually gained by a violent usurpation and is seldom recognized generally. Thus, the judgment of the chieftain is mostly a decision to which the parties submit themselves more or less voluntarily. Several clans form a tribe, Yurik. Several tribes, a folk, Turkish, Il, Mongolian, Ulus. Conflicts within the tribes and the folks are settled by a union of the separate clan chieftains in an arbitration procedure in which each chieftain defends the claims of his clan, but very often the collective decision is obeyed by none of the parties. In times of unrest, great hordes have formed themselves out of the folks, and at the head of these stood a kagan or a khan. The hordes, like the folks and tribes, form a separate whole only in so far as they are opposed to other hordes, folks, and tribes. The horde protects its parts from the remaining hordes, just as does the folk and the tribe. Thus all three are, in a real sense, insurance societies for the protection of common interests. The organization based on genealogy is much dislocated by political occurrences, for in the steppe the peoples, like the drift sand, are in constant motion. One people displaces or breaks through another, and so we find the same tribal name among peoples widely separated from one another. Moreover, from the names of great war heroes arose tribal names for those often quite motley conglomerations of peoples who were united for a considerable time under the conqueror's lead and then remained together. For example, the Seljuks, Uzbeks, Chagatais, Osmans, and many others. This easy new formation, exchange, and loss of the tribal name has operated from the earliest times, and the numerous swarms of nomads who forced their way into Europe under the most various names are really only different offshoots of the same few nations. The organization of the nomads rests on a double principle, the greater unions caused by political circumstances having no direct connection with the life and needs of the people in the desert often cease soon after the death of their creator. On the other hand, the camps, the clans, and in part the tribes also, retain an organic life and take deep root in the life of the people. Not merely the consciousness of their blood relationship, but the knowledge of the degree of relationship is thoroughly alive, and every Kyrgyz boy knows his Jedi Atalar, that is, the names of his seven forefathers. What is outside this is regarded as the remoter relationship. Hence, a homogeneous political organization of large masses is unfrequent and transitory, and today, among the Turks, it is only the Kara Kyrgyz people of East Turkestan, who are rich in herds, that live under a central government, that of a hereditary Aga Menap, beneath whom the Menaps, also hereditary, of the separate tribes, with a council of the greybeards, oxacals, of the separate clans, rule and govern the people rather despotically. What among the Turks is the exception was from the earliest times known to history the rule among the Mongols, 
who were despotically governed by their princes. The Khan wielded unlimited authority over all. No one dared to settle in any place to which he had not been assigned. The Khan directed the princes, they the thousand men, the thousand men the hundred men, and they the ten men. Whatever was ordered them was promptly carried out. Even certain death was faced without a murmur. But towards foreigners they were just as barbarous as the Turks. The origin of despotism among the Altaians is to be traced to a subjugation by another nomad horde, which among the Turkish Kazakh Kyrgyz and the Mongol Kalmuks of the Volga developed into a nobility, white bones, the female sex white flesh, in contrast with the common people, black bones, black flesh. The transitoriness of the wider unions on the one hand, and the indestructibility of the clans and camps on the other, explain why extensive separations, especially among the Turco-Tartars, were of constant occurrence. The desert rears to independence and freedom from restraint small, patriarchally directed family alliances with greybeards, oxacals, from families of aristocratic strain at their head. These families boast of their direct descent from some sultan, beg, or famous batir, hero, recta, robber, or cattle thief, but the greybeards mostly exercise the mere shadow of dominion. The Turkomans say, we are a people without a head, and we won't have one either. Among us, each is padisha. As an appendage to this, Sahara is full of sheikhs. The wanderings of the nomads are incorrectly designated when they are called roaming wanderings, for not even the hunter roams. He has his definite hunting grounds and always returns to his accustomed places. Still more regular are the wanderings of the nomads, however far they extend. The longest are those of the Kyrgyz, who winter by the Aral Sea and have their summer pastures 10 degrees of latitude further north in the steppes of Troitsk and Omsk. The distance, allowing for the zigzag course, comes to more than 1,000 miles, so that each year the nomad must cover 2,000 miles with all his herds and other goods. During the winter, the nomad in the desert is, so to speak, a prisoner in his tent, practical, neat, and comfortable as this is. It is rotunda 15 feet high and often over 30 feet broad. Its framework consists of a wooden lattice in six to ten separable divisions, which can be widened out or pushed together for packing. Above this comes the roof frame of light rafters, which come together in a ring above. This is the opening for air, light, and smoke, and is only covered at night and during severe cold. Inside, a matting of steppe grass runs round the framework, and outside is a felt covering, bound round with ropes of camel's hair. Tent pegs and ropes protect the tent from being overturned by the violent northeast orcon, during which the hearth fire must be put out. As the felt absorbs and emits very little heat, the tent is warm in winter and cool in summer. Inside the tent, the sacks of victuals hang on the points of the wall lattice. On the rafters above are the weapons, harness, saddles, and, among the heathen tribes, the idols. Behind the hearth, the seat of honor for guests and old men is spread with the best felt and carpets. In front of the hearth is the place for drinking vessels, and sometimes for fuel, the latter consisting of camel and cattle dung, since firewood is found only in a few places in the steppes and deserts. The nomad life admits of only the most necessary and least breakable utensils. For preparing food for all in the tent, there is a large cast-iron cauldron, acquired in Chinese or Russian traffic, with tripod and tongs, a trunk-like kumis vat of four smoked horse hides thickened with fat, kumis bottles and water bottles of leather, wooden chests, tubs, and cans hollowed out of pieces of wood or gourds wooden dishes, drinking bowls, and spoons. Among the slave-hunting Turkomans, short and long chains, manacles, fetters, and iron collars also hung in the tent to the right of the entrance. The accommodation provided by the tent and the economizing of space is astonishing. From long past times, everything has had its assigned place. There is room for 40 men by day and 20 by night, notwithstanding the many objects hanging and lying about. 
the master of the household with the men, occupies the place of honor. Left and right of the hearth are the sleeping places, felt, which is rolled up in the daytime. Left of the entrance, the wife and the women and children. To the right, the male slaves do their work. For anyone to leave his wanted place unnecessarily, or without the order of the master, would be an unheard of proceeding. In three quarters of an hour, a large tent can be put up and furnished, and it can be taken to pieces and packed just as quickly. Even with movables and stores, it is so light that two camels suffice to carry it. The Nogai Tartars carry their basket-like felt tents, which are only eight to ten feet in diameter, on two-wheeled carts drawn at a trot by small-sized oxen. In the 13th century, under Chinggis and his followers, the Mongols also made use of such cart tents drawn by one camel as storeholders, but only in the Volga district and not in their own country in Mongolia. They also put their great tents, as much as 30 feet in diameter, on carts drawn by 24 oxen, 12 in a line. The nature of the ground admitted of this procedure, and consequently the tent had not to be taken to pieces at each stopping place, as must be done in the steppes and deserts, but only where a considerable halt was made. In South Russia, such wagon tents date from the oldest times, and were already in use among the Scythians. Among a continually wandering pastoral people, the interests of neighbors often collide, as we know from the Bible story of Abraham and Lot. Thus, a definite partition of the land comes about. A folk, or a section of a folk, a tribe, regards a certain stretch of land as its special property, and tolerates no trespass from any neighbor whatsoever. The tribe, again, consists of clans and the latter of camps, which in their turn regard parts of the whole tribal district as their own. This produces a very confused medley of districts, over which the individual camps wander. In spring and autumn, the nomad can find abundant fodder almost everywhere, in consequence of the greater moisture and luxuriant grass crop. The winter and summer abodes demand definite conditions for the prosperity of the herds. The winter settlement must not have too severe a climate. The summer grazing ground must be as exempt as possible from the terrific plague of insects. Since many more conditions must be satisfied for the winter than for the summer pastures, it is the winter quarters which determine the density of the nomad population. Thus, the wealth of a people accords with the abundance of their winter quarters, and all internal encounters and campaigns of former centuries are to be regarded as a constant struggle for the best winter settlements. In winter, whenever possible, the same places as have been used for long times past are occupied, in the deep-lying valley of a once existing river, not overexposed to the wind, with good water, and grazing places where the snow settles as little as possible, and the last year's dung makes the ground warmer and at the same time provides fuel. Here, at the end of October, the tent, made warmer by another covering, is pitched, protecting the nomad from the raging winter baran and the numbing cold. The herds, however, remain in the open air without a sheltering roof and must scrape for themselves the withered shrubs, stalks, and roots from the snow. They get terribly thin. Indeed, sheep, camels, and oxen perish when the snow falls deep, and the horses, in scraping for fodder, trample down the plants and make them uneatable or when ice forms and shuts out sustenance entirely. But in early spring, the situation improves, especially for the sheep, which, from mere skeletons, revive and get fat on the salt steps, where a cursory inspection reveals no vegetation on the glittering crust of salt. The salt pastures are incomparably more nourishing than the richest alpine meadows, and without salt there would be no sheep-rearing nomads in Central Asia. To freshen the spring pasturage, the steppe is burnt off as soon as the snow is melted, as the dry last year's steppe grass gets matted under the snow and would retard the sprouting of the new grass. The ground, manured by the ashes, then gets luxuriantly green after a few days. In the middle or at the end of April, during the lambing of the sheep and the foaling of the mares, preparations for striking the winter tent are made. At this time, the animals yield most milk, and a stock of hard cheese, kurut, is made. 
At the beginning of May, the steppe begins to dry up and the intolerable insects appear. Now the goods which are superfluous for the summer are secretly buried. The tent is struck and loaded with all necessary goods and chattels on the decorated camels. It is the day of greatest rejoicing for the nomad, who leaves his inhospitable winter quarters in festal attire. The winter quarters are regarded as the fixed property of the individual tent owners, but the summer pastures are the common property of the clan. Here, each member of the clan, rich or poor, has, in theory, the right to settle where he likes. But the wealthy and illustrious always know how to secure the best places. To effect this, each camp keeps the time of departure to the summer pastures and the direction to be taken as secret as possible. At the same time, it makes an arrangement with the nearest related camps in conformity with which they suddenly depart in order to reach their goal as quickly as possible. If the place chosen is already occupied, the next which is still free is taken. At the beginning of spring, when the grass is still scanty, the camps can remain only a very short time, often one day or even only half a day in one place. Later on, in their more distant wandering from well to well, they can stay for weeks in the same place. At midsummer, movement is more rapid, and in autumn, with an increasing abundance of water, it is again slower. In the sand desert, the nomad finds the wells covered by drift sand, and he must dig down to them afresh, if necessary, daily. The regulation of these wanderings is undertaken by the axicals, not always according to justice. The cattle can easily be taken off by a hostile neighbor, for the steppe is free and open. Therefore, the nomads of the steppes, unlike the nomads of the mountains, do not split themselves into single families. They constantly need a small war band to recover the stolen booty from the enemy. On the other hand, the instinct of self-preservation often drives a whole people to violate their neighbor's rights of property. When there is dearth of fodder, the cattle are ruined, and the enterprise and energy of the owner cannot avert calamity. The impoverished nomad infallibly goes to the wall as a solitary individual, and only seldom is he, as a former wanderer, Chorva, capable of becoming a despised settler, Chamru, for he feels it to be the greatest misfortune and humiliation when he must take to the plow somewhere by a watercourse on the edge of the desert, and so long as the loss of all his herds has not hopelessly crushed him, he does not resign himself to that terrible fate which Mohammed has prescribed with the words, wherever this implement has penetrated, it has always brought with it servitude and shame. In spring, when severe frost suddenly sets in after the first thaw, and the thin layer of snow is covered in a single night with a crust of ice an inch thick, the cattle cannot scrape food out of the snow, and the owner cannot possibly supply a substitute. When the frost continues, hundreds of thousands of beasts perish, and whole districts previously rich in herds become suddenly poor. So as soon as ice appears, the people affected leave their winter quarters and penetrate far into their neighbor's territory until they find food for their herds. If they are successful, a part at least of their cattle is saved, and when the weather changes, they return home. But if all their cattle perish entirely, they must starve if they are unwilling to rob their wealthy neighbor of a part of his herds. Bloody feuds occur, too, in autumn, on the return from the summer pastures, when the horses have become fat and powerful, and the longer nights favor and cover long rides. The nomad now carries out the raids of robbery and revenge resolved upon and skillfully planned in the summer, and then he goes to his winter quarters. But how can these barbarous robbers live together without exterminating each other? They are bridled by an old and tyrannical king, invisible to themselves, the deb, custom, want. This prohibits robbery and murder, immorality and injustice towards associates in times of peace. But the strange neighbor is outlawed. To rob, enslave, or kill him is a heroic deed. The nomad's ideas of justice are remarkably similar to those of our ancestors. Every offense is regarded as an injury to the interests of a fellow man and is expiated by indemnification of the loser. Among the Kazakh Kyrgyz, anyone who has killed a man of the plebs, a black bone, whether willfully or accidentally makes no difference, 
must compensate the relations with a coon, i.e. 1,000 sheep or 100 horses or 50 camels. The slaughter of a white bone costs a sevenfold coon. Murder of their own wives, children, and slaves goes unpunished, since they themselves are the losers. If a Kyrgyz steals an animal, he must restore it together with two of the same value. If a wrongdoer is unable to pay the fine, his nearest relations, and failing them, the whole camp, must provide it. The principal food consists of milk products, not of the fresh milk itself, which is only taken by children and the sick. A special Turco-Tartar food is yogurt, prepared with leaven from curdled milk. The Mongols also eat butter, the more rancid, the more palatable, dripping with dirt and carried without wrapping in their hairy, greasy coat pockets. From mare's milk, which yields no cream, kumis, Kyrgyz, chigan, Mongolish, is fermented, an extremely nutritious drink which is good for consumption and from which, by itself, life can be sustained. However, it keeps only a few hours, after which it becomes too sour and effervescent, and so the whole supply must be drunk at once. In summer, with an abundance of mares, there is such a superfluity of kumis that hospitality is unlimited, and half Altai is always drunk. The Turkomans and Karakalpaks, who possess few horses and no studs, drink kumis seldom. The much-drunk Iran, from fermented unskimmed camel, cow, and sheep milk, quenches thirst for hours, just as does the kefir of the Tartars from cow's milk. The Iran, after being condensed by boiling, and dried hard as stone into little balls in the sun, is made into curt, kurat, which can be kept for months, and is the only means of making bitter salt water drinkable. According to Marco Polo, it formed the provision of the Mongol armies, and if the horseman could not quench his thirst in any other way, he opened one of his horse's veins and drank the blood. From Kumis, and also from Millet, a strong spirit, Kyrgyz Boza, is distilled which produces dead drunkenness followed by a pleasant nirvana sensation. A comparison of Rubiquis' account with that of Radloff shows that the dairying among the Altaians has remained the same from the earliest times. A late acquisition from China, and only available for the wealthier, is the brick tea, which is also a currency and a substitute for money. Little meat is eaten, notwithstanding the abundance of the herds, it is only customary on festive occasions or as a consequence of a visit of special honor. In order not to lessen the stock of cattle, the people content themselves with the cattle that are sick beyond recovery, or dead and even decaying. The meat is eaten boiled and the broth drunk afterwards. Only the Volga Kalmuks and the Karakiryis, who are very rich in flocks, live principally on sheep and horse meat. That the Huns and Tartars ate raw meat softened by being carried under the saddle is a mistake of the chroniclers. At the present time, the mounted nomads are accustomed to put thin strips of salted raw meat on their horses' sores before saddling them to bring about a speedy healing. But this meat, impregnated with the sweat of the horse and reeking intolerably, is absolutely uneatable. From the earliest times, on account of the enormous abundance of game, Hunting has been eagerly practiced for the sake of food and skins, or as sport, either with trap and snare, or on horseback with falcon and eagle. From Persia came the long-haired greyhound in addition. Fishing cannot be pursued by long-wandering nomads, and they make no use even of the best-stocked rivers. But by the lakes and the rivers which do not dry up, fishing is an important source of food among short-wandering nomads. For grain, the seeds of wild-growing cereals are gathered. Here and there, millet is grown without difficulty, even on poor soil. A bag of millet meal suffices the horseman for days. A handful of it with a drink of water appeases him well enough. Thus, bread is a luxury for the nomad herdsman, and the necessary grain can only be procured in barter for the products of cattle-rearing and house industry. But the Kyrgyz of Fergana, in their short but high wanderings on the Pamir and Alai, high above the last agricultural settlements, which only extend to 4,600 feet, carry on an extensive agriculture, summer wheat, millet, barley, 
by means of slaves and laborers at a height of 8,500 feet, while they themselves climb with their herds to a height of 15,800 feet, and partly winter in the valleys, which are free from snow in winter. The nomads eat vegetables seldom, as only carrots and onions grow in the steppes. The half-settled agricultural half-nomads of today can be left out of consideration. According to Plano Carpini, the Mongols had neither bread nor vegetables, nor leguminous food, nor anything else except meat, of which they ate so little that other people could scarcely have lived on it. However, in summer they consumed an enormous quantity of milk, and that failing in winter, one or two bowls of thin millet boiled in water in the morning, and nothing more except a little meat in the evening. We see that from the earliest times the Altaian nomad has lived by animal rearing, and in a subsidiary degree by hunting and fishing, and here and there by a very scanty agriculture. As among some hordes, especially the old Magyars, fishing and hunting are made much of, Many believe that they were originally a hunting and fishing folk and took to cattle rearing later. This is an impossibility. The Magyars, just as were the others, were pure nomads even during winter. Otherwise, their herds would have perished. Hunting and fishing they pursued only as stopgaps when milk failed. A fishing and hunting people cannot so easily become mounted nomads and least of all, organized in such a terribly warlike way as were the Magyars. The innate veracity of the Turco-Tartars is a consequence of the climate. The Bedouin, in the latitude of 20 to 32 degrees, at a mean temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, can easily be more abstinent and moderate with a single meal a day, meat, dates, truffles, than the Altaian in the freezing cold between the latitudes of 38 and 58 degrees, with his three copious meals. The variable climate and its consequences, hunger in winter, superfluity in summer, have so hardened the Altaian that he can, without difficulty, hold out for days without water, and for weeks, in a known case, 42 days, in a snowstorm without any food. But he can also consume a six-months-old weather at one sitting, and is ready to repeat the dose straight off. Originally, the Altaian clothed himself in skins, leather, and felt, and not till later in vegetable stuffs acquired by barter, tribute, or plunder. Today, the outer coat of the Kazakh Kyrgyz is still made of the shining skin of a foal, with the tail left on for ornament. The Tsaiden Mongols wear next to their bare skin a felt gown, with the addition of a skin in winter only and leather breeches. All Central Asiatics wear the high spherical sheepskin cap, also used as a pillow. The chapan, similar to a dressing gown and consisting of fur or felt in winter, leather boots or felt stockings bound round with rags. Among many tribes, the hair of the men is worn long or shaved off entirely. Herodotus tells of a snub-nosed, shaven-headed people in the lower Ural and the Magyars, Kumans, and others were shorn bare, but for two pigtails. End of section 41. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 42 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon The wife occupies a very dependent position. On her shoulders falls the entire work of the household, the very manifold needs of which are to be satisfied almost entirely by home industry. She must take down the tent, pack it up, load it on camels, and pitch it. She must prepare leather, felt, leather bottles, cords, waterproof material, and colors from various plants. She must spin and weave wool and hair. She must make clothes, collect camel and cattle dung, knead it with dust into tough paste, and form and dry it into cakes. She must saddle and bridle horses and camels, milk the sheep, prepare kumis, kurut, and eran, and graze the herds of sheep in the night for the husband does this only by day, and in addition only milks the mares. 
his remaining occupation is almost entirely war and plundering. To share the domestic work would be for an Altaian paterfamilias an unheard of humiliation. Originally, the choice of a wife was as unrestricted among all the Altaians as among the Mongols, who, according to Plano Carpini and Marco Polo, might marry any relative and non-relative except their own mothers and daughters and sisters by their own mothers. But today, several nomad peoples are strictly exogamic. The bride was chosen by the father when still in her childhood. Her price, Kalim, was 27 to 100 mares, and her dowry had roughly the same value. Polygamy was consequently only possible among tribes rich in herds, but it was a necessity, as one wife alone could not accomplish the many duties. Virgin purity and conjugal fidelity are, among the Turco-Tartars, and especially among the Kyrgyz, somewhat rare virtues. On the other hand, Marco Polo agrees with Radloff, in praising the absolute fidelity of the Mongol women. The upbringing of the children entails the extreme of hardening. During its first six weeks, the newborn child is bathed daily, summer and winter alike, in the open air. Thenceforward, the nomad never washes his whole life long. The Kalmuk, in particular, is absolutely shy of water. Almost to puberty, the children go naked summer and winter. Only on the march do they wear a light kalat and fur cap. They are suckled at the breast to their fifth year. At three or four, they already sit free with their mother on horseback, and a six-year-old girl rides like a sportsman. The education of the boys is limited to riding, at the most falconry in addition. On the other hand, the girls are put to most exhausting work from their tenderest years, and the value of a bride is decided by the work she can discharge. Among nearly all Altaian peoples, the son thinks little of his mother, but towards his father he is submissive. Hereditary right is purely agnatic. As soon as the married son is able to look after himself, he is no longer under the authority of his father, and if he likes, he can demand as inheritance a part of the herds adequate to establishing a separate household. Then, however, he is entirely settled with, and he cannot inherit further on the death of his father when they are younger sons, his brothers still unportioned. If impoverished, the father has the right to take back from his apportioned sons every fifth animal from the herds, Kalmuks. The daughters are never entitled to inherit, and on marrying receive merely a suitable dowry from their brothers, who then receive the Kalim. If only daughters survive, the inheritance goes to the father's brothers or cousins, who in that case receive the Kalim as well. Speedy as the Altaian is on horseback, on foot he is helpless and unwieldy, and so the dance is unknown to him. All games full of dash and excitement are played on horseback. His hospitality is marvelous. For weeks at a time he treats the new arrival to the best he has, even when it is the despised and hated Shiitish Persian. He possesses many sagas and songs, mostly in the minor key and monotonous as the steps, which are accompanied on a two-string guitar. Tenor and mezzo-soprano predominate, and the gait of the horse and the stride of the camel mark the rhythm. The surplus of the female house industry and of the herds is, as a rule, exchanged in barter for weapons and armors, metal and wooden articles, clothing material, brick tea, and grain. Instead of our gold and silver coinage, they have, sit venia verbo, a sheep coinage in which all valuations are made. Of course, they were acquainted with foreign coins from the earliest times and obtained countless millions of pounds from tribute, plunder, and ransom of prisoners, and they used coins now and then in external trading. But among themselves, they still barter and conclude all their business in sheep, cattle, horses, and camels. Rubruqui says of the Mongols in 1253, we found nothing purchasable for gold and silver, only for fabrics, of which we had none. When our servant showed them a hyperpyron, Byzantine gold coin, they rubbed it with their fingers and smelt it to see if it were copper. They have no hand workers except a few smiths. The Altaian, and especially the Turco-Tartar barbarian, considered only the advantage of the moment. The unlimited plundering was hostile to any transit trade. 
But when and so long as a strong hand controlled the universal plundering spirit, a caravan trade between north and south, and especially between east and west, was possible, and with high duties formed a considerable source of income for the central Asiatic despots. The religious conceptions of a group of primitive people inhabiting such an enormous district were of course never uniform. Today, the greatest part of the Altaians is Buddhist or Islamitic, and only a few Siberian Turkish tribes remain true to the old Altaian shamanism. The characteristic feature of shamanism is the belief in the close union of the living with their long-dead ancestors. Thus, it is an uninterrupted ancestor worship. This faculty, however, is possessed only by a few families, those of the shamans, Mongolian shaman, Turkish Kham, who pass on their power from father to son, or sometimes daughter, with the visible symbol of the shaman drum, by means of which he can call up the spirits through the power of his ancestors, and compel them to active assistance, and can separate his own soul from his body, and send it into the kingdoms of light and darkness. He prepares the sacrifice, conjures up the spirits, leads prayers of petition and thanksgiving, and in short is doctor, soothsayer, and weather prophet. In consequence, he is held in high regard, but is less loved than feared, as his ceremonies are uncanny, and he himself dangerous if evil inclined. The chosen of his ancestors attains to his shaman power not by instruction, but by sudden inspiration. He falls into a frenzy, utters inarticulate cries, rolls his eyes, turns himself round in a circle as if possessed, until, covered with perspiration, he wallows on the ground in epileptic convulsions. His body becomes insensible to impressions. According to accounts, he swallows automatically, and without subsequent injury, red-hot iron, knives, and needles, and brings them up again dry. These passions get stronger and stronger till the individual seizes the shaman drum and begins shamaneering. Not before this does his nature compose itself. The power of his ancestors has passed into him, and he must thenceforth shamaneer. He is moreover dressed in a fantastic garb hung with rattling iron trinkets. The shaman drum is a wooden hoop with a skin painted with gay figures stretched over both sides, and all kinds of clattering bells and little sticks of iron upon it. In shamaneering, the drum is vigorously struck with one drumstick, and the ancestors thus invoked, interrogated about the cause of the evil which is to be banished, and the sacrifice which is to be made to the divinity in order to avert it. The beast of sacrifice is then slaughtered and eaten. The skin, together with all of the bones, is set aside as the sacrificial offering. Then follows the conjuration in chief, with the most frantic hocus-pocus, by means of which the shaman strives to penetrate with his soul into the highest possible region of heaven, in order to undertake an interrogation of the God of heaven himself. From the great confusion of local creeds, some shaman system as the following can be constructed, though the people themselves have only very vague conceptions of it. The universe consists of a number of layers, separated one from another by a certain something. The seventeen upper layers form the kingdom of light, seven or nine the underworld of darkness. In between lies the surface of man's earth, constantly influenced by both powers. The good divinities and spirits of heaven protect men, but the bad endeavor to destroy them. Originally there was only water, and neither earth nor heaven, nor sun nor moon. Then Tengiri Kaira Khan, the kind heaven, created first a being like himself, Kishi, man. Both soared in bliss over the water, but Kishi wished to exalt himself above the creator, and losing through his transgression the power to fly, fell headlong into the bottomless water. In his mercy, Kaira Khan caused a star to rise out of the flood, upon which the drowning Kishi could sit. But, as he could no longer fly, Kaira Khan caused him to dive deep down and bring up earth, which he strewed upon the surface of the water. But Kishi kept a piece of it in his mouth in order to create a special country out of it for himself. This swelled in his mouth and would have suffocated him had he not spat it out, 
so that morasses formed on Kaira Khan's hitherto smooth earth. In consequence, Kaira Khan named Kishi Erlik, banished him from the kingdom of light, and caused a nine-branched tree to grow out of the earth, and under each branch created a man as first father of each of the nine peoples of the present time. In vain, Erlich besought Kaira Khan to entrust to him the nine fair and good men, but he found out how to pervert them to evil. Angered thereat, Kaira Khan left foolish man to himself and condemned Erlich to the third layer of darkness. But for himself he created the seventeen layers of heaven and set up his dwelling in the highest. As the protector and teacher of the now deserted race of man, he left behind Maitara, the sublime. Erlich, too, with the permission of the Kaira Khan, built himself a heaven and peopled it with his own subjects, the bad spirits, men corrupted by him. And behold, they lived more comfortably than the sons of the earth created by Kaira Khan. And so Kaira Khan caused Erlich's heaven to be shattered into small pieces, which, falling on the earth, formed huge mountains and gorges. But Erlich was doomed until the end of the world to everlasting darkness. And now, from the seventeenth layer of heaven, Kaira Khan controls the destiny of the universe. By emanation from him, the three highest divinities came into being. Bai Ulgan, the great, in the sixteenth, Kaisigan Tengeri, the mighty, in the ninth, and Mergen Tengeri, the all-wise, in the seventh layer of heaven, where Mother Sun dwells also. In the sixth is enthroned Father Moon. In the fifth, Kudai Yayuchi, the highest creator. Ugan's two sons, Yayik and Maitara, the protecting patrons of mankind, dwell in the third, on the milk-white sea, Sut Akol, the source of all life. Near it is the mountain Suro, the dwelling of the seven Kudai, with their subjects, the Yayuchi, the guardian angels of mankind. Here is also the paradise of the blessed and righteous ancestors of living men, who mediate between the divinities of heaven and their own descendants and can help them in their need. The earth is personified in a community of spirits, Yersu, beneficent to man, the seventeen high khans, princes, of the seventeen spring districts, whose abodes lie on the seventeen snow peaks of the highest mountains by the sources of the seventeen streams which water the land. In the seven layers of the dark underworld, prevails the dismal light of the underworld sun peculiar to them. This is the dwelling of all the evil spirits who waylay men at every turn, misshapen goblins, witches, kormos, and others ruled by Erlik Khan, the dreadful prince on the black throne. Still deeper lies the horrible hell, Kasirgan, where the sinners and criminals of mankind suffer just punishment. All evil comes from Erlik cattle disease, poverty, illness, and death. Thus, there is no more important duty for man than to hold him steadfastly in honor, to call him Father Ehrlich, and to appease him with rich sacrifices. If a man is to be born, Ulgan, at the request of the former's ancestors, orders his son Yayik to give a Yayuchi charge of the birth, with the life force from the Milk White Sea. This Yayuchi then watches over the newly born during the whole of his life on earth. But at the same time, Ehrlich sends forth a Kormos to prevent the birth or at least hamper it and to injure and misguide the newly born his whole life long. And if Ehrlich is successful in annihilating the life forces of a man, Kormos drags the soul before Ehrlich's judgment seat. If the man was more good than bad, Ehrlich has no power over him. Kormos stands aside and the Yayuchi brings the soul up to paradise. But the soul of the wicked is abandoned by its Yayuchi, dragged by its Kormos to hell in the deepest layer of the underworld, and flung into a gigantic cauldron of scalding tar. The worst sinners remain forever beneath the surface of the tar. The rest rise gradually above the bubbling tar, until at last the crown of the head with the pigtail comes to view. So even the sinner's good works are not in vain. The blessed in heaven reflect on the kindnesses once done by him, and they and his ancestors send his former Yayuchi to hell, who grasps him by the pigtail, pulls him out of the tar, and bears the soul up to heaven. 
For this reason the Kalmuks let their pigtails grow, as did many of the nomad peoples of history. However, there is no absolute justice. The gods of light, like the spirits of darkness, allow themselves to be won over by sacrificial viands, and if rich offerings are forthcoming, they willingly wink at transgression. They are envious of man's wealth and demand gifts from all, and so it is advisable to stand well with both powers, and that can only be done through the medium of the shamans. So long as Ehrlich is banished in the darkness, a uniform ordering of the universe exists till the last day when everything created comes to an end and the world ceases to be. With shamanism, fire worship was closely associated. Fire purifies everything, wards off evil, and makes every enchantment ineffective. Hence, the sick man and the strange arrival, and everything which he brings with him must pass between two fires. Probably fire worship was originally common to all the Altaians, and the Magyars also of the ninth century were described by the Arabian geographer as fire worshippers. In consequence of the healthy climate, the milk diet, and the Spartan hardening, the Altaian enjoys excellent health, hence the saying, healthy as a Kyrgyz. There are not a few old men of eighty, and some of a hundred years. Infectious diseases are almost unknown, chiefly because the constant smoke in the tent acts as a disinfectant, though combined with the ghastly filthiness, it promotes the very frequent eye complaints, itch, and eruptions of the skin. In consequence of the constant wandering on camelback and through the shaman hocus-pocus, illness and death at home are vexations, and sudden death on the field of battle is preferred. In order not to be forgotten, the Turco-Tartar, in contrast to the Mongol, likes to be buried in a conspicuous place, and as such places do not exist on the steppes, after a year there is heaped over the buried corpse an artificial mound, which according to the wealth of the dead man rises to a hill-like tumulus. At the same time, an ostentatious funeral festival lasting seven days is held, with races, prize combats, and other games on horseback. Hundreds of horses, camels, and sheep are then consumed. The nomad loves his horses and weapons as himself. The principal weapon is the lance, and in European warfare, the Ulans and Cossacks survive from the armies of the steppes. The nomad peoples who invaded Europe were all wonderfully sure bowmen. The value of the bow lies in the treacherous noiselessness of the arrow, which is the best weapon for hunting and ambush, and is therefore still in use today together with the rifle. In addition, there have always been long-handled iron hatchets and pick-shaped battle axes for striking and hurling, and the bent saber. The warrior's body was often protected by a shirt of armor made of small polished steel plates, or by a harness of ox leather plates, the head by a helmet, all mostly Persian or Caucasian work. The hard, restless life of the mounted nomad is easily disturbed by pressure from his like, by the death of his cattle from hunger and disease, and by the prospect of plunder, which makes him a professional robber. Of this, the Turkoman was long a type. The leading features in the life of a Turkoman are the Alaman, predatory expedition, or the Chapeau, the surprise. The invitation to any enterprise likely to be attended with profit finds him ever ready to arm himself and to spring to his saddle. The design itself is always kept a profound secret, even from the nearest relative. And as soon as the Sirdar, chief-elect, has bestowed upon him by some mala or other the fatiha, benediction, every man betakes himself, at the commencement of the evening, by different ways, to a certain place indicated before as the rendezvous. The attack is always made either at midnight when an inhabited settlement, or at sunrise, when a caravan or any hostile troop is its object. This attack of the Turkomans, like that of the Huns and Tartars, is rather to be styled a surprise. They separate themselves into several divisions and make two, hardly ever three, assaults upon their unsuspecting prey. For according to a Turkoman proverb, try twice, turn back the third time. The party assailed must possess great resolution and firmness to be able to withstand a surprise of this nature. The Persians seldom do so. Very often a Turkoman will not hesitate to attack five or even more Persians, and will succeed in his enterprise. Often the Persians, struck with a panic, 
throw away their arms, demand the cords, and bind each other mutually. The Turkomans have no occasion to dismount, except for the purpose of fastening the last of them. He who resists is cut down. The coward who surrenders has his hands bound, and the horseman either takes him up on his saddle, in which case his feet are bound under the horse's belly, or drives him before him. Whenever from any cause this is not possible, the wretched man is attached to the tail of the animal, and has, for hours and hours, even for days and days, to follow the robber to his desert home. Each captive is then ill-treated, until his captor learns from him how high a ransom can be extracted from his kinsmen. But ransoming was a long way from meaning salvation itself, for on the journey home the ransomed were not seldom captured again and once more enslaved. Poor captives were sold at the usual price in the slave markets at Bokhara, Kiva, etc. For example, a woman of fifty for ten ducats. Those that could not be disposed of and were retained as herdsmen had the sinews of their heels cut to hinder them from flight. Until their overthrow by Skobolev in 1881, more than 15,000 Tekka Turkomans contrived such raids day and night. About a million people in Persia alone were carried off in the last century, and made on the average certainly not less than 10 pounds per head. In the ninth century, the Magyars and their nomadic predecessors in South Russia, according to Ibn Rusta's Arabian source, behaved exactly as the Turkomans in Persia. They provided for the slave markets on the Pontus so many Slav captives that the word slave finally became the designation in the West of the worst servitude. With man-stealing was associated cattle-stealing, baranta, which finally made any attempt at cattle-rearing impossible for the systematically plundered victim and drove him to vegetarianism without milk nourishment. And what a vegetarianism! when agriculture had to suffer from the ever-recurring raids and from bad harvests, and where the predatory herdsmen settled for the winter in the midst of an agricultural population, and in his own interests allowed them a bare existence as his serfs, there came about a remarkable connection of two strata of people, different in race and for a time in speech also. A typical land in this respect is Fergana, the former Khanate of Kokand, in the southern border of the great Kyrgyz horde. The indigenous inhabitants of this country, the entirely vegetarian Tajiks and Sarts, from immemorial times passed from the hands of one nomad people to another, in the most frightful servitude. In the sweat of their brows they dug canals for irrigation, cultivated fields, and put into practice a hundred arts, only to pay the lion's share to their oppressors who, in the full consciousness of their boundless power, indulged the most bestial appetites. But the majority of the dominant horde could not turn from their innate and uncontrollable impulse to wander. In the spring they were drawn irresistibly to the free air of the high-lying steppes, and only a part of them returned to winter among the enslaved peasantry. This hopeless state of affairs continued to the Russian conquest in 1876, for the directly adjoining deserts always poured forth wild hordes afresh, who nipped in the bud any humaner intercourse of herdsmen and peasants. For rapine and slavery were inevitable wherever the nomads of the vast steppes and deserts made their abode in the immediate neighborhood of more civilized lands. What their own niggardly soil denied them, they took by force from the fruitful lands of their neighbors. And, because the plundered husbandman could not pursue the fleet-mounted nomad into the trackless desert, he remained unprotected. The fertile districts on the edge of the Sahara and the Arabian desert were also in this frightful position, and Iran felt this calamity all the harder, because the adjoining deserts of Turan are the most extensive and terrible, and their inhabitants the wildest of all the nomads of the world. No better fared the peoples inhabiting East Europe on the western boundaries of the steppe zone. As early as the 4th century BC, Ephorus stated that the customs, according to the individual peoples, of the Scythians and the Sarmatians, both names covered the most medley conglomerations of nomads and peasants, were very dissimilar. Some even ate human beings, as the Masagete ate their sick or aged parents. Others abstained from all animals. A thousand years later, Pseudo-Caesarius of Nazianzus tells of a double people, 
that of the Sclavines, Slavs, and Physonites on the lower Danube, of whom the Sclavines abstained from meat-eating. And Constantine Porphyrogenitus, in the year 952, stated that the Russians, North Germanic Varangians, who, coming from Scandinavia, held sway over the Slavs of Russia, bought horses, cattle, and sheep from their terrible nomadic neighbors, the Patsanaks, because they had none of these animals themselves, i.e. in the Slav lands which they dominated. In certain districts of East Europe, therefore, vegetarianism was permanent among the peasant folk, who for more than 2,000 years had been visited by the Altaeans with rapine and murder. This can be proved from original sources to have been the case from the 4th century BC to the 10th century AD that is, for 1,400 years. It is exactly the same state of things as in Fergana in modern times. As long as a nomad horde finds sufficient room in the steppe, it does not think of emigration, and always returns home from its raids richly laden with the plunder. But if the steppe zone is thrown into a ferment by struggles for the winter pastures or by other causes, the relatively weakest horde gets pushed out of the steppe and must conquer a new home outside the zone. For it is only weak against the remaining nomad hordes, but against any other state upon which it falls, it is irresistible. All the nomads of history who broke into Europe, the Scythians, Sarmatians, Huns, Bulgarians, Avars, Magyars, Cumans, were the weakest in the steppes and had to take to flight. Whence they became the assailants of the world, before whom the strongest states tottered, with an energetic Khan at their head, who organized them on military lines, such a horde transformed itself into an incomparable army, compelled by the instinct of self-preservation to hold fast together in the midst of the hostile population which they subjugated. For however superfluous a central government may be in the steppe, it is of vital importance to a conquering nomad horde outside it. Consequently, while that part of the people which remained in the steppe was split up into loose clan associations, the other part, which emigrated, possessed itself of immense territories, exterminated the greater part of entire nations, and enslaved the rest, scattered them as far as they pleased, and founded a despotically governed state with a ridiculously small band of horsemen. The high figures in the chronicles are fictions exaggerated by terror and imagination, seeing that large troops of horsemen who recklessly destroyed everything around them would not have found in a narrow space even the necessary pasture for their many horses. Each Mongol under Chinggis Khan, for example, was obliged to take with him 18 horses and mares, so as always to have a fresh steed and sufficient mare's milk and horse's blood for food and drink. Two corps, under the command of Sabutai and Chebi, sufficed this great conqueror for the overthrow of West Asia. In four years, they devastated and in great part depopulated Khorasan, North Persia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, Caucasia, the Crimea, and the Volga territories, took hundreds of towns, and utterly defeated in bloody engagements the large armies of the Georgians, Leskians, Circassians, and Cumans, and the united forces of the Russian princes. But they spared themselves as much as possible by driving those of the subjugated people who were capable of bearing arms into the fight before them, as the Huns and Avars did previously, and cutting them down at once when they hesitated. End of section 42. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 43 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. But what the Altaian armies lacked in numbers was made up for by their skill and surprises, their fury, their cunning, mobility, and elusiveness, and the panic which preceded them and froze the blood of all peoples. On their marvelously fleet horses, they could traverse immense distances, and their scouts provided them with accurate local information as to the remotest lands and their weakness. Add to this the enormous advantage that among them even the most insignificant news spread like wildfire, 
from all to all by means of voluntary couriers surpassing any intelligence department however well organized the tactics of the mongols are described by marco polo in agreement with plano carpini and all the other writers as follows they never let themselves come to close quarters but keep perpetually riding round and shooting into the enemy and as they do not count it any shame to run away in battle they will sometimes pretend to do so and in running away they turn in the saddle and shoot hard and strong at the foe and in this way make great havoc their horses are trained so perfectly that they will double hither and thither just like a dog in a way that is quite astonishing thus they fight to as good purpose in running away as if they stood and faced the enemy because of the vast volleys of arrows that they shoot in this way turning round upon their pursuers who are fancying that they have won the battle but when the tartars see that they have killed and wounded a good many horses and men they wheel round bodily and return to the charge in perfect order and with loud cries and in a very short time the enemy are routed in truth they are stout and valiant soldiers and inured to war and you perceive that it is just when the enemy sees them run and imagines that he has gained the battle that he has in reality lost it for the tartars wheel round in a moment when they judge the right time has come and after this fashion they have won many a fight the chronicler peter of zitau in the year thirteen fifteen described the tactics of the magyars in exactly the same way when a vigorous conqueror like Attila or Chinggis arose among the mounted nomads and combined several hordes for a cyclonic advance, they swept all before them on the march, like a veritable avalanche of peoples. The news of the onward rolling flood scared the bravest people and compelled them to fly from their homes. Thus their neighbors, too, were set in tumultuous motion, and so it went on, till some more powerful state took defensive measures and stemmed the tide of peoples. Now the fugitives had to face the assailant. A battle of nations was fought, the flower of famous peoples strewed the field, and powerful nations were wiped out. The deserted or devastated territories were occupied by peoples hitherto often quite unknown, or settled by nations forcibly brought there by the conqueror. States, generally without duration, and kept together only by the one powerful hand were founded the giant state having no cohesion from within fell to pieces at the death of the conqueror or shortly after but the sediment of peoples together with a stratum of their nomad oppressors which remained from the flood could not be pushed back again and immense areas of a continent received once again an entirely new ethnography the work of one single furious conqueror oftener and longer than in europe successive altaian empires held together in asia where the original population had long become worn out by eternal servitude and the central zone of the steppes supplied a near and secure base for plundering hordes that some of these asiatic empires attained to a high degree of prosperity is not due to the conquerors who indeed quickly demongolized themselves by marriage with aliens but was the consequence of the geographical position, the productivity of the soil, and the resigned tractableness and adaptability of the subjugated, who, in spite of all the splendor of their masters, were forced to languish in helpless servitude. Out of Central Asia, from time immemorial, one nomad horde after another broke into the steppes of South Russia and of Hungary, and after exterminating or pushing out their predecessors and occupying their territories used this new base to harry and enslave the surrounding peoples far and wide forcibly transforming their whole being as in fergana but the bestial fury of the nomads not only laid bare the country recklessly depopulated enormous tracts dragged off entire peoples and forcibly transplanted and enslaved them but where their sway was of any duration they brought their subjects down to the level of brutes and extirpated every trace of nobler feeling from their souls central asia of today as van Bray states from personal observation is a sink of all vices and franz von schwarz draws the following cheerless picture of the turkestan sarts among whom he lived for fifteen years with respect to character 
they are sunk as low as man can possibly be. But this is not at all to be wondered at, as for thousands of years they were oppressed and enslaved by all possible peoples, against whom they could only maintain themselves by servility, cunning, and deceit. The Sart is cowardly, fawning, cringing, reticent, suspicious, deceitful, revengeful, cruel, and boastful. At the same time, he shows in his appearance and manner a dignity and bearing that would compel the uninitiated to regard him as the ideal of a man of honor. In the former native states, as in Bokhara and Kiva today, the entire system of government and administration was based exclusively on lying, deceit, and bribery, and it was quite impossible for a poor man to get justice. The opposite of the Sart is his oppressor, the Kyrgyz, who is shy, morose, and violent, but also honorable, upright, good-hearted, and brave. The terrible slave-hunting Turkoman is distinguished from all other Central Asiatics by his bold and piercing glance and proud bearing. In wild bravery, no other race on earth can match itself with him, and as a horseman he is unsurpassed. He has an unruly disposition and recognizes no authority, but his word can be absolutely relied upon. What a tragic fate for an enslaved people! Although its lowest degradation is already behind it, how long yet will it be the object of universal and not unnatural contempt, while its former oppressor, void of all humane feeling, as a professional murderer and cattle thief, remains as a hero and ideal superman? So long as the dominant nomad horde remains true to its wandering life, it lives in the midst of the subjugated only in winter, and proceeds in spring to the summer pastures. But it is wise enough to leave behind overseers and guards to prevent revolts. The individual nomad has no need to keep many slaves. Besides, he would have no occupation and no food for them. And so, an entire horde enslaves entire peoples, who must provide food for themselves. Insofar as he does not winter directly among them, the nomad only comes to plunder them regularly, leaving them nothing but what is absolutely indispensable. The peasantry had to supply the nomads and their herds who wintered among them with all that was demanded. For this purpose, they stored up grain and fodder during the summer. For in Central and East Europe, the snow falls too deep for the herds to be left to scrape out fodder alone. During the winter, the wives and daughters of the enslaved became a prey to the lusts of the yellow skins by whom they were incessantly violated, and thus every conjugal and family tie, and as a further consequence, the entire social organization, was seriously loosened. The ancient Indo-European patriarchal principle which has exclusively prevailed among the Altaeans also from the earliest times, languished among the enslaved just because of the violation and loosening of the conjugal bond, which often continued for hundreds of years. The matriarchal principle came into prominence, for the Altaean adulterer repudiated bastards, and still more did the husband where there was one, so the children followed the mother. Where therefore matriarchal phenomena occur among Indo-Europeans, usually among the lower strata of population, they are not survivals of pre-patriarchal times, but probably arose later from the corruption of married life by systematic adultery. Thus the subjugated Indo-Europeans became, here more, there less, mongolized by the mixture of races, and in places the two superimposed races became fused into a uniform mixed people. Footnote. The Mongol type of features extends westward to Bavaria and Württemberg. End of footnote. Indo-European usage and law died out, and the savage willfulness of the Altaeans had exclusive sway. Revolutions among the people driven to despair followed, but they were quelled in blood, and the oppression exercised still more heavily. Even if here and there the yoke was successfully shaken off, the emancipated, long paralyzed and robbed of all capability of self-organization, were unable to remain independent. Commonly they fell into anarchy, and then voluntarily gave themselves up to another milder-seeming servitude, or became once more the prey of an, if possible, rougher conqueror. 
In consequence of the everlasting man-hunting, and especially the carrying off of women in foreign civilized districts, there ensued a strong mixing of blood, and the Altaian race characteristics grew fainter, especially to the south and west. The Greeks, by the time of Alexander the Great, were no longer struck by the Mongol type, already much obliterated, of the nomads pasturing in the district between the Oxus and the Jaxartes. This led to the supposition that these nomads had belonged to the Indo-European race and had originally been settled peasants, and that they had been compelled to limit themselves to animal rearing and to become nomads only after the conversion of their fields to deserts through the evaporation of the water basins. This supposition is false, as we have seen before. The steppes and deserts of Central Asia are an impassable barrier for the South Asiatics, the Aryans, but not for the North Asiatic, the Altaian. For him, they are an open country, providing him with the indispensable winter pastures. On the other hand, for the South Asiatic Aryan, these deserts are an object of terror, and besides, he is not impelled towards them as he is winter pastures near at hand. It is this difference in the distance of summer and winter pastures that makes the North Asiatic Altaian an ever-wandering herdsman, and the grazing part of the Indo-European race cattle rearers settled in limited districts. Thus, while the native Iranian must halt before the trackless region of steppes and deserts, and cannot follow the well-mounted robber nomad thither, Iran itself is the object of greatest longing to the nomadic Altaian. Here he can plunder and enslave to his heart's delight, and if he succeeds in maintaining himself for a considerable time among the Aryans, he learns the language of the subjugated people, and by mingling with them loses his Mongol characteristics more and more. If the Iranian is now fortunate enough to shake off the yoke, the dispossessed, ironized Altaian intruder inflicts himself upon other lands. So it was with the Scythians. Leaving their families behind in the South Russian steppes, the Scythians invaded Medea circa B.C. 630 and advanced into Mesopotamia and Syria as far as Egypt. In Medea, they took Median wives and learned the Median language. After being driven out by Syaxares, on their return some twenty-eight years later, they met with a new generation, the offspring of the wives and daughters whom they had left behind, and slaves of an alien race. A thorough mixture of race within a single generation is hardly conceivable. A hundred and fifty years later, Hippocrates found them still so foreign, so Mongolian, that he could say that they were very different from the rest of mankind, and only like themselves, as are also the Egyptians. He remarked their yellowish-red complexion, corpulence, smooth skins, and their consequent eunuch-like appearance, all typically Mongol characteristics. Hippocrates was the most celebrated physician and natural philosopher of the ancient world. His evidence is unshakable and cannot be invalidated by the Aryan speech of the Scythians. Their Mongol type was innate in them, whereas their Iranian speech was acquired and is no refutation of Hippocrates' testimony. On the later Greek vases from South Russian excavations, they already appear strongly demongolized, and the Altaian is only suggested by their hair, which is as stiff as a horse's mane. Hence, Aristotle's epithet, F. the Trishis, the characteristic that survives longest among all Ural-Altaian hybrid peoples. If a nomad army is obliged to take foreign, non-nomadic wives, there occurs at once a dualism, corresponding to the two sexes, in the language and way of living of each individual household. The new wives cannot live in the saddle. They do not know how to take down the tent, load it on the beasts of burden, and set it up again, and yet they must share the restless life of the herdsmen. Consequently, where the ground admits of it, as in South Russia, the tent is put on wheels and drawn by animals. Thus, the Scythian women were hemaxobiotic, wagon-inhabiting. The men, however, remained true to their horse-riding life and taught their boys, too, as soon as they could keep themselves in the saddle. But the dualism in language could not maintain itself. The children held to the language of the mother, the more easily because even the fathers understood Medish, 
and so the Altaian Scythian people, with their language finally ironized, became Iranian. But their mode of life remained unchanged. The consumption of horse flesh, soured horse's milk, kumis, and cheese of the same, the hemp vapor bath for men, the women bathed differently, singeing of the fleshy parts of the body as a cure for rheumatism, poisoning of the arrow tips, wholesale human offerings, and slaughter of favorite wives at the burials of princes, the placing on horseback of the stuffed bodies of murdered warriors round the grave, etc. All such customs as are found so well defined among the Mongols of the Middle Ages. The modern Tartars of the Crimea, whose classical beauty sometimes rivals that of the Greeks and Romans, underwent in the same land the same change to the Aryan type. The same is the case with the Magyars, whose mounted nomadic mode of life and fury, and consequently their origin, was Turkish, but their language was a mixture of Ugrian and Turkish on an Ugrian basis. Evidently a Magyar army, Turkish in blood, formerly advanced far to the north, where it subdued an Ugrian people and took Ugrian wives. The children then blended the Ugrian speech of their mothers with the Turkish speech of their fathers. But they must also once have dominated Indo-European peoples and mixed themselves very strongly with them, for Gardizi's original source from the middle of the ninth century describes them as handsome, stately men. At that time, they were leading the nomad existence in the Pontic Steppe, the old Scythia, whence they engaged in terrible slave hunting among the neighboring Slavs and as they were notorious women hunters, they must have assimilated much Slav, Alan, and Circassian blood, and thus became handsome, stately men. However, the change did not end there. At the end of the ninth century, their army, on its return from a predatory expedition, found their kindred at home totally exterminated by their deadly enemies, the Patsanaks, a related stock. Consequently, the whole body had again to take foreign wives, and they occupied the steppes of Hungary. Before this catastrophe, the Magyars were said to have mustered 20,000 horsemen, an oriental exaggeration, for this would assume a nomad people of 200,000 souls. Consequently, only a few thousand horsemen could have fled to Hungary. There, they mixed themselves further with the medley race conglomeration settled there, which had formed itself centuries before, and assimilated stragglers from the related Patsanak stock. By this absorption, the Altaian type asserted itself so predominantly that the Frankish writers were never tired of depicting their ugliness and loathsomeness in the most horrifying colors. Their fury was so irresistible that in 63 years they were able, with impunity, to make 32 great predatory expeditions as far as the North Sea, and to France, Spain, Italy, and Byzantium. Thus the modern Magyars are one of the most varied race mixtures on the face of the earth, and one of the two chief Magyar types of today, traced to the Arpad era by tomb findings, is dolicocephalic with a narrow visage. Thus we have before us Altaian origin, Ugrian speech, and Indo-European type combined. Such metamorphoses are typical for all nomads, who, leaving their families at home, attack foreign peoples, and at the same time make war on one another. In the furious tumult in which the Central Asiatic mounted hordes constantly swarmed and fought one another for the spoils, it is to be presumed that nearly all such people, like the Scythians and Magyars, at least once sustained the loss of their wives and children. The mounted nomads could therefore remain a pure race only where they constantly opposed their own kin, whereas to the south and west they were merged so imperceptibly in the Semitic and Indo-European stock that no race boundary is perceivable. The most diversified was the destiny of those mounted nomads who became Romanized in the Balkan Peninsula, Romanians or Vlachs, Vlachos, but, surprising as it may be outside the steppe region, remain true to this day to their life as horse and sheep nomads, wherever this is still at all possible. During the summer they grazed on most of the mountains of the Balkan Peninsula, and took up their winter quarters on the seacoasts among a peasant population speaking a different language. 
Thence they gradually spread, unnoticed by the chroniclers, along all the mountain ranges, over all the Carpathians of Transylvania, North Hungary, and South Galicia to Moravia, towards the northwest from Montenegro, onwards over Herzegovina, Bosnia, Istria, as far as South Styria, towards the south over Albania far into Greece. In the entire Balkan peninsula, there is scarcely a span of earth which they have not grazed, and like the peasantry among which they wintered and winter long enough, they became, and become, after a transitory bilingualism, Greeks, Albanians, Servians, Bulgarians, Ruthenians, Poles, Slovaks, Czechs, Slovenes, Croatians, seeing that they appeared there not as a compact body, but as a mobile nomad stratum among a strange-tongued and more numerous peasant element, and not till later did they gradually take to agriculture and themselves become settled. In Istria they are still bilingual, on the other hand, they maintain themselves in Romania, East Hungary, Bukovina, Bessarabia, for the following reasons. The central portion of this region, the Transylvanian mountain belt, sustained with its rich summer pastures such a number of grazing camps, Romanian Katun, Mongolian Koton, that the nomads in the favorable winter quarters of the Romanian plain were finally able to absorb the Slav peasantry already almost wiped out by the everlasting passage through them of other wild nomad peoples. In Macedonia, too, a remainder of them still exists. Were they not denationalized, the Romanians today would be by far the most numerous, but also the most scattered, people of South Europe, not less than 20 million souls. The Romanians were not descendants of Roman colonists of Dacia left behind in East Hungary and Transylvania. Their nomadic life is a confutation of this, for the Emperor Trajan, after A.D. 107, transplanted settled colonists from the entire Roman Empire, and after the removal and withdrawal of the Roman colonists, circa A.D. 271, Dacia, for untold centuries, was the arena of the wildest international struggles known to history, and these could not have been outlived by any nomad people remaining there. To be sure, some expressed the opinion that the Romanian nomad herdsmen fled into the Transylvanian mountains at each new invasion, by the Huns, Bulgarians, Avars, Magyars, Patsanaks, Cumans, successively, and subsequently always returned. But the nomad can support himself in the mountains only during the summer, and he must descend to pass the winter. On the other hand, each of these new invading nomad hordes needed these mountains for summer grazing for their own herds. Thus, the Romanians could not have escaped, and their alleged game of hide-and-seek would have been in vain. But south of the Danube, also, the origin of the Romanians must not be sought in Roman times, but much later, because nomads are never quickly denationalized. For in the summer they are quite alone on the otherwise uninhabited mountains, having intercourse with one another in their own language and only in their winter quarters among the foreign-speaking peasantry are they compelled in their dealings with them to resort to the foreign tongue. Thus, they remain for centuries bilingual before they are quite denationalized, and this can be proved from original sources precisely in the case of the Romanians, Vlachs, in the Old Kingdom of Servia. Accordingly, the Romanizing of the Romanians presupposes a Romance peasant population already existing there for a long time and of different race. And then, very gradually, after some centuries, forgot their own language. In what district could this have taken place? For nomads outside the salt steppe, the seacoast offers, precisely on account of the salt and the mild winter, the most suitable winter quarters. And, as a matter of fact, from the earliest times, certain shores of the Adriatic, the Ionian, Aegean, and Marmora, were crowded with Vlachian Katuns, and are partly so at the present time. Among all these sea districts, however, only Dalmatia had remained so long Romanic as to be able entirely to Romanize a nomad people. Footnote. Jiracek assigns the center of the oldest Romanians to Servia and its neighborhood, where the district in which the Latin language was spoken was the most extended. 
because the Romanian language is very different from the dialect of the ancient Dalmatians, but because the central lands offer few suitable winter pastures on account of their raw climate and heavy snowfall, it must be assumed that the district in which the Romanic speech adopted by the ancestors of the Romanians was spoken somewhere reached notwithstanding to the Adriatic Sea. End of footnote. From this district, the expansion of the Romanians had its beginning, so that the name Daco Romanians is nothing but a fiction. The Spanish and Italian nomad shepherds, too, can have had no other origin. Allens took place in Radagaius's invasion of Italy in 405, and, having advanced to Gaul, founded in 411 a kingdom in Lusitania, which was destroyed by the Visigoths. The remainder advanced into Africa with the Vandals in 429. Traces of the Alans remained for a long time in Gaul. Sarmatian and Bulgarian hordes accompanied Albuin to Italy in 568, and twelve places in northern Italy are still called Bulgaro, Bulgari, etc. A horde of Altaian Bulgars fled to Italy later, and received from the Lombard Grimoald, 662-672, extensive and hitherto barren settlements in the mountains of Abruzzi and their neighborhood. In the time of Paulus Diaconus, 797, they also spoke Latin, but their mother tongue was still intact, for only on their winter pastures in Apulia and Campania, in contact with Latin peasants in whose fields they encamped, were they compelled to speak Latin. The old Roman sheep-rearing pursued by slaves has no connection with nomadism. Therefore, neither the non-Mongol appearance nor the Semitic, Indo-European, or Finno-Ugrian language of any historical mounted nomad people can be held as a serious argument for their Semitic, Indo-European, or Finno-Ugrian origin. Everything speaks for one single place of origin for the mounted nomads, and that is in the Turanian Mongol steppes and deserts. These alone, by their enormous extent, their unparalleled severity of climate, their uselessness in summer, their salt vegetation nourishing countless herds, and above all by their indivisible economic connection with the distant grass-abounding north. These alone give rise to a people with the ineradicable habits of mounted nomads. The Indo-European vocabulary reveals no trace of a former mounted nomadism. There is no ground for speaking of Indo-European, Semitic, Finno-Ugrian nomads, but only of nomads who have remained Altaic or of Indo-Europeanized, Semiticized, Ugrianized nomads. The Scythians became Iranian, the Magyars Ugrian, the Avars and Bulgarians Slavic, and so on. The identical origin of all the mounted nomads of historic and modern times is also demonstrated by the identity of their entire mode of life, even in its details and most trivial particulars, their customs and their habits. One nomad people is the counterfeit of the other, and after more than 2,000 years, no change, no differentiation, no progress is to be observed among them. Accordingly, we can always supplement our not always precise information about individual historical hordes and the consequences of their appearance by comparisons with the better known hordes. We are best informed about the Mongols of the 13th century and that by Rogerius Canon of Varad, Thomas Archdeacon of Spalato, Plano Carpini, Rubucris, Marco Polo, and others, whose accounts are therefore indispensable for a correct estimation of all earlier nomadic invaders of Europe. This is the role of nomadism in the history of the world. Countries too distant from its basis, it could only ravage transitorily with robbery, murder, fire, and slavery. But the stamp which it left upon the peoples which it directly dominated or adjoined remains uneffaceable. The Orient, the cradle and chief nursery of civilization, it delivered over to barbarism. It completely paralyzed the greater spirit of Europe, and it transformed and radically corrupted the race, spirit, and character of countless millions for incalculable ages to come. That which is called the inferiority of the East European is its work, and had Germany or France possessed steppes like Hungary, where the nomads could also have maintained themselves, and thence completed their work of destruction, 
in all probability the light of west european civilization would long ago have been extinguished the entire old world would have been barbarized and at the head of civilization today would be stagnant china end of section 43 recording by colleen mcmahon Section 44 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Chameleon. Section 44. Attila by Ludwig Schmidt. The Huns, who were divided into numerous distinct tribes ruled by separate princes, had, since the beginning of the 5th century, begun to draw together into a closer political union. King Rua had already united a large part of the nation under his sceptre. He ruled especially over the tribes that inhabited the plains of Hungary. Numerous alien barbaric peoples, Slavs, Germans, Sarmatians, etc., were under his sway. The Eastern Empire paid him a yearly tribute. He was on friendly terms with Aetius, the general of the Western Empire, who on this account gave up to him a part of Pannonia, the province of Savia. Rua's successors were his nephews, Pleda and Attila, the sons of Munzuk. They first of all reigned jointly, each ruling over a definite number of tribes, but maintaining the unity of their empire, while in questions of foreign politics, both rulers cooperated. Pleda's personality traditionally fades into obscurity beside Attila's. Attila was hideous to look upon, Little, broad-shouldered, with big head, flat nose, and scanty beard. He was covetous, vain, and, like all despots, careful in the preservation of the outward appearance of dignity. He was superstitious, unable to read or write, but of penetrating intellect. He was cunning, audacious, and skilled in all the arts of diplomacy. He is most fitly compared to the formidable Mongol king Genghis Khan. Like him, he was a mere conqueror who aimed at destruction and plunder. His supremacy had, therefore, only the effect of a devastating tornado, not that of a purifying thunderstorm which wakes nature to new life. Certainly, he did not rival the Mongol in cruelty and violence. A wise calculation prevented him from totally laying waste to the territory given over to him. He respected the law of nations and could be just and magnanimous towards his enemies. Though surrounded by great pomp, he remained simple and moderate in his manner of life. He would sit at meals with a stern and earnest countenance, without taking any part in the revelry going on around him. The policy of concentrating authority within the nation and extending it externally, which was introduced by Rua, was consciously developed by Bleda and Attila, especially by the latter after he had, in 444 or 445, attained to exclusive dominion by setting aside his brother and co-ruler. About the year 435, the Sorazgi, possibly a people of Turkish origin, domiciled in South Russia, as well as other Scythian races, were subdued. The Akatziri, living in the district to the north of the Black Sea, who hitherto had been in alliance with the Huns, were obliged to acknowledge Attila's rule, and he placed his eldest son, Elak, at their head as sub-king. The king of the Huns even thought of extending the eastern frontier of his empire to Medea and Persia. Among the barbarians tributary to him were besides the Alani numerous Slav tribes, some of which lived east of the Vistula, while others, driven out by the Huns, had settled in the Danubian lands, as had in particular the Teutons of the Danube Basin. Gepidae, Ostrogoths, Heruli, Rugi, Tsiri, Tursilingi, Suevi, certainly other names of German tribes are mentioned as under Attila's dominion. Marcomanni, Bastarne, Burgundians, Bructeri, Franks, and perhaps Alamanni on the Neckar, but it is doubtful to whom they were subject. The Burgundians, who had previously in the year 430 successfully repelled a Hunnic host, the Bructen, the Franks, and the Germans on the Neckar, must have voluntarily joined the Huns during the great march to Gaul, so that we are scarcely justified in advancing the western frontier of the Huns as far as the Rhine. The Germans occupy a conspicuous place in the circle around Attila. 
It is related of Adaric, the king of the Gepidae, that he enjoyed a special consideration from Attila on account of his fidelity, and that his advice was not without influence on the decisions of the king of the Huns. Among his trusted counsellors is mentioned, besides the famous warrior prince of the Siri, Edeko, Odovacar's father, who in the year 449 was sent to Constantinople as ambassador. The Ostrogoth king, Valamir, is also said, though by a biased and not unimpeachable authority, to have enjoyed Attila's favour. Thus the German peoples mostly maintained their autonomy, and were generally only obliged to serve in the army, while other inferior subject races, in particular the Slavs, forfeited their independence and were compelled to feed their rulers with the produce of their farms and cattle. Yet Attila looked upon all subjugated peoples as his slaves and asserted an absolute right of disposing of their life and property. All attempts to withdraw from his sovereignty he punished with terrible cruelty. The demand for delivery of fugitives, therefore, played an important part in his negotiations with the Romans. We are, as is natural, mostly accurately informed of his relations with the two halves of the Roman Empire. Like Rua, Attila maintained a friendship with Aetius, at whose disposal he repeatedly placed Hunnish mercenaries. This relationship was partly brought about by personal conditions, partly by the endeavour of Attila to divide the Roman power. With such auxiliaries, the general of the Western Empire destroyed at Worms the Burgundian kingdom of legendary fame an event which later tradition and saga have turned into an expedition of Attila's against the Burgundians. Numbers of Huns served in the Roman army which, in the same way, in 436 to 439, fought against the Visigoths. On his side, Aetius sent to the king a learned Roman scribe, Constantius, as private secretary, and gave him his own son Carpillo as hostage, for which, in return, he was honoured with gifts. The office also of a Magister Militum, which Attila held, he seems to have obtained through the Western Empire. The tribute which was paid to him from thence was disguised under the name of a salary as Roman General-in-Chief. But at the end of the year 440, serious troubles already disturbed these relations because Attila repeatedly annoyed the Western Empire and terrified it with threats under the pretext that fugitives from his dominion had found refuge there. The same degrading treatment must have befallen the Eastern Roman Empire, which was under the sovereignty of the incapable emperor Theodosius II. A complete overthrow and destruction of the Eastern Empire was not Attila's intention. His policy, on the contrary, aimed at keeping it, by continual extortions of money and actual depredations, in a state of permanent weakness and incapacity to resist. And, as he insisted that all deserters should be given up to him, He deprived the Romans of the means of strengthening their army by recruiting among the barbaric peoples of the Danube lands. These leading ideas came clearly to light at once in the first treaty which the two kings of the Huns concluded with the emperor soon after their accession. It was agreed that the Romans should no longer receive fugitive from the Huns and that these, as well as the Roman prisoners of war who had escaped from the country of the Huns, should be given up unless a ransom was paid for each of the latter. Besides, the emperor must not assist any barbarian people that was fighting against the Huns. Between both the kingdoms there was to be free commercial intercourse. The tribute of the Romans was doubled and raised to 700 pounds of gold. It was clear that the Huns would not be contented with success so easily gained. If they nevertheless kept the peace for eight years, it is only because they were occupied with the subjection of the various Scythian peoples to the north of the Danube. In the year 441, they were on the warpath and slaughtered the Romans who had come on account of a market to the bank of the Danube. A direct reason for the opening of hostilities was given to them by the East Roman expedition against the Vandals which had occasioned the withdrawal of frontier troops. This coincidence of events has given rise to the groundless supposition that Gaiseric and Attila had at that time formed an alliance. To the emperor's expostulation, the kings replied that the Romans had not paid the tribute regularly, had sheltered deserters, and also that the Bishop of Margus had robbed the Hunnish royal graves of their treasures, and they threatened him with a continuation of the war unless the fugitives and the bishop were handed over to them. As the imperial envoys refused everything, 
the Huns captured the Danube forts Ratiaria, Viminacium, Singidunum and Margus, the last through the treachery of the bishop who was afraid of being delivered up, and pressed devastating as they went into the interior of the Balkan lands as far as the neighbourhood of Constantinople, where they conquered cities like Naissus, Philippopolis and Arcadiopolis. Other Hunnish bands joined with the Persians, made an inroad at the same time over the Caucasus into the frontier lands of the Eastern Empire. The Roman army, which had in the meantime been called from Sicily by Theodosius, was decisively beaten in the Thracian Chersonesus. The kings of the Huns dictated peace, and its conditions were still more disgraceful than before. The yearly tribute was raised to £2,100 of gold, besides the stipulation of the payment of an indemnity of £6,000 of gold and the surrender of fugitives was insisted upon. Already in the year 447, the Huns invaded once more and again brought the most terrible calamities upon the Balkan lands. Arne Gisclus, the general who opposed the enemy, was beaten and killed after valiant resistance on the river Utus in Lower Moesia, after which the Hunnish cavalry pressed up the valley of the river Margus and through Thessaly as far as Thermopylae. Some 70 cities and fortresses are said to have fallen victims to them at that time. When, in the year 448, peace was again concluded, Attila demanded that besides the usual money payments, a broad tract of a five days journey on the right bank of the Danube from Singindium to Nove should be left waste. The boundary was placed at Niasus. But even now Attila would not leave the emperor at peace. Embassy after embassy went to Constantinople and, on the standing pretext that not all deserters had yet been delivered up, continually asserted fresh humiliating claims. The king being, however, chiefly desirous of giving his messengers an opportunity of enriching themselves with the customary gifts. The Eastern Empire was near to a financial collapse as it could not exert itself to armed resistance. The thought came to the imperial government, that is to say, to the court eunuch Chrysaphius in particular, of getting rid of the king of the Huns by murder. For this deed, the cooperation of the Syrian prince Edeko was sought. He declared himself ready to assist, but immediately betrayed the plan to Attila. The king revenged himself only by scorning the despicable enemy. The Roman envoys who had come with Edeko to him, amongst whom was the historian Priscus, he allowed to withdraw, respecting the law of nations. He promised besides to maintain the peace and give up the waste frontier of the Danube, and he did not once press the demand made in his first anger that Chrysaphius should be put to death. But he sent word to the emperor that as Attila was a king's son, so was Theodosius an emperor's son, but that as the latter had rendered himself tributary to the former, he thus became his slave, and that it was a shameful action that he, as such, should aim at the life of his master. Attila might rightly consider himself the lord of the whole Roman Empire. His authority had been considerably enhanced among his own people by the discovery about that time of a sword buried in the ground, which was regarded as the weapon of the god of war. It was not until Theodosius died, 28th of July 450, that these wretched conditions altered. His successor, the efficient emperor Marcion, refused, as soon as he succeeded to the throne, to continue the payment of the tribute to the king of the Huns, and the Western Empire followed his example. The outbreak of war was also due to the conduct of Gratia Justa Honoria, the sister of the Western Emperor Valentinian. She secretly offered herself as wife to the king of the Huns, but the fulfilment of the offer was refused because Attila demanded that half of the Western Empire should be given up to her as her inheritance from her father. Attila hereupon determined to take possession of the Western Empire and of Gaul first of all, for here he might reckon with certainty on the support of the Franks, who, being split up into two sections on account of dynastic hostilities, called for his intervention, and he could in all probability count on at least the benevolent neutrality of the Visigoths. The story that Gaiseric, out of fear of Theodoric's vengeance, stirred up Attila to make war against the Visigoths is certainly a fable, for the African kingdom had nothing to fear from an attack on this side. Nevertheless, the Vandal king may have had a hand in the matter in order to weaken the West Roman Empire still further.
Supposing, however, an agreement between the Goths and the Romans to be possible, Attila wrote to Theodoric, as well as to the Western Emperor, that he was not going to take the field against them, but against their enemies. The history of the Hunnic expedition, which ended in Attila's defeat on the Campus Moriacus near Troyes, has already been told in another connection. Page 280. Without being followed by the victors, the Hunnic army returned to Hungary. Attila did not venture to repeat the expedition into Gaul. On the contrary, in the following year, after having made good his losses, he turned towards Italy, where he had not to fear Germanic heroism. Without encountering any resistance, the Hunnic army crossed the Julian Alps in the spring of 452. After a long siege, Aquileia was taken by storm and destroyed, after which the most important fortresses of Upper Italy, with the exception of Ravenna, easily fell into the hands of the enemy. A great many of the inhabitants of the terribly devastated country sought refuge on the unassailable islands of the lagoons along the Adriatic coast. Yet the real foundation of Venice, which tradition has connected with the Hunnic invasion, can only be traced back to the invasion of the Lombards. After this, Attila bethought himself of marching against Rome, but famine and disease, which broke out in his army, and the arrival in Italy of succour from the Eastern Empire, as well as superstitious fear, since the Visigoth king, Alaric, had died shortly after his capture of the Eternal City, kept him from carrying out his plan. Therefore, an embassy of the Romans, led by Pope Leo I, appeared in his camp on the Yelinko to induce him to withdraw. He willingly shrewd himself ready to conclude peace and retire. A contemporary, the chronicler Prosper Tiro, who at that time was living in the papal service at Rome, has ascribed the retreat of the scourge of God to the influence of Leo's powerful personality and later ecclesiastical tradition has naturally further enhanced the holy man's ostensible service and adorned it with all manner of supernatural circumstances. But a dispassionate historical inspection will not allow us to ascribe the saving of Italy solely to the influence of the Pope. Having returned home, Attila demanded of Marcion the tribute paid by Theodosius and, on the refusal of the emperor, prepared for war against eastern Rome. But his sudden death prevented the realisation of his scheme. He died of hemorrhage when he was celebrating his wedding with a maiden named Ildiko, the Kreimhild of the Nibelungenleid. The inheritance was divided among his sons, those mentioned by name being Elak, Dengisish and Ernak, the youngest, Attila's favourite. But with this was foreshadowed the downfall of the Hunnic power, which was too much dependent on the personal quality of its leader to be able to endure. Of the domestic life and polity of the Huns, we have also accurate knowledge through the genuine fragment of Priscus. The king's headquarters were on the Hungarian steppe between Thais and Kuros, and covered a large area which was enclosed by a circular wooden fence. In the middle stood the royal residence, also fenced round, a wooden erection consisting of one single hall, Attila's private and public dwelling, of ingenious architecture and furnished within with great magnificence. Among the king's circle, the Lagardes were prominent. A nobility founded on birth and service, these enjoyed the highest consideration with the ruler and the right to choose from the booty, the best spoils and the richest prisoners, and they formed a kind of council of state. Out of their midst, the bodyguard, the military leaders and the envoys were taken. The highest position amongst them was occupied by Onegesius, Attila's right hand and first minister, who lived in a palace at the entrance to the court residence. Besides Huns, there were also Germans and Romans among the Lugardes, who on account of their intelligence and culture enjoyed special consideration. At the king's court, therefore, the Latin and Gothic tongues were in predominant use together with the Hunnic. Attila ruled over his people in a wholly patriarchal manner. The administration of justice was executed through him personally in the simplest way, always just, without respect of persons. The freedom and legal protection, which every subject enjoyed, caused many a Roman to leave his home and settle with the uncivilised barbarians, who knew no kind of taxation. The Huns kept, as before, their character as nomadic horsemen. They were in their element on the steppes. Life in towns was repugnant to them. Justly appreciating these conditions, Attila had made no attempt to effect a change in the mode of life of his people, and never thought of removing to civilised districts 
and setting up there a new state. His object was fully attained by keeping the Romans in subjection and making them fill his treasury. The end of section 44. Section 45 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. Section 45. Roman Britain by F. J. Haberfield. The character and history of Roman Britain, as of many other Roman provinces, were predominantly determined by the facts of its geography. To that cause, or set of causes, more than to any other, we must attribute alike the Roman desire to conquer the province, and the actual stages of the conquest, the distribution of the troops employed as permanent garrison, the quality and extent of the Romanized civilization, and lastly, a great part of the long series of incidents by which the island was lost to Rome and Roman culture. Geologically, Britain forms the northwest side of a huge valley, which had its southeast side in northern and central France. Down the centre of this valley, ran two rivers, the one flowing southwest along a bed now covered by the English Channel, the other flowing northeast for a region now beneath the German Ocean. From these rivers the land sloped upwards, southeast to Vosges, Alps and Cévennes, northwest to Cornwall, Wales and northern Britain. The two rivers have long vanished but the configuration of their valleys has lasted. Though unquiet seas now divide England from northwestern Europe, the two areas that are once the two sides of the valleys still look to each other. Their lowlands lie opposite. Their main rivers flow out into the intervening sea. Their easiest entrances face. Each area lies open by nature to the trade or the brute force of the other. Each has its most fertile, most habitable, and least defensible districts next to those of the other. Hence comes the peculiar configuration of our island. In southeast Britain, there is little continuous hill country that rises above the 600 foot contour line. Instead, wide, undulating lowlands, marked by no striking physical feature, containing little to arrest or even divert the march of ancient armies or traders, stretch over all the south and east and midlands. The hills we must go north of Trent and Humber, or west of Severn and Ex. There we shall find almost the converse of the south-east. Throughout a large scattered region, extending from Cornwall to the highlands, the land lies mostly above, and much of its high above the 600-foot line. Its soil and climate are ill-suited to agriculture. Its deep valleys and gorges and wild moors and high peaks oppose alike the soldier and a citizen. Behind this upland lies the Atlantic, and an Atlantic which meant of old the reverse of what it does today. To the ancients this hill country was the end of the world, for us, since Columbus, it is the beginning. These physical features are reproduced plainly in the early history of Britain. It was natural that about BC 50 to AD 50, southern Britain should be occupied by Celtic tribes, and even families which had close kindred in Gaul, and that a lively intercourse should exist between the two. It was no less natural that even before Rome had fully conquered Gaul, Caesar's troops should be seen in Kent and Middlesex, B.C. 55-54. to And Roman suzerainty extended over these regions, and when the annexation of Gaul was finally complete, that of Britain seemed the obvious sequel. 
The sequel was indeed delayed a while by political causes. Augustus, B.C. 43 to A.D. 14, had too much else to do. Tiberius, 14 to 37, saw no need for it, just as he saw no need for any wars of conquest. But after 37 it became urgent. Changes in southern Britain had favoured an anti-Roman reaction there, and had perhaps produced disquiet in northern Gaul. Caligula, 37 to 41, had made some fiasco in connection with it. When Claudius succeeded, there was need of vigorous action, and as it chanced, the leading statesmen of the moment favoured a forward policy in many lands. The result was a well-planned and deservedly successful invasion, A.D. 43. The details of the ensuing war of conquest do not here concern us. It is enough to say that the lowlands offered little resistance. In one part of them, near the southeast coast, Roman ways had become familiar since Caesar's raids. In another part, the Midlands, the population was then, as now, thin. Nowhere, despite the furies of Guest and Green, were there physical obstacles likely to delay the Roman arms. By 47, the invaders subdued almost all the lowlands, as far west as Exeter and Shrewsbury, and as far north as the Humber. Then came a pause. The difficulties of the hill country, the bravery of the hill tribes, political circumstances at Rome, combine not indeed to arrest, but seriously to impede advance. But the decades 70 to 80 saw the final conquest of Wales, and a final subjugation of northern England, and in the years 80 to 84, Agricola was able to cross the Tyne and the Cheviots and gradually advance into Perthshire. Much of the land which he overran was but imperfectly subdued, and the northern part of it, everything, probably north of the Tweed, was abandoned when he was recalled, 85. Thirty years later, 11.5 to 1.20, an insurrection shook the whole Roman power in northern Britain, and when Hadrian had restored order, he established the frontier along a line from Tyne to Solway, which he fortified by forts in a continuous wall, about 122 to 124. Fifteen or twenty years later, about AD 140, his successor Pius, for reasons not properly recorded, made a fresh advance. He annexed Scotland up to the narrow isthmus between Forth and Clyde, and fortified that with a continuous wall, a series of forts along it variously estimated at twelve, or more probably at eighteen or twenty, and some outposts along the natural route for the Gap of Stirling to the northeast. This wall was not meant as a substitute for Hadrian's Wall, but as a defence to the country north of it. Rome had now reached her furthest permanent north, but the advance was not long accepted quietly by the natives. Twenty years after Pius had built his wall, a storm broke loose through all northern Britain from Derbyshire to Cheviot, or beyond, about 158 to 160. A second storm followed twenty years later, about 183. The wall of Pius was then, or soon after, definitely lost and this order apparently continued until the Emperor Septimus Servius came out in person, 208 to 211, and rebuilt the wall of Hadrian to form, with a few outlying forts the Roman frontier. With this step ends the series of alternating organisation and revolt, which make up the external history of the earlier Roman Britain. Henceforward the war was the boundary until the coming of the barbarians who ended Roman rule in the island. The force which garrisoned this fluctuating frontier and kept the province quiet consisted of three, until AD 85, of four, legions, and an uncertain number of troops of the second grade, the so-called auxilia in all, perhaps some 35 to 40,000 men, mostly heavy infantry. Three legions were disposed in three fortresses, Lisca, Salurium, Carleon on Usk, Legia, Il Augusta, Deva, 
Chester, Ligo, Valeria, Victrix, and Ibercrium, York, Ligio, Vi, Victris. From these centuries, detachments of exilians were sent out to form expeditionary forces, to construct fortifications and other military works, and generally to meet important but occasional needs. Outside these three main fortresses, the province was kept quiet and safe by a network of small forts, Castella, varying in size from two or three to six or seven acres, and garrisoned by auxiliary cohorts, infantry, or alley cavalry, some five hundred and some one thousand strong. These forts were planted along important roads and at strategic points, ten or fifteen or twenty miles apart. Their distribution is noteworthy. In the lowlands there were none. During the early years of the conquest we can indeed trace garrisons at one or two places, such as Sirencester. But as the conquest advanced, it was seen that the lowlands needed no force to ensure their peace, and the troops were pushed on into the hills beyond Severn and Trent. Eighteen or twenty forts were dotted about Wales, though many of these seem to have been abandoned in the course of the second century, as having become superfluous through the growing pacification of the land. A much larger number can be detected in Derbyshire, Lancashire, the hill country of Yorkshire, or northward as far as Cheviot. Hadrian's war in particular was principally defended by a series of such forts. We cannot, however, give precise statistics of these forts until exploration has advanced further. It is doubtful not only how far the known examples provide us with a fairly full list of them, but still more to what extent all the forts were in occupation at the same time, and to what extent one succeeded another. The troops which garrisoned these military posts were Roman, in the sense that they not only obeyed the Roman Emperor, but were in theory and to a great extent in practice, even in the latter days of Roman Britain recruited within the U Empire. The legionnaires came from Romanized districts in the Western Empire. The auxiliaries, naturally less civilized to begin with, but drilled into Roman ways and speech, were largely drawn from the Rhine and its neighborhood. Some probably were Celts, like the native Britons. Others, as their names on tombstones and altars prove, were Teutonic in race. To what extent Britons were enrolled to garrison Britain is not very clear. Certainly, the statement that British recruits were always sent to the continent, chiefly to Germany, by way of precaution, seems on our present evidence to be less sweepingly true than was formerly supposed. From the standpoints alike of the ancient Roman statesman and of the modern Roman historian, the military posts and their garrisons form the dominant element in Britain but they have left little permanent mark on the civilization and character of the island. The ruins of their forts and fortresses are on our hillsides. But Roman as they were, their garrisons did little to spread Roman culture here. Outside their walls, each of them had a small or large settlement of women folk, traders, perhaps also of time-expired soldiers wishful to end their days where they had served hardly any of these settlements grew up into towns. York may form an exception, see below. It is a pure coincidence, due to causes far more recent than the Roman age, that Newcastle, Manchester and Cardiff stand on sites once occupied by Roman auxiliary forts, nor do the garrisons appear to have greatly affected the racial character of the Romeo-British population. Even in times of peace, the average annual discharge of time-expired men, with land grants or bounties, cannot have greatly exceeded 1,000, and as we have seen, times of peace were rare in Britain. Of these discharged soldiers, by no means all settled in Britain, and some of them may have been of Celtic or even of British birth. Whatever German or other foreign elements passed into the population through the army, cannot have been greater than that population could easily and naturally absorb without being seriously affected by them. 
the true contribution which the army made to Romeo Bridges' civilization was that his upland forts and fortresses formed a sheltering wall round the peaceful interior regions. Behind these formidable garrisons, kept safe from barbarian inroads and in easy contact with the Roman Empire by short sea passages through to Pay, Richburn near Sandwich in Kent, to Boulogne or from Colchester to the Rhine, stretched the lowlands of southern, midland and eastern Britain. Here Roman culture spread and something approximating to real Romanization took place. The process began properly before the Claudian invasion of 43. The native British coinage of the southeastern tribes and other indications suggest that in the 100 years between Julius Caesar and Claudius, Roman ways and perhaps even Roman speech had found admission to the shores of Britain. And this infiltration, as I have said, may have made easier the ultimate conquest. After the conquest, the process continued in two ways. In part, it was definitely aided by the government, which established here, as in other provinces, municipalities peopled by Roman citizens, for the most part discharged legionnaires, and known as colonnae. These, however, were comparatively few in Britain. Far greater was the automatic movement. Italians flocked to the newly opened regions traders, as it seems, rather than the labourers who form the immigrants from Italy today. How numerous they were, we can hardly tell, but such commercial emigrations are always more important commercially than for their mere numbers. Certainly a far more notable movement was the automatic acceptance of Roman civilization by the British natives. We can to some extent trace this movement Quite early in the period AD 43 to 80, the British town Ferulium, just outside St Albans in Hertfordshire, was judged to have become sufficiently Romanized to merit the municipal status and title of Municipium, practically equivalent to that of the Colonnae, manned by veteran soldiers. The Great Revolt of Boudicca, less correctly called Bordesia in AD 60, was directed not only against the supremacy of Rome, but also against the spread of Roman civilization. And one incident in it was the massacre of many thousands of loyal natives, along with actual Romans. Romanization, it is plain, had been spreading apace, nor did this massacre check it for long. The Flavian period, AD 70 to 96, saw in Britain, as indeed in other provinces, a serious development of Roman culture, in particular of Roman town life, the peculiar gift of Rome to her western provinces. In the decade AD 70 to 80, the Britons began, as Tacitus tells us, to speak Latin and to use Latin dress, and the material fabric of Latin civilised life. Now towns sprang up, such as Silchester, Cavala, Atrobatum, and Carewent, Venta, Silurum, laid out on the model approved by Roman town planners, furnished with public buildings, forum, basilica, etc., of Roman style, and filled with houses which are Roman in their internal fittings, baths, hybrocosts, wall paintings, if not in ground plan. Now the baths of Bath, Acronae Sullus, were equipped with civilised buildings suited to their new visitors. The earliest datable monument there belongs to about 77. Two colonnades also were planted. Hitherto there had only been one, established by Claudius at Colchester. Camula Dunum. Now one was added at Lincoln, Linden, and in 96 a third at Gloucester, Gleatham. A new civil judge, Legatus Iridicus, began to make his appearance beside the regular Legastus Augusti Pro Praetor, who was at once commander of the troops and judge of the chief court and governor of the province. And the appointment is doubtless due to increasing civil business in the law courts. 
and Tacitus praises Agricola because he encouraged the provincials to adopt Roman culture. He praises him for following the tendency of his age, not for striking out any novel line of his own. It is probable that by the end of the third century, Roman civilization was laying firm hold on all the British lowlands. Subsequent progress was slower, or at least less showy. Little advance was made beyond the lowlands. Towns and villas were rare west of the Severn, and save in the Vale of York they were equally rare north of the Trent. The uplands remained comparatively unaffected. Their population, as recent excavations in Cumberland and in Anglesey have shown, used Roman objects and came to some extent within range of Roman culture, but it seems impossible to speak of them as fully civilised, even if in the later years of the Roman occupation they did not remain wholly barbarian. In the lowlands we may ascribe to the 2nd and 3rd centuries the development of the rural system and the building of farmhouses and country residences constructed in Roman fashion. It is very difficult to date these houses, but the evidence of coins seemed to show that the end of the third and the first half of the fourth century were the periods when they were most numerous and most fully occupied, and when, as we may fairly argue, the countryside of Roman Britain was most fully permeated with Roman culture. For such a conclusion, we shall have the support of a neighbouring parallel in Gaul. The administration of the civilised part of Britain, while of course subject to the governor of the whole province, was in fact entrusted to the local authorities. Each Roman, Municiparian and Colonia ruled itself, including a territory which might be as long and broad as a small English county. Some districts probably belonged to the imperial domains and were ruled by local agents of the emperor. Such probably were the lead mining districts as on Mendip or in Derbyshire or Flintshire. The remainder of the country by far its largest part was divided up, as before the Roman conquest, along the native cantoons or tribes, now organised in more or less Roman fashion. Each tribe had its council, ordo, and tribal magistrates, and its capital where the tribal council met. Thus the tribe or canton of the Solis, the Servatus Salugrium, as it learned to call itself, had its capital at Venta Salurium, care went between Chepstow and Newport. There its council met, and directo ordinus by decree of the council, Measures were taken for the government of the tribal area, which probably covered much of Monfordshire and some of Glamorgan. This we know, by epigraphic evidence, occurred at Carewent, and we shall not be rash in assuming on slighter evidence that the same system obtained in other tribal areas in Britain. It is just the system which Roman applied also to the local government of Gaul, north of the Cevennes. It illustrates well the Roman method of entrusting local government to a stricted reform of home rule. In the social fabric of Romeo-British life, the two chief elements were the town and the country house or villa. Both are mainly Roman importations. The Counts do not appear to have reached any definite urban life, either in Gaul or in Britain, before the coming of the Romans where they no doubt had, even in Britain, allogramations of houses which came near to being towns. But with the Roman conquest a real town life arose. In part this was directly created by the government under the Roman forms of municiparian and colonia noticed above. Colchester, Camulodorum, Lincoln, Lindum, Gloucester, Gleatham, York, Eburacium, or Colonnae. The first three were founded in the third century by drafts of time-expired soldiers, and the fourth, York, probably grew out of the civil settlement on the west bank of the Ouse, 
which confronted the legionary fortress under the present cathedral and its precincts. One town, Verulumium, St. Albans, was a municiparium, ranking with the four coloni in privilege and standing, but different, as explained above in origin. All these five towns attained considerable prosperity, in particular Camulodium, Epicarium, and Verulamium, but none can vie with the more splendid municipalities of other provinces. Besides them, Roman Britain could show a larger number, some ten or fifteen according to the standard adopted, of country towns which varied much in size, but possessed in their own way the essential features of urban life. The chief of these seem to be the following. 1. Isurium Brigantum, capital or chief lure of the Brigantes, now Aldborough, some twelve miles northwest of York, and the most northerly Romano British town properly so called. 2. Rete, capital of the Coritane, now Leicester. 3. Varaconum, so best spout, not Uriconum, capital of the Cornave, now Roxeter, on the Severn, five miles below Shrewsbury. 4. Coronaman, capital of the Dobone, now Sirencester. 5. Venta, Silurium, already mentioned. Isca Dunmanoricorium, capital of the Dumanenai, now Exeter. Junfera, capital of the Juratages, now Dorchester, in Dorsetshire. 8. Venta, Bulgarum, capital of the Balgay, now Winchester. 9. Cavala, Atrobatum, capital of the Atrobates, close to Silcester. 10. Juvenium, Cantacorium, capital of the Cantai, now Canterbury. 11. Venta Isonorum, capital of the Iceni, now Castor by Norwich. And perhaps, for the limits of the lists are not easily drawn with rigidity, Chesterford, Roman name unknown, in Essex, Kenchester, Magna, in Herefordshire, Chesterton, Drubrithe on the Nen, Rochester, also Drubrithe in Kent, and even one or two which have perhaps less right to inclusion. Many of these towns are indicated by the Ravana Geographa as holding some special rank, and nearly all are declared by their remains to be the sites of really Romanized town life. What exactly their status of government was has yet to be defined but it is fairly probable, especially from the Carewent movement erected by the Ordo Civitatus Silurum, that the authorities of town and tribe were one. The general fashion of these towns has been revealed to us by excavations at Silchester and Carewent. At Silchester, the whole 100 acres within the walls have been systematically uncovered during the last 20 years, and the building studied with especial care. At Carewent, a smaller area, 39 acres, has been excavated so far as the buildings of the present village permit. Both show much the same features, with certain differences in detail which are both natural and instructive. 1. Both have been planned according to the Roman method, which obtained in many parts of the empire. That is, the streets run at right angles so as to form a chessboard pattern with square plots for the houses. At Silchester, where space was obviously abundant, the sanctity of the street frontages seemed to have been in general observed at Carewent, which is of smaller size and more thickly crowded with buildings. The street plan has suffered some encroachments, but not so much as to obliterate its character. 2. Both towns had near their centre the town buildings known as Forum and Basilica. At Silchester, where space was obviously abundant, the sanctity of the street frontages seemed to have been in general observed. At Carewent, which is of smaller size and more thickly crowded with buildings, 
street plan has suffered some encroachments, but not so much as to obliterate its character. 2. Both towns had near their centre the town buildings known as Forum and Basilica. At Silchester, the Forum was a rectangular plot of two acres, with streets running along all its four sides. It contained a central open court, nearly 140 feet square, surrounded on three sides by corridors or cloisters with rooms, presumably shops and lounges opening into them. On the fourth side was a pillared hall, 270 by 58 feet in floor space, decorated with Corinthian columns, marble-lined walls, statues and the like, and behind this hall a row of rooms which probably served as offices for the town authorities and the like. The Carewent municipal buildings were very similar, so, as far as we can tell from imperfect times, were those at Cirencester and Roxeter. They are indeed examples of a type which was represented in most large towns of the Western Empire and in Italy itself. 3. Both towns had in addition small temples in different quarters within the walls, and at Silchester, a small building close to the Forum, is so similar in every detail to the early Christian church of the Western Basilian type that we can hardly hesitate to call it a church. Thor. Both towns again seem to have had public baths. Those at Silchester covered an area of 80 by 160 feet in their earliest form, and in later times were much extended. Both again had more direct provision for amusements. At Silchester, an urban amphitheatre stood outside the walls. At Carewent, there are traces of the stone walls of one inside the ramparts. 5. Of dwelling houses and shops, and the like, both towns had naturally no lack. The private houses are built like most of the private houses in the Celtic part of the empire, in fashions very dissimilar from anything at Pompeii or Rome, but are fitted in Roman style, with mosaics, hypocasts, painted wall plaster, and the like. They are especially noteworthy as being properly country houses, brought together to form a town preforce, and not town houses, such as could be used to compose regular rows or terraces or streets. Even the architecture thus declares that the town life of these cantonal chief linux, though real, was incomplete. The civilization of the towns appears to have been of the Roman type. Not only do the buildings declare this, inscriptions and in particular casual scratchings on tiles or pots, which can often be assigned to the lower classes, prove that Latin was both read and written and spoken easily in Silchester and Carewent. Whether Celtic was also known is uncertain, here evidence is totally lacking. But it may be observed that if Celtic was understood one would expect to meet it quite as much as Latin, and casual graffiti, while the total disappearance of a native tongue can be paralleled in southern Gaul and southern Spain and is not incredible in towns. Nor do the smaller objects found at Silchester and Carewent show much survival of the late Celtic art, which prevailed in Britain in the pre-Roman age which certainly survived here and there in the island. But while Romanized, these towns are not large or rich. It has been calculated that Silchester did not contain more than 80 houses of decent size, and industry is traceable there, in particular some dyer's furnaces, did not indicate wealth or capital. The Romano-British towns, it seems, were assimilated to Rome, but they were not powerful enough to carry their Roman culture through a barbarian conquest or impose it on their conquerors. From the town we pass to the country. This seems to have been divided up among estates commonly, though perhaps unscientifically styled villas. Other residences, etc., which form the buildings of these estates, many examples survive. 
Some are as large and luxurious as any Gaulish nobleman's residence on the other side of the channel. Others are small houses or even mere farms or cottages. It is difficult, on our present evidence, to deduce from these houses the agrarian system to which they belonged, save that it was plainly no mere slave system. But it is clear from the character of the residences and remains in them that they represent the same Romanized civilization as the towns, while a few chance graffiti suggests that Latin was used in some, at least, of them. A priori, it is not improbable that while the towns were Romanized, the countryside remained to some extent Celtic or bilingual. But all that is certain, as yet, is that scanty evidence proves some knowledge of Latin. These country houses are very irregularly distributed over the island. In some districts they abounded, and included splendid mansions. Such districts are North Kent, West Sussex, parts of Hants, of Somerset, of Gloucestershire, of Lincolnshire. Other districts, notably the Midlands of Warwickshire or Buckinghamshire, contain very few villas, indeed, as it seems, very few inhabitants at all. The Romans probably found these later districts thinly peopled, and they left them in the same condition. Besides country houses and farms, the countryside also contained occasional villages or hamlets inhabited, solely by peasants. Such have been excavated in Dorsetshire by the late General Pitt Rivers. These villages testify in their degree the spread of Roman material civilization. However little their inhabitants understood of the higher aspects of Roman culture, the objects found in them, pottery, brooches, etc., are much the same as those of the Romanized towns and villas, and are widely different from those of the Celtic villages, such as those lately excavated near Glastonbury, which belong to the latest pre-Roman age. The province was on the whole well provided with roads, some of them constructed for military purposes, some obviously connected with the various towns. Whether any of them follow lines laid out by the Britons before AD 43 is more than doubtful. In describing them, we must put aside all notion of the famous four great roads of Saxon times. That category of four roads was a medieval invention probably dating from the 11th or 12th century antiquarius. The names of the roads composing it are Anglo-Saxon names, some of which the inventors of the four roads plainly did not understand. If we examine the Roman roads actually known to us, we discern in the English lowlands four main groups of roads radiating from the natural geographical centre. London and a fifth group crossing England from northeast to southwest. The first ran from the Kentish ports and Canterbury through the populous North Kent to London. The second took the traveller west by Staines, Ponce to Silchester, and thence by various branching roads to Winchester, Dorchester, Exeter, to Bath, to Gloucester and South Wales. The third, known to the English as Watling Street, crossed the Midlands by Verulam to Wall near Lichfield, Lectocetum, Roxeter, Chester, Dever, and Mid and North Wales. It also, by a branch from High Cross, Venone, gave access to Leicester and Lincoln. A fourth, running northeast from London, led to Colchester and Caister by Norwich, and, as it seems, by a branch through Cambridge to Lincoln. The fifth group, unconnected with London, compromises two roads of importance. One, named Foss by the English, ran from Lincoln and Leicester by High Cross to Cirencester, Bath and Exeter. Another, probably called Rhine Canal to Street by the English, ran from the north through Sheffield and Derby and Birmingham, of which Derby alone is a Roman site, to Cirencester and in a fashion duplicated the foss. There were also other roads, 
such as Ackerman Street, which crossed the southern Midlands and near St Albans by way of Alchester, near Bychester, the Sirencester and Bath, which must be considered as independent of the main scheme. But judged by the places they served and by the posts along them, the five groups above indicated seem the really important roads of southern or non-military Roman Britain. The road systems of Wales and of the north were military, and can best be understood from a map. In Wales, roads ran along the south and north coasts to Carmarthen and Carnarvon, while a road, San Helen, along the west coast connected the two. The interior roads, especially one up from the Severn from Roxeter and one down the Usk, connected the forts which guarded the valleys. These roads, however, need further exploration before they can be fully set out. In the north, three main routes are visible. One, starting from the legionary fortress at York, ran north with various branches to places in the lower Tyne, Corbridge, Newcastle, Pons, Elelius, Shields. Another, diverging at Catterick Bridge from the Thirst, ran over Stainmore to the Eden Valley and the Roman Wall near Carlisle. A third, starting from the legionary fortress at Chester, Dever, passed north to the Lake Country, and by various ramifications served all that is now Cumberland, Westmoreland, and West Northumberland. Several of these roads appear, as it were, in duplicate, leading from the same general starting point to the same general destination. And no doubt, if we knew enough, we should find that one of the two routes in question belonged to an older or a later age than the other. Communications with the continent seem to have been conducted chiefly between the Kentish ports and those of the opposite Gaulish littoral, and in particular between Rutapai, Richborough, just north of Sandwich, and Gesraicum, otherwise called Bonacina, now Boulogne. There were also not infrequent intercourse between Colchester and the Rhine Estuary, to which we may ascribe various German products found in Roman Colchester, though not elsewhere in Roman Britain. On occasion, men also reached or left the island by long sea passages. Troops, it appears, were sometimes shipped direct from Sassito, Vetchen near Utrecht, the port of the Rhine, to the mouth of the Tyne in Northumberland, while traders now and then sail direct from Gaul to Ireland and to British ports in the Irish Channel. The police of the seas was entrusted to a classius, Britannica, which intermittent references in our authorities show to have existed from the middle of the first century, that is, from the original conquest or soon after, till at least the end of the third century. Despite its title, the principal station of this fleet was not in Britain, but at Boulogne, and its work was the preservation of order on either coast of the Straits of Dover. This fleet appears to have been a police flotilla rather than a naval force, but for once it emerged into the political importance which fleets often assume. About 286, a Menasipian, i.e. probably Belgium by name, Caresius became commandment, possibly with extended powers to cope with increasing piracy. He set himself up as colleague to the two remaining emperors, Maximin and Dialetium, enlarged his fleet, allied himself with the sea robbers, in 289 actually extorted some kind of recognition at Rome. But in 293 he was murdered, and his successor, Electus, was crushed by the Emperor Constantius Clorius in 296. Carusius was apparently an able man, but in his aims he differed little from many other pretenders to the throne whom the later 3rd century produced. His object was not an independent Britain, but a share in the government of the empire. His special significance is that he showed for the first time in history how a fleet might detach Britain from its geographical connection 
of the northwestern continent. Twelve centuries passed before this possibility was again realised. The preceding paragraphs have described the main features of Roman Britain, civil and military, during the main part of its existence. In the fourth century, change was plainly imminent. Barbarian sailors, Saxons and others began, as we have seen, rather earlier than 300, to issue from the other shores of the German Ocean and to vex the coasts of Gaul and probably also those of Britain. Carusius in 286 or 287 was sent to repress them. After his and his successors' deaths, some change, the nature of which is not yet quite clear, was made in the Classius Britannica. We now hear hardly anything more of it. A system of coast defence was established from the Wash to the Isle of Wight. It consisted of some nine forts, each planted on a harbour and garrisoned by regiment of horse or foot. The British fleet, so far as Britain was concerned, may have been divided up amongst these forts or may have been entirely suspended. But it is difficult to make out, owing to the general obscurity, whether the change was made in the interests of coast defence or as a preventative against another Carusius. The new system was known, from the name of the chief assailant, as the Saxon shore, Lytus Saxonarchium. Whatever the step, and whatever the motive, Britain appears for a while to escape the Saxon pillages. During the first years of the fourth century, it enjoyed indeed considerable prosperity, but no golden age lasts long. Before 350, probably in 343, the Emperor Constans had to cross the Channel and drive out the raiders, not Saxons only, but Picts from the north and Scots, Irish from the northwest. This event opens the first act in the fall of Roman Britain, 343 to 383. In 360, further interference was needed, and Lupicinus Magister Armonium was sent over from Gaul. Probably he effected little. Certainly we read that in 368, all Britain was in evil plight, and Theodosius, father of Theodosius I, Rome's best general at that time was dispatched with large forces. He won a complete success. In 368 he cleared the invading bands out of the south. In 369 he moved north, restoring towns and forts and limates, including presumably Hadrian's War. So decisive was his victory that one district, now unfortunately unidentifiable, which he rescued from the barbarians, was named Valentia in honour of the then Emperor of the West, Valentinian I. For some years after this, Britain disappears from recorded history and may be thought to have enjoyed comparative peace. Such is the account given by ancient writers of the period, circa 343 to 383. It sounds as though things were already about as bad as they could be. But a similar tale is told of many other provinces, and yet the empire survived. When Asunicus wrote his Mozilla in 371, he described the Moselle Valley as a rich and fertile and happy countryside. Britain had no Osonius, but she can adduce archaeological evidence, which is often more valuable than literature. The coins which have been found in Romanian british villas, ill-recorded as they too often are, give us a clue. They suggest that some country houses and farms were destroyed or abandoned as early as 350 or 360, but that more of them remained occupied till about 385 or even later. It is not surprising to read in Arminicus that about 360, Britain was able to export corn regularly to northern Germany and Gaul. The first act in the fall of Roman Britain contained trouble and disturbance, no doubt, but few disasters. 
the second act, 383 to about 410, brought greater evils and of a new kind. In 383, an officer of the British Army, by birth a Spaniard, by name Magnus Maximus, proclaimed himself emperor, crossed with many troops to Gaul, and conquered Western Europe. In 387, he seized Italy. In 388, he was overthrown by the legitimate emperors. Later, British tradition of the 6th century asserted that his British troops never returned home, and the island was first left defenceless. We cannot verify this tradition, but we have proof both that Britain was sore pressed and that the central government tried to help it. Claudian alludes to measures taken by Stilchio, Prime Minister to the then Emperor Ilonius, about 395 to 8. Archaeological evidence shows that the coast fort of Pavensi, Andradia, was repaired under Hononius, that a fort was built high on the summit of Peak, overhanging the Yorkshire coast halfway between Whitby and Scarborough, by an officer of the same period, who is known to have been in Britain a little after 400. These efforts were in vain. Troops, not necessarily legionnaires, who Claudia calls them legio, had to be withdrawn for the defence of Italy in 402. Finally, the great raid of barbarians, who crossed the Rhine on the winter's night which divided 406 and 407, and the subsequent barbarian attack on Rome itself, cut Britain off from the Mediterranean. The so-called departure of the Romans speedily followed. This departure did not mean any great departure of persons, Roman or other, from the island. It meant that the central government in Italy now ceased to send out the usual governors and other high officials and organise the supply of troops. No one went. Some persons failed to come. How far the British themselves were responsible for, or even agreeable to, this surrendering of an ancient tie? is, even after the latest inquiries, not very certain. The old idea that Britons and Romans were still two distinct and hostile racial elements has, of course, been long abandoned by all competent inquirers, for reasons which the preceding pages will have made evident. But we have the names of three usurpers who tried to seize the imperial crown in Britain 406 to 11. Marcus, Gratian, and Constantine. And it seems that as Constantine went off to seek a throne on the continent, the Britons left to themselves, set up a local autonomy for self-protection. Unfortunately, our ancient authorities are less clear than could be wished, especially on the chronology of these events. One thing which seems certain is that Britain did not conceive herself as breaking loose from the empire, and that in the years to come the Britons considered themselves Romans. If we may believe Gildas, they even appealed for help to Aetius, the Roman minister, in 446. The attacks of the Saxons had begun before 300, and though at first their brunt fell more heavily on the Gaulish than on the British coasts, they were felt seriously in Britain from about 350 onwards. At first they were the attacks of mere pillages. Later, like the later attacks of the barbarians elsewhere, they became invasions of settlers. When exactly the change took place is unknown, nor is it clear what incident gave the stimulus. It seems probable, however, that the Britons of the early 4th century, harassed by attacks of all kinds, adopted the common device even more familiar in that age than in any other, a set of thief to catch a thief. The man who set is named in the legends Vortigarian of Kent. The thieves who are set are called Hengest and Horsa. We need not attach much weight to these names, nor can we hope to fix a precise date. But the incident is sufficiently well attested and sufficiently probable to find acceptance, they obviously occurred early in the 5th century. 
it had the natural result. The English called in to protect, remained to rule. They formed settlements on the east coast and began the English invasion. But they began it under conditions altogether different from those which attended the barbarian conquests on the continent. The English were more savage and hostile to civilization than most of the continental invaders. On the other hand, they were far less overwhelmingly numerous. The Romeo-British culture was less strong and coherent than the civilization of Roman Gaul. But the Britons themselves, at least those in the hills, were no less ready to fight than the bravest of the continental provincials. The sequel was naturally different in the two regions. The course of the invasion is a matter for English historians. A part of it depends on Romeo-British archaeology. This seems to contradict violently the chronology which the Anglo-Saxon chronicle sets out in suspiciously precise detail. We know that Roxeta was burnt, and we have evidence that the burning occurred soon after, if indeed it was not before, A.D. 400. We must treat this evidence cautiously, since not a fiftieth part of the site has yet been explored. But at Silchester, which has been all uncovered, the spade has told us that the town was abandoned, not burnt, and as a limit for the date, we find no coins which need be later than about A.D. 420. The same absence of 5th century coins may be noted on other sites, which have been sufficiently explored to yield trustworthy testimony. It would seem as if the invaders, entering Britain on its eastern and least defensible side, were able, like the Romans four centuries earlier, rapidly to sweep over the lowlands, who were not able to maintain their hold. Thus, for several generations, this region became a debatable land, where neither Romeo-British city's life could safely endure, nor the English take firm hold and settle. In the long confusion, the Romeo-British civilization of the lowlands perished. The towns, burnt or abandoned, lay waste and empty. Even Juravimium, Canterbury, presumably the capital, the Fortigern, whom the legend mates of a Saxon wife, ceased to exist. And at the healing springs of Aquasulius, Bath, the wild birds built their nests in the marsh which hid the ruins. The country houses and farms perished even more easily. Not one is known in which we can trace English inhabitants succeeding to British. The old native tribal areas and the Roman administrative boundaries were alike lost. Today we have no certain knowledge of any of them. The Roman speech vanished. Romeo-British material civilization, and the house plans and house furniture, hypocausts and mosaics, even the fashions of brooches and pottery vanished with it. Only the solid agueras of the roads remain still in use, and in these too there were gaps and intervals. All else was but the scattered debris of a ruined world. Meanwhile, the Romanized Britons, in losing the lowlands, lost their towns and all the apparatus of town life. They retired into the hills, to Wales and to the north, the later Strathclyde, and there, in a region where Roman civilization had never established itself in its highest forms, they underwent an intelligible change. The Celtic element, never quite extinct in those hills, and reinforced perhaps the immigration from Ireland reasserted itself afresh. Gradually, the remnants of Roman civilization were worn down. The Celtic speech reappeared, and as a sequel, the late Celtic art was strong enough to pass on an artistic legacy to the Middle Ages. End of section 45